What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to the remastered version of What If I Was Reborn As White Hunter Smoker? Path to True Justice, Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Dragon, Rosinante was rendered stupefied, as in Rebellion Dragon, the one thought to be behind many rebellions that are occurring worldwidely. Dragon, upon hearing Rosinante's remark through the Den Den Mushi, commented, you got a company, it seems. Trustworthy ones, I assure you, Smoker replied calmly. Dragon stood silent for a moment. The Den Den Mushi, reflecting Dragon's emotion, gazed at Smoker questioningly, to which Smoker stared back with confident eyes. Fine then. Now getting onto the point, finally. Dragon yielded. The battle primarily revealed that he was the Celestial Dragon's slave from the very start. The deaths of many Marines at his hands, technically, were ordered by the world government themselves. Smoker said solemnly, it was no different this time around. An order most probably came from higher up to dispose of me. Hook complied, but met his end instead. You are saying that Hook was the world government's subordinate. Indeed, the Den Den Mushi wrinkled up its face, reflecting Dragon's confusion. Fleevance is the most likely reason. Smoker replied, One restriction that a Marine has, regardless of one's rank, is to report one's destination, location, and purpose of going there. Fleevance was, and is, my current destination. The world government they are highly against letting me get there, it seems. Fleevance. I heard a little about how a particular disease is spreading widely in that country. The Den Den Mushi closed its eyes in a thoughtful manner. Our intel revealed that a substantial amount of troops was sent from Marine to arrest you. They will probably track you down based on your planned route of travel. And yet, you plan to continue going. The strong countermeasures are the indications that there lies their weakness. Smoker said solemnly. The high risk behind this operation is the reason why I must proceed with it. Ha, reckless as always. Dragon, chuckling lightly through the Den Den Mushi, then said, Smoker grinned, much appreciated. January 19th, 1506, Polar Island, North Blue at the edge of the North Blue, there lied one island. Though its size wasn't supposed to be big, the relentless snow that engulfed the entire island inflated its size. Across the snowy street, people shivered as they walked with thick fur coats on them. Fishing, finding sources of heat, and simply doing what they can do to survive another day. They didn't have time to pay attention to others. And on this street, there were two green-haired young girls in a box, shivering and hugging one another to preserve their heat as much as possible. In front of them was a small, tattered bucket. Anyone among two girls. The seemingly older one said weakly, Please just one fish. The adults who were passing by stiffened up. They bit their lips, feeling guilt that they were turning blind eyes to children who needed help. However, they eventually continued their way. They had families of their own to feed and care of. The younger girl, shivering in the arms of her older sister, whispered, Monet, are we going to die? The older girl, named Monet, shook her with a forced smile. No, we won't. Don't worry. This is going as I planned. Monet raised her head up to the ever snowy sky. She couldn't help but wonder, where did everything start going wrong? Was it when the chief of this village ran away with the money that villagers collected altogether? Was it when her parents became ill and died? Or was it when the villagers barged into her house upon receiving the news that her parents died and took all valuables from them? Monet didn't know where to start. Monet, still looking at the sky, then thought subconsciously, if only I had bird's wings, so that I can fly out of here. Her stomach growled, her mouth was dry. Monet found herself too frail to move any longer, for all the foods that she managed to acquire for the past few weeks, went to her sister, Sugar. There wasn't enough fluid for her to shed a tear even. People, as time passed by, left the street one by one. The sky began to darken, and two girls were now the only ones left outside. And Monet instinctively felt it, that today was her final day. Sugar, 
When I die Monade therefore whispered into her sister, eat me and live on. Sugar, paling up from Monet's statement, shook her head with all her might. But Monet was adamant for she looked at Sugar with all the strength she had in her. No, I know that it's a hard decision to make. But that's the only way Monet, from the corners of her eyes, saw one man walking. It must be a reaper she thought as she grabbed onto Sugar. With all her last remaining strength. Live on, Sugar. Even if I'm not here, no, no, no. Stop saying that, Monet Monet. Gritting her teeth, looked at the Reaper who was now right next to her. Urgently turning back to Sugar, she sighed, you will eventually be left with no choice. Sugar didn't answer Monet. Instead, her eyes headed to Monet's back, and she pleaded, M, Mr. Please, my sister needs help. Monet expressed shock, you can see him. She turned back to where Sugar's gaze was headed at, and the man whom Monet believed to be a reaper, wearing a brown cloak that covered the entirety of his body except for his face, was staring at them with a crestfallen expression on his face. Sugar looked at the man with teary desperation. However, Monet seemed to have recognized that man. She, unconsciously shielding Sugar from the man's view, muttered, W White Hunter Smoker Smoker, lowering his eyes to the ground, gritted his teeth as if enraged. Then, he abruptly grabbed the box that contained two girls and began walking away. H Hey where are you taking us to? You trash scum you to who knows where. Monet abruptly woke up from a comfortable bed, with her eyes widened and her breathing quickened. Sugar. And right when she shouted out her sister's name, you're awake. A woman's voice was heard. And just before Monet could do anything, drink. A cup of water was shoved onto her mouth. It pushed against Monet's face, and Monet was forced to drink the water to prevent herself from being choked by it. Huff huff and when Monet finally finished drinking, eat. A loaf of bread was shoved into her mouth. Mem mff Monet thrashed her head, but the pink-haired woman, Hina, was persistently shoving the bread into her mouth, until, creak. What are you doing? Hina-san. Rosanante entered with a bowl of porridge in his hands. Hina tilted her head. This is how I treat Smoker when he is injured. Hina confused. Rosanante immediately barked at her. Don't place Smoker-san in the same standard as this teenage girl. Alright, he's a literal monster who heals simply by eating putting the bread away. Rosanante then brought the porridge closer to Monet. Here, sorry about what she did. Make yourself worm with this and take some rest then, Rosanante slipped, and the hot bowl of porridge was spilled all over the floor. Monet gazed at the fallen meal with a dull expression, before lowering her body and licking the porridge over. Rosanante, immediately standing back up, tried to stop Monet with a troubled look. A.R. Don't do that. I'll get you a new one, it, it tastes so good, said Monet as she was on four, licking over the spilled porridge without a control. The tears dropped from her eyes and rendered the porridge salty, but she didn't seem to have realized it. Rosanante, with a grimace, watched as Monet continued her act. His heart ached from the miserable state that this teenage girl was in. Hina's expression softened, expressing concern for Monet. And eventually, Monet stood back up. She warily gazed at two people in front of her before bowing. Thank you for the meal. Then, she raised her head back up and asked, So where did you take my little sister to? Rosanante, scratching the back of his head in response, opened the door. Upon opening, Monet saw, Ugh, stop. Stop already. You little ha 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 say moo, cow man sugar riding on the back of one dark green haired man with a muscular physique, Aramaki. Sugar was laughing genuinely as the man shouted in annoyance, and the sight of sugar laughing was something that Monet didn't see for a long time. White Hunter. Monet, after watching them in silence, then muttered, he brought us here didn't we? Hina replied, yes, he did. Said he's going to a different island and left before suddenly coming back with you two. So you work for him. Technically, Monet pursed her lips. I need to apologize for calling him bad things. Hina sat back down and said, then you'll have to wait for some time. Right now, he's gone elsewhere. For how long? Rosanante shrugged, quite some time. A bounty. Betrayal. Ha! Huh. Just like me it seems. In an unknown location, there sat Dyer's Barrels, who was busy smoking as he read through the newspaper that he got his hands onto. But what's with this bias? His bounty is far higher than mine, when there was only one level of difference in ranks. Barrels clicked his tongue, exhibiting annoyance. Crocodile, who too was smoking an expensive-looking cigar, 
Bicket at Barrel's antics. Because he killed Martini Hook, idiot. Barrel's gazed at Crocodile stoically, before turning his head away with an underlying nervousness. Crocodile snorted at that, before going into a thought. But White Hunter Smoker, he must have nowhere to go. And considering his situation where he became wanted for killing the pirates, and is unreasonably getting chased by the marines, whatever loyalty he had for that organization must have diminished. If he doesn't come to hate marine after this incident, then he isn't normal. Crocodile grinned, finding this as an opportunity. Then surely, he won't reject a company, will he? Crocodile walked up to the deck, planning to order one of the crew members those who used to be marines in the past to turn the ship to where he speculated that smoker must have gone to. However, before he could speak, one crew member from the crow's nest shouted with visible exhilaration, Wait W wait Reese Captain you have to look at this. Crocodile, morphing his body into sand, swiftly traveled to where the member stood. The member, upon finding Crocodile next to him, gulped but nonetheless passed the binoculars to the man. Crocodile didn't bother speaking a single word to the member. Instead, he immediately placed binoculars in front of his eyes and took a look at where the member has been looking at. Then, huh. Crocodile's arms trembled as he lowered the binoculars from his eyes. On his face was a wide grin, one that he wasn't able to suppress. A heart-shaped devil fruit. There's no doubt, what Crocodile managed to see was a tiny piece of ground in the middle of the ocean. And on that ground stood one frail-looking tree, and that tree managed to produce one single fruit, one bizarre-looking fruit. It's the opoat fruit. Crocodile's eyes flashed in greed as he immediately flew toward the devil fruit. Flevance. From an outward appearance, it was a snowy country similar to the polar island that I previously came across. However, there lacked a sense of hostility and caution that the civilians of Polar Island held with the country itself. Having been placed under the jurisdiction of the Getsis dynasty the members of the world government. Though the Flavantians' bodies were covered with specks of dust from the mining works, they worked without a grunt for they didn't starve at the very least. North. Blue is the harshest sea for a reason, said Senor Pink, the man whom I brought with me. The two of us were currently walking atop the snowy path, with brown cloaks to cover up our appearances. Senor Pink, with his signature sunglasses intact on his face, grimaced out of all four blues. This sea is the region in which the gap between rich and poor is the largest. In contrast to the well-known countries such as Jewel Kingdom and White Land Kingdom, people who live in places like here barely survive throughout the day. I stopped and turned back to gaze at Senor Pink, who paused his locomotion and lowered his head in guilt. Don Quixote do Flamingo, my former boss. He, along with the Germa 66, worked as the mercenaries who fused many wars in the North Blue. For profits alone, thousands were unreasonably plundered and killed, worsening the already harsh situation of the North Blue. In that sense, Flevance this place must have been akin to heaven to many. Not only was this place officially announced to be under the exclusive protection of the world government, but also guaranteed a stable income for the weak. In a sense, I muttered in comprehension, Flevance was an oasis in midst of a desert. Bringing Senor Pink was the right choice to make, I thought. After all, he, having stayed an extensive period in this sea, was quite knowledgeable in this department. The two of us walked through the empty street, all workers must have gone to the mine, and their family members probably are in their shelters, due to the cold and harsh weather. Pink, and now, as we stopped in front of one particular building that was covered up by the snow, I asked, what's today's date again? January 21st, year 1506. I chuckled three days late, huh, without any halt. I opened the unlocked door and entered the building along with Senor Pink. And from the gateway, I noticed that many patients were bedridden to the extent that some beds contained two patients instead of one. Just then, one black-haired man with rectangular glasses swiftly came downstairs with dark bags under his eyes. Hello, I'm sorry if you're here to register a patient, but we are currently out of space the man who robotically spoke with dazed eyes, then stopped his words as he saw my face. He, seemingly noticed my identity in an instant, gulped while taking a step back. Dr. Trafalgar, I, unbothered by the man's antic, asked calmly. The man slowly nodded while heading his eyes to the ceiling with visible concern. Raising my arms up, I revealed no intention to harm him, no need to panic. My arrival here was predestined prior to the release of my bounty poster. Here. Within my cloak, I took out a piece of report. 
I've read your article regarding the invalidity behind the idea that the newly named Amber Lead Syndrome may potentially be contagious. I haven't come here to harm anyone, but to see if I can be of help. You are aware of the fact that words alone can't earn one's trust. Whatever you say doesn't change that you are a wanted man, Dr. Trafalgar said without dropping caution. However, he then sighed before turning around, but cough beggars can't be choosers. Even if it's a devil who's offering a hand please come up and I'll explain further. Before he began walking upstairs, he rang the bell that lied by the side three times. Though the slight noises of footsteps from the above floor entered my ears, I decided to pretend as if I haven't heard them. Following Dr. Trafalgar, we eventually stopped in front of a messy table. Scuffling through countless papers, Dr. Trafalgar picked one out and laid it on the table. The esteemed Doctors of the Drum Kingdom, ISE 20, recently announced the discovery of the crucial evidence that confirms that Amber Lead Syndrome is contagious. However, they refused to disclose the specific information for an unknown reason. I, along with my associates, attempted to refute the claim. However, was rejected due to our own claim supposedly being biased. On top of the paper that Dr. Trafalgar selected, a hand-drawn pedigree tree the diagram that depicts the genetic inheritance of a trait or disease was drawn. Flevance, known as the White Country, used to be a popular place for tourists prior to the emergence of the Amber Lead Syndrome. However, in contrast to many Flevantians, not even a single tourist was found to have acquired this disease. In addition, no member of the Getzis family was diagnosed with this disease. Either, we came to determine that this disease is incapable of transmitting from one patient to another through the air, water, or any other medium. Dr. Trafalgar then pointed at the pedigree tree, and then, we found that all patients' ancestors were the regular miners who dug out the amber lead for an extensive period of time. Upon studying the characteristics of the amber lead, we finally came to deduce three days ago, that I watched as Dr. Trafalgar bit his lips with a pained expression. He, taking a deep breath, continued, that, Amber lead can enter through the skin and accumulate in one's body. Furthermore, continuous exposure to amber lead makes oneself more susceptible to amber lead accumulation by genetic alterations. And this altered trait is passed down to the subsequent generation, and hence on ultimately reducing the lifespan of each succeeding generation. Senor Pink, who had his arms crossed, commented, I don't get a single thing, but it sounds hella serious. He then turned to me and asked, then who do we need to punch, Smoker? I, ignoring Senor Pink's question, said, therefore, the disease is hereditary. Yes, it is, Dr. Trafalgar nodded, cough, 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 before abruptly coughing uncontrollably. He, breathing heavily, raised his body back up with vivid exhaustion. The situation isn't good. I believe that it will take at least a couple more months before the world government releases the official statement. But, is there a way to extract the amber lead out of a patient's body? I, though knowing the answer already, asked solemnly. No, unfortunately not. I sighed while raising my head up thoughtfully. I ran through my mind, thinking of what options there were for me to choose. Recently, the opope fruit was released into the world with the death of Dead End Frankenstein. However, its whereabouts are unknown, and finding one small fruit in this vast world, without a single piece of information, it's inefficient and unlikely to succeed. If so, lowering my head and gazing at Dr. Trafalgar, I said, Drum Kingdom, I'll personally go there and get the supposed evidence out of them. This won't resolve the situation, but I may be able to provide you with more time at least. Dr. Trafalgar, in response to my offer, narrowed his eyes in suspicion. Why are you going so far for us? Not to offend you, but you are no longer a Marine. You are currently a wanted man whose primary interest should lie in his own survival. Hearing his words made me chuckle. What a miserable world we live within. I muttered while turning back, since when did one require a reason to help others? I knew that I chose a difficult path. Perhaps, if I went into hiding and found a way to circumvent around the current situation, I would have secured my safety. But I couldn't bear to do that, when I knew just how urgent the situation in Flevance currently was. Having my subordinates safe was enough for me. Continue your research. Find a way to cure this disease. And take care of your health. I, Dr. Trafalgar was about to say something, but I didn't bother. Without looking back at him, I walked out with grim resolve. It's too late for that, Dr. Trafalgar muttered as he stared at the staircase in front of him. I am quite familiar with the way of the paradise. 
So I don't need your guide. I said to send your pink while walking on a snowy path. And considering that you lack means to travel as quickly as I do, bringing you along will simply be inefficient. And you will stay here, pink. I stated seriously. Senor Pink narrowed his eyes behind his sunglasses. You want me to protect that doctor? A necessary measure. Senor Pink stopped on his way. He then asked weakly, Do you trust in me, smoker? That depends on you. This time around, I didn't stop. Walking still, I said, Show me that you are trustworthy. That you are worthy of the title of Senor. Senor Pink didn't say anything. But judging by the noises of a foot stepping on the snow, he was walking in the other direction, away from me. Who I let out a light breath. On my right wrist, a mini Den Den Mushi was attached. On my left hand was the roughly drawn map of the North Blue by Senor Pink. With this tool at my hand, I planned on reaching the island of Kuen, the southeastern island of the North Blue. A long flight it will be, and afterward, I will have to cross the red line to the East Blue, from which I will cross the Calm Belt and reach the Drum Kingdom. Overall, it was one hasty and arduous journey that I planned for myself. And considering how long the distance of planned travel was, there wasn't even a second of time to waste. So I took a step forth, and before beginning my flight, the odor of nicotine entered my sense of smell. Shifting my eyes, I came to see one blonde-haired marine officer with a cigarette in his mouth, Cancer, walking toward me, along with the orange-haired teenage marine, X Drake, by his side. I stopped myself from beginning my flight, quite surprised by their appearance. Cancer, knowing that he recognized me right away, I greeted him in a monotone. So you were waiting for me, eh? Oi, smoker cancer, straight off exhibiting his confusion and concern, gritted his teeth. What in the hell is going on upon cancer entering my arm's range? I swiftly snatched the cigarette out of his mouth and burned it away. How many times have I told you not to smoke? Answer me. All right, cancer, uncaring of the burned away cigarette, shouted, what's with that bounty on your head? I mean, Hook died when he's warlord and that. But you aren't the type to make a choice as idiotic as chasing down the ally of the world government, you drake. On the other hand, trembled in rage, you are just like that scum of a father. Aren't you, you betray Bam? Cancer, slamming his fist onto Drake's cheek, barked in anger. Shut up, kid. Why the hell did you follow me in the first place? When I clearly order you not to do so, I looked at the two of them with a light smile, finding amusement in the current situation. Then, as two pairs of eyes looked at me with expectations, I answered, it was the other way around. Hook tracked me down and assaulted me, and on his back, reaching into my cloak, I took out a picture of the deceased Hook's back. Cancer and Drake, upon looking at the picture, widened their eyes in disbelief. There was the hoof of the soaring dragon. Three conclusions can be drawn from this. I raised three fingers up. One, there are the world government's loyal agents in the ranks of the marine. Two, they relayed the information regarding my route of travel to Martini Hawk. Three, they found my purpose of travel to Flevens Erking. WH at Drake whispered while half embedded in the snow. Now, get out of this country before they get suspicious of you. I said while walking past cancer, but do relay this info to our colleagues, Arobi, Gut Sensei, Zephyr San, and Kuzan San. Will you? Be careful of them, and you focus on your task of catching that dyer's barrels. However, I then found my right wrist caught by Cancer's hand. I found myself pleasantly surprised. Since when did you awaken your haki? Cancer didn't say anything, but hurriedly read the number written on my mini Den Den Mushi, before dropping my wrist back down. I, with a grin on my face, shook my head before speaking for the final time. This country is sick, and the world government plans to accelerate its death. My walk resumed. If you happen to come across any piece of information regarding the Ope Ope fruit, do give me a notice. People here need it more than those riches do. Cancer stood silently with his head dropped. Drake, on the other hand, whispered, I am sorry, but I was long gone by then. One day after Kuan Village is was on a dry and lifeless island, where the scrawny and bony civilians hid within their pulley-built huts and warily gazed outside. Every day, these people would search for food in this barren land filled with nothing but dead trees, 
However, things were different this around. After all, in the middle of the island was one cloaked man, surrounded by hundreds of marines who arrived here a few days ago. Trader to think will encounter you in this place of all possibilities on Agumo, who held his sword against the cloaked man with a murderous grin, stated, how fortunate for us. Yet another man who's fallen into his bias, thinking that he's the justice above the law itself. Tensei, shaking his head in disappointment, put on his black gloves. And I thought you are different former Vice Admiral Smoker. Needing to face yesterday's comrade truly pains my heart. Bayard, while feigning sadness, unsheathed his sword. I'll make this quick and painless for you, Smoker-san. That's the least that I can do. Three formidable Vice Admirals, along with tens of Marine officers and hundreds of foot soldiers under them. Smoker found himself in quite a troublesome situation. I should have gone to Rubik Island instead, Smoker thought dryly. Sorry for neglecting your wish, Gup Sensei. Onagumo, Tensei, and Baird. The three of them were known as some of the stronger ones within the rank of Vice Admiral. And Smoker, based on his observation Haki, knew that this won't be an easy escape. But nonetheless, Smoker masked his emotion and provoked the three Vice Admirals. Lots of barking there. Spider Dog, Black Dog, Orange Dog, Wow. I see three dogs in front of me. What are you guys? A rip off Cerberus. And just when Smoker said so, he found Onagumo's Haki imbued blade right in front of him. Swoosh. Onagumo glared with the active use of observation Haki as Smoker looked back at him with equally crimson colored eyes. Onagumo, then landing right in front of Smoker, said with a deep frown, so you aren't a former Vice Admiral for nothing. Onagumo was quite a huge man in terms of size. As his shadow loomed over Smoker, who was wearing a brown cloak to cover his body, the three pairs of spider-like black arms grew out from his back. To an average man, such a scene would have been terrifying beyond imagination, but Smoker was by no means average. Stay back and don't interrupt the fight. Tensei, while casually snatching seven swords from marine soldiers, ordered calmly, all of you will simply get in our way. The marine soldiers, who seemed petrified by the intensity of the atmosphere, didn't even have enough courage to speak a single word. Sweating profusely, they watched as Onagumo caught the seven swords that Tensei threw at him before thud. Baird narrowed his eyes as one marine soldier fell to the ground with his mouth foaming. He, feeling that the hairs on his body were standing up, gazed at Smoker, whose eyes were shadowed by his cloak. Swoo the surrounding air slowly swirled toward where Smoker stood. The three vice admirals flinched, and they then sighted the lightly bouncing and trembling pebbles on the ground. Such phenomenon wasn't from a devil fruit whatsoever, but conqueror's haki. Bayard scowled before dashing toward Smoker with his sword pointed at the latter. But before he could reach Smoker, the world seemed to turn grey for a brief moment, and there it came the burst of conqueror's haki, that swept across the entirety of the surrounding. Thud thud thud. The marine soldiers and marine officers of lower ranks, whom Tensei previously ordered to fall back, all fainted without any resistance. The weapons that they've been holding fell out of their grasp, and within a second, in the barren land of Kuan, there only stood four men standing. You are dangerous, Tensei whispered with the veins popping out of his forehead. And while saying so, he flipped out a pistol from his holster and pointed it at Smoker. Simultaneously, the liquid-like energy burst into existence and coated the swords that Bayard and Onagumo were holding. They began the operation of the emission of the armament Haki. Bang. And then, an incredibly fast bullet coated by emission of the armament Haki was fired from Tensei's pistol. Smoker watched with sharpened sense as the bullet flew toward him, and nine blades came in his way, attempting to stab him all at once. Three men at Martini Hawk's level. Ha Smoker thought as he breathed out the smoke, Seimei Kaiken. Ghost body swoosh. Smokey. Prior to the bullet striking Smoker's body, the air pressure generated from the projectile pushed Smoker's smoke-turned body away. Smoker, currently lighter than the paper, was flown away from the pressure of one bullet alone, and ultimately dodged boom boom boom. All the attacks simultaneously. Hum! Onagumo, immediately kicking off of the ground, dashed at Smoker, and wildly slashed his eight blades without any rest. Swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. However, each slash generated a substantial degree of air pressure, which effectively pushed Smoker's body away from the blades. Onagumo frowned from the accumulating frustration, for the operation of observation Haki was useless in front of Smoker's newly developed technique. Tap. 
Then, Smoker's smoke turned right hand momentarily shifted back to its original form, as its palm was now placed on top of Onagumo's chest. Onagumo's eyes widened as he swung his eight swords towards Smoker with desperation. However, it seemed to be too slow to prevent Smoker's attack, until, bang, another bullet shot from Tensei pushed away Smoker's hand and prevented the strike. Smoker, then swiftly turning around with eyes flashing red, blasted forth a snake of white smoke from his right hand. Revealing its fangs, the white snake coiled around the approaching sword of Bayard. And, Locke, instantly hardened from the hardening of armament Haki ultimately covering up the entirety of Bayard's emission imbued sword. Boom. The hardened white snake managed to render Bayard's sword heavy and slow, allowing Smoker to easily dodge and let Bayard's attack hit the flat plane. And immediately after, Tensei appeared right in front of Smoker with the use of Soru. Bang. A Haki imbued bullet from the pistol, Rankyaku, along with the sharp air wave generated by a kick. Smoker effortlessly dodged simultaneously released attacks from Tensei, just as the latter dropped his pistol and pointed both index fingers at Smoker, Tobushigen, Gatling Gun. Without any pause in between, the incredibly fast series of emission imbued flying finger bullets were fired at Smoker, who had his own index finger up Tobushigen. White Gun. Poof. One huge volume of smoke exploded forth upon colliding with the sharp Haki bullets of Tensei. However, the smoke possessing an incredible density, effectively slowed down the bullets. And by the time the bullets exited from the dense smoke, boom 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 smoker was already behind Tensei, with his left fist clenched up, white blow. Boom. Before smoker's fist was struck into Tensei's exposed back, Onagumo blocked smoker's attack, with his eight swords crossed together. At the same time, Bayard was behind Smoker with the Haki imbued white snake gone from his blade. However, this was within Smoker's calculations, and before Bayard could succeed in his attack, the smoke exploded from Smoker's punch, and engulfed all four of them at once. The three of them immediately jumped away from Smoker, but before they could react twelve identical-looking smokers followed them from the cloud of smoke. Each one of them held onto a swirling ball of white smoke, and each vice admiral was forced to face four of them at once. Bujom. Twelve white bows simultaneously exploded on them, and the recoil of the attacks sent them blasting back toward the small cloud of smoke. Furthermore, the smokes generated from those white balls closed in toward them, attempting to entrap them once more. Ugh. Onagumo. Gritting his teeth as a trail of blood exited from his mouth, then swung his eight blades at his full strength, Rankyaku, Spider Gale. Whoosh! A miniature storm was generated from Onagumo's attack, which blew the surrounding smoke away from him. However, just when he did so, Black Impact. Boom! Onagumo's eyes found Tensei in a horrible condition, with his sunglasses broken, his clothes tattered and grey smoke exiting out of his mouth. On his abdomen was Smoker's palm. Tensei, Bayard, who managed to get the smoke away from him as well, cried in disbelief as his fellow Vice Admiral fell to his knees. Cough, cough. Tensei then coughed out the blood that erupted from his ruptured inner organs. He, losing the strength in his body, looked up and stared at Smoker with disbelief. Why do you look so surprised? Smoker, without a single scratch on his brown cloak, said with a cold gleam in his eyes, Have you expected your pitiful self to be stronger than me? Smoker, Onagumo, enraged to the extent that his face turned red, flew at Smoker with eight swords pointed at the latter. However, Smoker simply grabbed Tensei by the neck and placed him in front of the approaching Onagumo, and Onagumo was forced to stop his momentum midway. Tensei, not daring to give up, raised up his trembling right hand to Smoker, and pointed its index finger at the white-haired man. Bang! A Tobu Shigen was fired at point-blank range, but Smoker simply dodged by tilting his head to slow. Smoker then threw the powerless form of Tensei to Bayard, who was secretly approaching from his back. Bayard, quickly retracting his sword, back was forced to receive Tensei. Huff huff cough cough. Tensei, not in a condition to fight any longer, fell down to the ground as Bayard gently placed him down. Now, Onagumo and Bayard each stood on Smoker's front and back, and Smoker, taking in a light breath, unsheathed Shusui from its sheath. Then, a shocking sight was unveiled in three men's eyes. Is this how you do it? It was barely visible and of weak strength. However, it was definitely there the omission of armament Haki. No, not perfect, it seems. Smoker casually commented as the weak omission of armament Haki flickered in and out unstably. Ha, huh, 
So this is what Gart Sensei meant when Haki truly improves only in the midst of a fight. Anagumo and Bayard let out a cold sweat from spectating Smoker's manifestation of the armament Haki. A mission. The tips of their swords trembled, and driven by a thought that they can't allow Smoker to grow any further, they leaped at the cloaked man simultaneously. However, White Spiral. Extending his Shusui holding right arm into a long smoke formed arm, Smoker goofily swung the sword circularly like a whip. Clang. The unstable emission of Smoker clashed against Bayard's formidable emission and was balanced off. Smoker nimbly jumped up to dodge four blades of Onagumo's. That was stabbed onto the ground. And, clang, subsequently clashed against Onagumo's raised up fifth blade. Again, Smoker, due to his inferior emission, had Shusui bounced off. Then, Smoker's Shusui holding smoke arm, suddenly hardened from the hardening of armament Haki, and, boom, suddenly swung Shusui at Baird with unexpected strength. Baird managed to block Smoker's attack, however, was unable to react as Smoker suddenly landed in front of him. However, before Smoker could do anything, eight blades suddenly penetrated his chest. Behind Smoker stood Onagumo who was huffing heavily. Poof. Bayard and Onagumo froze as the penetrated Smoker exploded into smoke. Are you what Onagumo whispered in disbelief? I clearly sensed him with observation Haki. So how boom. Onagumo didn't get to finish his sentence as an iron hard fist was smashed into his face at the next moment. Cough. With Tensei right next to his feet. Boom. On his side was Bayard, who had a few teeth loose from the same fist thrown by Smoker. Onagumo tried to raise his swords to defend as much as he can. However, boom. Having his vision obstructed by the thick white smoke, Onagumo couldn't react as another punch was slammed onto his abdomen. Cough Onagumo coughed out blood, and also choked from the lack of air. He stabbed his blades into the ground and gritted his teeth. His eyes flashed red and located Smoker's spot. He willed not to let himself be caught off guard again Boom. Ash, but to no avail. Onagumo didn't know if Boom. Ash his observation Haki was malfunctioning or Boom. 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 It was an incredibly quick series of punches. Within the thick smoke where only the smoke human could see through, three vice admirals were mercilessly being pummeled by hundreds of smoke clones. There are thousands of civilians suffering in the world due to the presence of those despicable celestial dragons. Smoker, not bothering to hide his true self any longer, coldly exclaimed within the smoke, sacrifices for the greater good. Are the deaths of those countless civilians for the greater good of your masters? Slavery, infiltration of marine ranks, anonymous plundering. Huh. Bayard, Tensei, and Onagumo shivered in fright as the smoke finally cleared. Hundreds of smoke clones were all deformed and absorbed onto the swirling ball of white smoke, which slowly turned into that a dark black, keep that worthless absolute justice to yourselves, hypocrites. Three ownerless justice coats, destroyed beyond return, fluttered against the air, before helplessly falling to the ground. And right above them, Black Serpent S. Snake. A gigantic snake of black smoke was blasted forth at the three vice admirals. It completely engulfed them through its open fangs. This this is a snake. Bayard thought while staring at the mighty black serpent with fear. And no. This is more like a draboom. The black serpent exploded magnificently. The three of them, unconscious and critically injured, fell to the ground with wisps of smoke rising up from their roasted bodies. And Smoker stood in front of the fallen vice admirals, with Shusui in his right hand. Smoker silently raised Shusui up, and pointed its tip at the exposed neck of Onagumo. My priority is to prevent the tragedy of the Fleavents. If I were to kill them right now, the world government and marines chase for me will become greater by many folds. In addition, there is no sure evidence to prove the wrong of these three. Killing at this moment isn't a smart decision to make. Eventually, Smoker, frowning and clicking his tongue, sheathed the sword back and walked away from the scene. Hundreds of marines, tens of marine officers, and three veteran vice admirals. All retired. Fleavance TCH, there's no threat here at all muttered Senor Pink as he walked down the snowy street. Atonement or not, this is boring as hell. A day passed since Smoker's departure. While Senor Pink aimlessly patrolled the island, he saw the civilians getting up early and heading to the amber lead mine with pickaxes. Why? Senor Pink couldn't help but think, for the repetitive task of mining on a daily basis for a low amount of income was something that he wouldn't consider doing for even a tiny bit. 
The only other person present on the street, apart from Senor Pink, was one elderly man who seemed to be crazy in terms of mental state. He 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 simply laughed with dazed off eyes as he walked down the street like a drunk man. Judging by how unkempt his overall appearance was, Senor Pink recognized that this person was the crazy Bill that Dr. Trafalgar spoke of. The man who lost his mind after losing his son. Not bothering with the man, Senor Pink simply walked past the man. And then, he suddenly stopped. Ha, huh, Senor Pink sighed, being good is such a hard thing to do. He turned around and walked to Bill. Oi, old man, you're going to catch a cold. Wear something warm or go back to your home. Upon Senor Pink's words, Bill stopped laughing. He froze before looking at Senor Pink with widened eyes. You are Bill's jaw slowly dropped before closing back. Who are you? Bam. Senor Pink, growing a tick mark on his head, slapped the back of Bill's head, you freaking old man. I thought you recognized me for a second, ah, uh, be a good guy. Good guy ye. Be a good guy like that white hair said. He immediately leaned down and lifted up Bill who was embedded in the snow. Sorry for that, old man. It's hard to suppress my hard-boiled tendencies you know. White hair, Bill, whose nose turned red from being exposed to the cold atmosphere for a long period of time, slowly dropped his jaw in shock. Oi, Senor Pink immediately barked at the man. I'm not falling for the second time. White hair, white hair, yes. I saw white-haired man coming here a day ago. White-haired Bill's eyes widened, white hunter smoker. Senor Pink watched with a deadpan as a snot dropped from Bill's nose before freezing in an instant. Bill, latching onto Senor Pink's coat, asked with a gleam of hope, why you a white hunter smoker's friend? Hey, Senor Pink nodded, nah, he's my boss. Boss T then, you must come with me, please. Bill pleaded desperately while holding Senor Pink's right hand. There is no one to trust. But you hear, if you are affiliated with Sir Smoker, who doesn't allow a single instance of wrong even, if it were to be done by the world government, I can definitely trust Bill moved his frail body back, trying to pull Senor Pink, however, to no avail. Senor Pink, humming with his hand under his chin, then frowned while swatting the elderly man's hand away. Let go. I only hold women's hands. Then, Senor Pink slapped his hand on Bill's back, and lead the way, he grinned excitedly, you got my interest. And so, Senor Pink was guided into one small house that was covered by a thick layer of snow. Bill closed the door and immediately headed to one small room, before returning back with a book in his hands. He, with trembling arms, handed it to Senor Pink. As Senor Pink took hold of it, Bill said in a teary tone, My son, he used to work as a researcher for the world government, supposedly analyzing the properties of the amber lead. But then, he suddenly quit one day, and died. Everyone said that my son committed suicide. But no, I know that he won't do such a thing, Bill cried. He was murdered. He was killed by those agents wearing white suits I saw behind the window, and to prevent myself from being killed by them. I had to act crazy for years. White suit. Senor Pink muttered while opening the book, a diary. Huh. Senor Pink's eyes, casually flipping through pages, eventually landed on one particular page, the page that informed the toxicity and risk behind Amber Lead. He shifted his eyes to the top of that page, and the date written was, February 21st, 1502. What the fuck? Senor Pink remarked, located in the southern part of the North Blue was an island named Lime Tree. This island, known to export a fine grade of lime world widely, was the island quite close to the Azure Isle. And, in the middle of this busy island, one muscular vice admiral, marine hero Garp, was found asking one young woman, How do I get to Rubik from here? Chcha! The young woman, oppressed by the fact that the infamous marine hero was asking her, replied with a trembling body, Um, I am not really a navigator. So I'm afraid that I cannot help you. By the time the woman said that, Garp was long gone, moving on to another person to ask. Not my fault that Bog had handled all the navigation part before. Garp complained while squinting his eyes at the wrinkled map. You better be at Rubik when I get there. Brat Garp. Then stopping by one cloaked man whose back was turned against him, casually tapped the back of that man and asked. Hey, you there? Ha! Huh. 
The cloaked man turned around. What? How do I get to Rubik from here? Garp stopped in the midst of his sentence as the cloaked man fully turned around and revealed his face to Garp. Garp. The man mumbled in disbelief. Garp, narrowing his eyes at the man, said, Shiki. Ah, two men pointed at each other and screamed in shock. What the hell are you doing in the North Blue? Shiki cried in panic while immediately flying upward. Back to you, Golden Lion Garp. Gritting his teeth, blasted himself off the ground and began chasing after Shiki. Shiki, while desperately flying away from the marine hero, grabbed his cloak and threw it away to reduce the air resistance. Garp, upon seeing Shiki's body, laughed while chasing after the latter. Bwahahaha. Three swords to replace three lost limbs. What golden lion? Garp clenched his fists and punched backward at the empty air, further propelling himself in the air, more like golden toothpick are. I'm not interested in fighting you. Garp Shiki shouted, while changing his path to dodge Garp's incoming punch. Boom. Leave me alone, you monkey. Even though the conversation seemed childish, two veterans had their eyes narrowed at one another. And Garp knew. The intel determined that id, the underworld powerhouse, desired his wish to gain the oak oak fruit. Then, judging by your presence here, Shiki you teamed up with that enigmatic man, eh? Garp thought while locking his eyes onto Shiki, smoker. Damn it, you'll have to wait for a while longer at Rubik, brat. The situation in North Blue was getting more and more chaotic. The weather was windy and unstable. The sky was cloudy, and with the sun hidden, no light was able to get through. Under such sky, there was one marine ship that was sailing on a calm and cold sea of the North Blue. Martini Hawk and his crew were the world government's slaves from the start. The deaths of Masterson, Dalmatian, Admiral Anastasia, and many other comrades of ours. They were essentially the works of the world government, the steel. Cancer, gazing at the sky with dark bags under his eyes, sighed as he talked to the Den Den Mushy. You know, I got to see Maynard yesterday. That guy, he's gotten a lot more buff than he used to. But he's also become pretty strange Dara. Bastille, through the Den Den Mushy, said weakly, Cancer grimaced in silence as Bastille continued. What a gloomy day it is today, thought Cancer. His hand, unconsciously shaking, reached for his pocket and took out a cigarette from its container. Lighting it up, he took a puff out of it. Who Cancer muttered, why must we fight? Why must the civilians suffer? What are the causes for people to turn evil? I don't know anymore, Bastille. I feel as if no matter what I do, nothing will change. That everything is meaningless in the end. Cancer watched as the smoke from his cigarette rose up to the gloomy sky. I'd like to believe that we're trying our best. And so was Smoker No. Smoker probably was the one who's been working harder than anyone in the rank. You should get some rest, Cancer Dara. Cancer didn't seem to have heard Bastille's words. I don't know, I just don't have that kind of motivation anymore. Cancer scowled while leaning back in his seat. What's the point of becoming a high-ranked marine officer? If we are nothing but pawns that the world government can discard anytime they want. Look at admirals being forced to escort celestial dragons whenever they are called. Fleet Admiral Sengoku. What could he do when the world government abruptly established the warlord system? And then there's Smoker who's been Vice Admiral until recently, targeted by the world government's dogs and wanted for retaliation. Around Cancer stood the marine soldiers of his division. Among them was X-Drake, and they were silently listening to Cancer and Bastille's conversation with frowns of their own. And you call Marine the Absolute Justice, Admiral Sakazuki. Absolute Justice my ass. We are nothing but the world government's dogs Cancer. Then exploded into a fit of rage, what justice? Fucking then, one marine soldier hurriedly came running with another Den Den Mushy in his hands. E Captain Cancer. It's the call from the Marineford. The soldier said warily, should I say that you are currently unavailable? Who? Cancer took a deep sigh with a cigarette in his hand before replying to the soldier. No, no need. A new mission, Bastille asked, hopefully not related to the world government. Cancer scratched the back of his head in frustration while taking another puff from the cigarette. I'll talk to you later. Cancer ended the call with Bastille and lazily grabbed the dial of the other Den Den Mushy, accepting the new call. Yes, yes, your non-cancerous Captain Cancer is here. What do you have for me? Fuck, sorry. Nothing, said Cancer, before his eyes suddenly widened in realization. Wait, Cancer's voice shook, oh, oh, fruit. 
Here Smoker stood, at the edge of Kuan with a frown on his face. He was about to leave, and then happened to hear the ongoing conversation that reached his ear by the wind. Why did you give birth to her? A bony woman was gazing at a young girl, who was just as starved as her, in contempt. She, filling her words with hatred, whispered with a dry throat, Not only is she useless, she eats them too much, said young girl, curling up on the ground while trembling in fear, was surrounded by multiple adults. Smoker could tell that based on the girl's immediate reaction, this wasn't the first time that this happened. I've been holding for years, and I don't even know what I decided to keep you until now. The woman expressed anguish before lifting up the stick in her hand as if trying to hit the girl. However, she, finding herself tired just from the act of raising the stick, lowered it and halved heavily. The other adults, glaring at the young girl, nodded, agreeing with the woman's words. Ha, huh, Smoker felt like getting a headache. A long flight was required, and time was running out. Yet, happening to coming across a scene like this Smoker, couldn't afford himself to ignore the situation. Tap. At the next moment a loaf of bread fell in front of the adults all of a sudden. It was the one thrown by Smoker, one that he kept with him since the flevance. Ha! Huh. One man exclaimed as his eyes immediately locked onto the bread. The other starving adults too, along with the woman, eyed the bread with widened eyes. Then, mine puck. Get out of my way. Fuckheads, a fight broke out among the adults. Like the savages, they bit, hit, and clawed each other without a control. Just for one loaf of bread. The young girl, covering her face and not even daring to take a peek from horror, couldn't even afford to breath out of fear that they may attack her also. However, she then felt her body being lifted up. So light. And one man's voice, the one who's probably responsible for lifting her up, was heard. The young girl slowly opened her eyes and found a cloaked man smoker looking at her with a complicated expression. A A the young girl tried to say something, but her horse through didn't manage to complete its task. Smoker, taking out a bottle of water with his other hand, opened the cap and helped the girl from drinking it. Upon receiving the water, the girl's eyes widened, and she instinctively gulped down the entire thing. Ha ha, and the girl huffed after finishing the entire bottle. Smoker, staring at the empty bottle for a second, then threw it to the back of one bleeding man. E-A-H-H, -H, huh? The man turned around while swaying side by side, before finding the bottle of water. Ha! Huh. He lifted it up and began clawing the bottle upon sighting a droplet of water in the bottle. You see that? Smoker, while placing the young girl on his shoulder now, said impassively, they had much more years to live. The fact that they survived until now, and based on the history of the North Blue, they probably were living in a better condition in the past. The current state of this island, and the miserable condition of their lives, all of them are the catastrophes that they brought on themselves. The young girl, who stared at the horrific fight between the adults ahead with teary eyes, mumbled, I, but you are different. You are a child who was born in this state. Smoker, taking a light sigh while closing his eyes, snapped his fingers. From his cloak, the wisps of white smoke exited out before joining all together and forming a small, bouncy looking nimbus cloud. Smoker placed the young girl on top of it and said, what's your name? The girl looked down, not wishing to see the fight any longer. Then, she responded, Baby 5, Baby 1, Baby 2, Baby 3, Baby 4, they all disappeared, and I'm the only baby now. Hey, your name is just as bad as mine. Smoker snorted, the name's Smoker. He stared at the young girl, named Baby 5, and said, Do you want, will I be of use to you? She asked timidly, if I'm going to be useless anyway. Then, throw away that useful crap, and decide your worth by yourself. Smoker harshly cut the girl's words and said, Hell, I don't even care if you're a smelly dude who loves to expose his nipples 24 sevenths, an idiot who trips on himself all the time, a hysterical pinky whose mood changes every second, or a weirdo who wears sunglasses in the night. Shh, shh, huh? Baby 5 jolted in shock as the flying Nimbus suddenly moved, moving upward to the sky, along with Smoker who stood by the side. So, what do you say? Smoker said casually as they began to fly forward at a rapidly increasing speed. Baby 5, unable to open her eyes properly even, 
had to hold onto the flying Nimbus with all her might just to stay on top of it. Then, the Nimbus morphed its shape, so that it fully encased Baby Five's body except for her head, and Smoker snickered. What? Yes. Good. But I didn't say thing thought Baby Five. And just like that, Smoker got a dead weight on his journey. New world in the wild sea where the lightnings rumbled down and tides rapidly crashed over and over again, four marine warships were found sailing through. They, having departed from the marine base G1, were currently heading to the Northern Calm Belt. But of course, the trade won't go smoothly, and on one ship, one old aged Vice Admiral, Suru, was found with her arms crossed. She, with a stern expression, gazed at the sea ahead of them. That crocodile kid he without a doubt possesses hatred for us Marine. Requesting Strawberry to be present during the trade, ha? Huh? Isn't that a little too obvious? On one adjacent ship stood Jion and her division. Jion, looking at Suru, asked, Sister, is it really necessary to dispatch this amount of force just for crocodile and barrels alone? Suru, upon hearing Jion, closed her eyes. She then said seriously, the value of oak op fruit is beyond your imagination, Jion. With sufficient medical knowledge, the user of the devil fruit becomes the world's greatest doctor capable of curing illnesses that are considered incurable. Chances like this don't come by easily, and world government this time around they are very adamant about gaining that fruit. In addition, of course, Suru grimaced the abrupt disappearance of Yuloma State Pirates, Gangster Pirates, Mamamia Pirates, and many more notorious criminals in the New World. All those cases were recently revealed to be the works of Sir Crocodile upon his reappearance. We cannot ascertain that man's current level of strength any longer, and that alone raises the danger level of this mission by many folds. For Nicker's sake, the sheer raise in the bounty from 81 million to 630 million Beely. That sure is saying something. Jion found her expression darkened after listening to Suru's explanation. Crocodile. The man who was defeated by Rear Admiral Strawberry in the past has now returned as a mysterious fellow. Will Rear Admiral Strawberry be able to do the same this time around? Jion couldn't help but think if Crocodile became so strong that he wiped out multiple pirate crews in the new world by himself Jion. Suru, while taking a pill with a cup of water, said seriously, Get ready for a battle. We got a company. Jion's eyes widened. Just when Suru said so, the lightning crashed, and the light illuminated by the lightning revealed 12 pirate ships, which were approaching them. Wufu, stop there, you blue freaks. At the front most pirate ship was the drunken man with captain's hat, laughing foolishly and giving a middle finger at the marines. All the marines instinctively felt that he wasn't your normal pirate, and subsequently gulped upon identifying who this man was. Suru, clicking her tongue, muttered John, I haven't expected to see the world's finest plunderer here. Captain John, the man with 1 billion 900 million Beely on his head. Not only is he a former member of the legendary Rocks Pirates, but is currently known as the world's greatest treasure hunter and plunderer, known to have accumulated all the stolen wealth in an unavailable location, that no one, not even his crew, knew. Suru John then shouted mockingly, You've become a whole lot ugly, woohoo Suru replied coldly, says the man who's undoubtedly in a worse state. While saying so, she quickly swept her eyes across the pirates. Why would this man and his crew, who's been avoiding us marines for years on purpose, reveal themselves like this? Ope Ope Fruit Suru frowned, id, the underworld powerhouse. Garp is also engaging Shiki from what I've received. Don't tell me. Suru, watching as John casually emptied a bottle of rum, Asked with cold eyes, your presence here does suggest that it is closely affiliated with the Rocks Pirates. John shrugged before yawning. Oh, is he? Dunno. I was just given the money, you know. Doesn't hurt to play mercenaries in a while. And besides, he throwing the bottle away, held onto the hilts of his two swords, sheathed on each side of the waist, oak oak fruit devil fruit, is always one of the finest treasures to stash two swords were then unsheathed. John swung them few times around before pointing the sword in his right hand at Suru. He said sluggishly, Hey, Marines, if you decide to retreat, we won't follow. But know that once you come a tad closer, bam. A fight will begin, the pirates around John snickered at the state of their captain, but nonetheless raised up their weapons toward the marines. Damn it. Jion muttered while holding the hilt of her sheathed sword, Compira. 
She looked at Suru to make an order, and Suru, without any hesitation, called, There is no agreement to make with the scums of the sea. Suru glared at John, before firmly stating, All marines, ensure that not even a single of them escape. All marines gathered their resolve while shouting proudly, Yes ma'am. John snorted at the sight of marines getting ready to attack, and commented boring as always. That's why your husband left you. John pointed his left sword at the sky, to the afterlife that is. Suru's cold eyes gazed at John impassively, and then, bang, at the New World Vice Admiral Suru and Rear Admiral Jones divisions began their clash against the pirate fleet led by Captain John. New world, unknown location smokes. Blood everywhere. On the sea, six pirate ships in total, with two on verge of sinking. Kek the atmosphere was ominous. The wind blew at a bizarre and continuously changing speed and magnitude. The sea churned and swayed the ships, but remained relatively gentle, such that the pirates were able to keep their footings on the ships. Kirk cough. Cough cough on one ship, hundreds of corpses were found piled up on top of one another. On top of the small hill of corpses stood the obese and long-nosed man with a small patch of black beard under his chin. He was Marshal D. Teach, the enigmatic pirate who was currently holding onto the neck of Whitey Bay, the captain of the fellow subordinate crew under Whitebeard Pirates. With the exception of her, all her crew members were wiped out without mercy and teachers' crew members were busy moving the treasures to their own ships. TCH Whitey Bay, gritting her teeth as she tried to get teachers' hand off of her neck, managed to mumble, You, why did you betray us? Oh come on, Bay. Teach, grinning with a speck of lust in his eyes, shouted boisterously, We are pirates. We act according to our desire. What betrayal? This is how it is meant to be. Whitey Bay held Teach's hand with her two hands. She desperately pushed against it, but Teach's grip didn't budge, and instead, cute the grip tightened. Listen, Teach exclaimed with twisted joy, your bounty amounts to 232 million, right? First, I will hand you over to Marine and become a warlord. And then, upon hearing your imprisonment in the Impel Down, Whitebird, that foolish man who's playing pirate and family at the same time, will move his fat ass. Zehaha, her teacher's voice boomed forth, and Whitey Bay, for some reason, felt shivered down her spine. It will be the war between Whitebeard and Marine, the war of another scale, the war between the apexes of the world, teach. Then leaned in and whispered into Whitey Bay's ear, Pops has become a little sick lately, hasn't he? I recall that he was still almost as strong as his prime, but the subtle changes brought by it, it must have some impact. Whitey Bay's eyes shook as she pictured what Teach spoke of. Her face became pale, and she, while struggling from Teach's grip still, secretly looked at one member of her crew, who was acting dead from beneath the pile. That crew member met his eyes with Whitey Bay, and nodded slightly bang. Ash before getting shot in the head by Teach who was holding a pistol with his other hand. But of course, there's another way out for you, Whitey Bay. And perhaps, that option may seem more appealing to you. Teach, casually placing his pistol back on his holster, said, Become my woman. You'd rather do that than rot in the impelled down forever, right? Whitey Bay, in return, gathered all her strength and spout on Teach's face. Teach frowned in displeasure, before throwing Whitey Bay to the wooden pole. Boom. The wooden pole broke, and Whitey Bay, injured to the point where she couldn't muster a strength, simply focused on filling her lungs back with the air. ECH, impelled down it is. Teach said while rubbing the spit on his face. Marriage in the holy land that sits atop the red line, there stands one building nearby the infamous Pangaea Castle. It is the military facility of the Celestial Dragons that strategizes and controls the Marine and some of the world government-related troops. In here sat one muscular man with spiky white hair and a similarly spiky white beard. He was Kong, the former Fleet Admiral of Marine and currently the world government's commander-in-chief. And in front of such a man stood an orange-haired admiral, Blaze. He, exhibiting a playful smile, placed a paper form on top of Kong's table. And this is, Kong asked in a low tone. Blaze, giving a light shrug, replied, a resignation form, commander-in-chief. Kong frowned while raising his head up and looking at Blaze, you are too young to resign, admiral. 
And, Blaze questioned, why must I be bound by this organization until death? Rather, it is because I'm young that I desire to retire. Where's your justice at Admiral Blaze? Haven't you joined the Marine to correct the wrong of the world? Blaze shook his head while giving a light chuckle. You are accounting for the select few, Commander-in-Chief. He opened his arms wide and stated, human beings are naturally born evil. Anyone who's capable of thinking with a sane mind prioritizes him or herself above all else, be it wealth, honor, or strength. Most of the Marines join the organization for their own gains, rather than justice. It's the same for you, Commander-in-Chief, who left the organization upon receiving the offer to be placed in your current spot. Blaze gazed at the displeased Kong mischievously. Don't push your radical ideals on me, Commander-in-Chief. Marine, to me, was nothing but an occupation. I don't care if what I do is right or wrong, for as long as I get benefits out of it, I am satisfied. Kong narrowed his eyes, you are, am I reminding you of someone? Blaze interrupted Kong casually. Someone with glint glint fruit, perhaps. Well, I'll leave it at that. He took off the justice coat and dropped it to the floor. Immediately after, the floor beneath the justice coat was suddenly zipped open, and the justice coat disappeared into the gaping hole. Kong watched in silence as Blaze exited the room. He then sighed while massaging his temple. What in the world? Kong doubted that the higher-ups would allow this. However, Blaze, no longer the Admiral, walked through the peaceful and beautiful path in Meriadjoir. He, holding his hands together on his back, walked with a handsome smile, exhibiting nothing but content. However, contrary to his outward appearance, he was currently full of thought. A report of Whitey Bay's capture by the newly risen Blackbeard Marshal D. Teach, and his request to become a warlord. Considering that Whitey Bay is a notorious pirate whose strength is well recognized, the five elders came to determine that his acceptance into the system is adequate enough. The resignation of Blaze was based on a calculation from the beginning. Whitey Bay will soon be moved to the Impel Down and be imprisoned on the lowest floor. Within a week, this news will be out in public and Whitebeard he'll definitely move. A war will occur one between the powerhouses of the world. And furthermore, Blaze then stopped on his way and looked at the sky. White, Hunter Smoker. Five elders ordered him to assassinate Smoker without earning Garp's hostility. It was essentially an impossible task, but Blaze believed that there was a way. Capture White Hunter before the start of the war. Place him in the Impel Down. And that's why Blaze quit the Marine. He needed to move himself, for it was proven that even the combined strength of Bayard, Tensei, and Onagumo wasn't enough to defeat that man, and the seat of Admiral simply directed too much attention for him to move out. But alas, here I go, Blaze, forming a shrewd eye smile, then jumped down the Meriadjoie. In mid-air, while descending rapidly, zippers suddenly appeared from his arms and spontaneously unzipped. And from the generated holes, Blaze took out a mask of a clown and a white hat before placing the mask on his face. The time of Admiral Cedar Hebby was over, and the chief of the Cipherpole Aegis Zero, Piero was on his way to hunt down the White Hunter. East Blue, Logetown, January 23rd, 9 a.m. Almost two days passed by since Smoker and Baby Five's departure from the Kuan Village. By no means was Kuan Village in North Blue, close to the Pole Star Island of East Blue. And yet, Smoker not only crossed the entirety of the Red Line in two days, but managed to reach the Logetown that lied on the Pole Star Island. It was an unbelievable speed that most of the individuals won't be able to achieve after their lifetime's training. Ha and Smoker, not having managed to sleep for days by now, was currently sitting down on a staircase with Baby Five. Baby Five, also draped around by a cloak that Smoker recently purchased, dozing off by his side. Underneath Smoker's eyes were dark bags, and the only source of salvation in current situation was a dango stick in his hand. And yet, a smile found its way on Smoker's face. Are you doing well, Captain Merlin? Are you still stuck with those idiots? Wahaha. I can picture you complaining as you always did. Smoker, taking a bite out of it, gazed at the busy street where the civilians jovially continued on their daily lives. He never expected to revisit this place the place in which his transmigration began as a wanted man. Watching the scenery made Smoker feel a little nostalgic, thinking that many things happened since then yuck. 
Then, Smoker suddenly stopped chewing and frowned at Dango Stick, mint flavor. Is this real? Suppressing his urge to vomit the food out, he barely managed to swallow it down. Subsequently, Baby Five, wake up. Smoker shook the young girl's shoulder and woke her up from her slumber. Baby Five, rubbing her eyes and yawning, stood up wobbly and looked at Smoker with half-lidded eyes. Smoker handed her the Dango stick with a blank expression, full or not, wanna try Dango. Baby Five jolted up with widened eyes as she took hold of the Dango stick. She, without a word, looked back and forth between the food and Smoker, before taking a bite of it. Smoker waited for her reaction in anticipation. Well, then, she whispered, this is so good. Better than Odin. What? is wrong with you. Smoker squinted his eyes at her, wondering if the girl's sense of taste became messed up after the prolonged starvation. The two of them, having taken a rest for a little period of time, now walked down the street. And unlike his experience in the past where he was recognized even with the cloak over him, he currently had fashion glasses over him just like Robin, which surprisingly proved to be effective in concealing his identity. Still the same as ever. Smoker mumbled to himself as he looked around, did the time here stop since then? He stopped one civilian who was going his way and asked, Who's the current commander of the Marine Branch here? Said civilian replied with a grin, Captain Merlin. Duh, before going his way, Baby Five looked up at the chuckling Smoker out of curiosity. But Smoker simply rubbed her on the head. Just then, yay. Three scoop ice cream. One girl was found running down the street. A man who seemed to be the girl's father smiled as he walked from behind. Be careful. You might fall when you run the girl. Running without control ended up smashing her ice cream on Smoker's cloak. A other girl, filled with disappointment, raised her head up and found a scary looking man with glasses staring back at her. Huh. The father of the girl gulped, noticing from straight go that Smoker wasn't a normal man. The girl whimpered, my ice cream the man quickly closed off his daughter's mouth with her hand. I'm so sorry. My kid he then panicked as Smoker leaned down to his daughter. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry kid. Smoker said to the girl, looks like my cloak ate your ice cream. He reached into his pocket and handed what was in there to the girl. Here, go buy yourself five scoops. This girl had blonde hair just like the one whom the cannon smoker met in the year 1522. Smoker wondered as the girl and her father walked away after giving their thanks. If that girl is the mother of the one whom the cannon smoker meets. But eventually cracked a smile and discarded such thought. Why are you laughing? Baby Five asked. Smoker shook his head with a smile. It's nothing. He then took in a deep breath and erased the smile. And thus, their journey to the Drum Kingdom seemed as if it was going to resume. However, Smoker's mini Den Den Mushy rang at the next moment. And in the middle of the busy street where people passed and conversed by, Smoker and Baby Five were no longer walking. Baby Five looked at Smoker worriedly as Smoker, with his eyes shaking in disbelief, held the mini Den Den Mushy right next to his ear. Oak Oak fruit is found. Smoker felt as if his heart stopped. January 25th, 12 a.m. The weather was cold on Minion Island. The sky was full of snow, covering up all the present buildings, trees, and plains with white. At the same time, the island was silent, for upon the arrival of Crocodile and his subordinates, the civilians hurriedly evacuated. And down the hill, three marine officers stood, looking up at the higher ground solemnly. They were Vice Admiral Mazambia, Rear Admiral Strawberry, and Captain Cancer. Behind them stood the marine soldiers, standing with nervousness that right above stood the notorious Sir Crocodile, and the betrayers of Marine, Dyer's Barrels and his underlings. It looks like Vice Admiral Tsuru and Rear Admiral Gion won't reach here on time, Mazambia, placing the dial back onto the Den Den Mushi that a marine soldier next to him was holding, exclaimed, and so is Vice Admiral Garp. He turned to Strawberry and asked nervously, are you sure that we are enough to take them out? Vice Admiral Tsuru told us that a battle will break out without a doubt. He definitely became stronger. However, so did I, Strawberry stated firmly. Furthermore, his over-reliance on his devil fruit grants him a crucial weakness against water. Unlike other loges, being soaked makes him unable to morph his body into the sand and nullify physical blows. The current bounty on his head doesn't attribute to his actual strength. Cancer, standing silently next to his superiors, gazed at the hill grimly. 
5 billion for the op op fruit, eh? Cancer felt complicated. What will happen if the fruit ends up in the world government's hands? Or if a criminal ends up eating? Cancer felt as if there existed a huge burden on his back. His heart was beating fast out of nervousness. However, taking in a deep breath, he calmed himself down. Subsequently, he turned to X Drake who stood among the marine soldiers, and said seriously to the teen, Keep your emotion in check, Drake. Drake, while biting his lips out of frustration, nodded. Mizambia then spoke up, All right, all Marines, we're going in. Yes, the Marines all began marching with their bodies tensed up, ready to engage at any moment. They carefully checked the surroundings while doing so, looking out for any trap. And finally, they reached the top of the hill. In front of them lied a small house, and before said house were the former Marines No, the pirates. Looking back at the Marines with excitement, among them stood Dyer's barrels, and one man with slicked back black hair, Sir Crocodile, the user of sand sand fruit. It looks like the representative of it isn't here yet. Barrels, who was holding onto a small chest, looked at Crocodile and asked in a low voice, what should we do? It's proven at this point, said Crocodile while smoking a cigar. That golden lion shikey was it? but happen to meet marine hero of all possibilities. Then, we wait. Crocodile stated, wait until it finds another route to contact us. His help is necessary to enact my plan. And what of those marines then? Crocodile didn't reply this time around and instead grinned. From this alone, Barrels immediately understood what he was about to do. Crocodile, with the grin intact, then spoke up at a loud voice to the marines ahead. Why, long time no see, strawberry. Crocodile's eyes seeming crazed almost locked onto the marine officer with a long black beard. Strawberry sharpened his eyes, where is the op oak fruit? Barrels opened the chest in response and showed marines the heart-shaped devil fruit inside. Mizambia whispered to a marine soldier next to him who nodded and confirmed that the fruit in the chest was the op op fruit without a doubt. Who crocodile, taking a puff out of a cigar, then flicked his head, and where's the promised amount? Strawberry, without saying, turned around and said something to his back. Two marines then walked out, carrying a tray full of bellus. Barrels and the other pirates all gasped in delight upon sighting the unbelievable amount of money in crocodile whose eyes flashed in greed, walked forward to it. Each stack is worth 10 million. There are 500 of them on this tray. In total, it's exactly 5 billion. Mizambia stated as Crocodile looked at the money tray in awe. Crocodile continued walking closer to the money tray. However, Strawberry then unsheathed his sword and pointed at Crocodile's neck, stopping Crocodile's approach to the money. Hand over the devil fruit first, Crocodile. Crocodile, unbothered by the sword on his neck, narrowed his eyes at Strawberry who glared back at him. The tension was rising, and Cancer had his hand on his sheathed sword, ready to unsheath at any time. Strawberry, remember the last time when we met? Crocodile then said in a cold tone, taking an abrupt shift in his demeanor, the day in which my crew helplessly got arrested by you and your division. He then raised his head up and gazed at the sky. It was raining heavily back then. Strawberry, not daring to lower his sword, raised his eyebrow, and, It's snowing today, replied Crocodile. He raised his hand up and felt the snowflakes that landed on his hand, snow melts upon touching my skin and becomes water. It drenches me and renders me unable to transform into the sand. Back then, the rainy weather made me vulnerable against your attacks, and situation-wise, it's quite similar today. Then, Crocodile's eyes suddenly flashed in a murderous manner. Strawberry, feeling a chill out of Crocodile's gleam, instinctively swung his sword at Crocodile's exposed neck and clang. In contrary to Strawberry's expectations, his sword didn't manage to decapitate Crocodile. What? Strawberry whispered in confusion, it didn't even go through. Mizambia and Cancer immediately unsheathed their swords and aimed at Crocodile. The marine soldiers raised their rifles up and aimed at Crocodile. Haki, Strawberry murmured but then denied it. No, this doesn't seem like Haki at all. He, frowning in disbelief, growled at Crocodile. What have you done? Crocodile Crocodile gave a crazed grin to Strawberry. Figure it out by yourself, Marine. And then, a sharp and horizontal wave of sand generated from Crocodile's hand was swung at the three Marine officers, Desert Sparta, Buom, Strawberry, Mizambia, and Cancer all raised their swords and blocked Crocodile's attack but were knocked back from the sheer force behind it. The three of them grimaced as they landed back on the ground, and were sent skidding back by some distance. 
Ugh, one marine soldier gulped from witnessing such a frightening scene. Subsequently, bang, bang. Immediately following Crocodile's attack, all marines fired. The bullets all flew toward Crocodile rapidly, and the marine officers expected them to go through Crocodile without any harm. However, in contrast to their expectations, the bullets with clanging noises bounced off of Crocodile instead. Though caught off by the suddenly bouncing back bullets, the three marine officers immediately raised up their swords, and, clang clang clang, slashing their swords exquisitely, managed to parry away all the bounce-off bullets. Thanks to their efforts, no marine soldier was harmed by their own bullets. Fire, just then, barrels ordered loudly while pointing his sword up. Bang 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 the bullets filled up the sky, as countless number of them were fired from both sides. Mizambia, Strawberry, and Cancer clashed their swords against Crocodile's yet another wave of sand. And Cancer, from the corner of his eyes, then came to sight Dyer's barrels x Drake, recklessly charging to his biological father with rage written on his face. Cancer shouted in disbelief, Drake desert Girasol. Boom. Cancer didn't have time to finish his sentence as Crocodile. At the next moment manifested a dense blade of sand and stabbed it into the snowy platform below. The snow was absorbed in an instant and many marines all of a sudden lost their footings. For the ground below the snow layer crumbled down into a huge pit of sand. HHHH several marine soldiers cried in horror as they were engulfed by the sand. They instinctively reached their hands out. But before their comrades could save them, they fully disappeared into the depth of sand. What in the world? Cancer grimaced as he stood in the air, having managed to avoid Crocodile's technique through the use of Gepo. Cancer. Then, Strawberry said calmly, leave Crocodile to the two of us, and go fetch that idiot. What about Crocodile then? Cancer exclaimed with widened eyes, and Mazambia nodded in agreement to Strawberry's words, while eyeing Drake's state. Look, that moron is about to die. Cancer narrowed his eyes at the daring crocodile, before clicking his tongue and dashing toward barrels with the use of sorrow. Crocodile, watching Cancer's dash in hilarity, let the man go. Hum. Crocodile then tilted his head as he shrewdly gazed Strawberry and Mazambia. Are you sure that sending that to him was a good choice? Strawberry and Mazambia simply raised their swords up in response. On the other hand, at some distance away, Drake was found fallen with his own sword dropped away from him. Barrels, standing right in front of Drake, snorted, You haven't changed a single bit, Drake. Useless and impulsive, how are you going to become an admiral like that? Fuck you, Drake screamed while glaring at Barrels heatedly. Barrels simply rolled his eyes, not having a simple bit of compassion for his own son. Then, he raised his sword up and pushed it forward to stab it through the exposed Drake's forehead clang. Cancer managed to appear just in time to parry Barrels sword away from Drake. Kid Cancer growled at the rapidly huffing Drake, I'm so going to kill you when this is over. Captain Cancer Barrels snorted in amusement, Are you here to avenge your pal Dara? Barrels swung his sword around casually, before vanishing from his spot with the use of sorrow. Clank Cancer and Barrels swords met one another once again. Shigen. Bang. Cancer quickly tilted his head to evade Barrels' attack. Sweating profusely from the tension, Cancer then gritted his teeth as Barrels vanished from his vision once more. Clang. Barrels snickered as his blade met Cancer's again. Can't you tell? Barrels grinned devilishly. There is far too much difference between the two of us. And unlike the case of that Bastille, you use the same type of weapon as me. Simply put, defeating me is an impossible feat for you. Fucking shut your mouth, Cancer snarled. Before, clang 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 clang. The two of them began engaging each other in fast series of sword strikes. Cancer held his sword with two hands and was using all his strength while Barrels was grinning and holding his sword with one hand only. Shigen. 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 Bang. 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 Cancer's eyes widened, Tekai clang clang clang. Cancer, while petrified under the state of Tekai, managed to block all three finger guns and a sword slash simultaneously. Huff Huff Cancer breathed heavily as he wiped the sweat on his forehead. Barrels, cracking his neck casually, then vanished from his spot yet again. Clang. Kaya. Within the dark night where the cloud blocked the dim lights of the moon and the stars, Baby Five, fully enveloped by the white smoke except for her head, was found screaming as she, along with Smoker, flew by at an insane speed. Huff Huff Smoker, 
who seemed exhausted from flying at such speed for a long period of time, was found sweating profusely. However, he managed his concentration and willed himself to maintain the current speed, in order to reach the Minion Island as quickly as possible. Crocodile and Oak Oak Fruit Smoker gritted his teeth, how in the hell? Then, Smoker felt a little lightheaded. Smoker Baby 5, looking at Smoker with concern, shouted, Your nose is bleeding. Smoker, upon hearing Baby 5, rubbed under his nose. His right hand was stained with blood. Huff I'm fine, Smoker said while returning his eyes to his front. This is just a tomato sauce. The blood on his hand and nose slowly turned into wisps of smoke and left Smoker's body. Smoker, not bothering himself with it, instead thought out of worry, hang in there, cancer. The time was ticking, and the battle on the Minion Island was ongoing. White Hunter was racing against the time, and the current time shown on his wristwatch was 1am, wahoohoohoo you've gotten weaker, Suru, Captain John, standing in the middle of one marine warship grinned as he pointed the tip of his right sword at the fallen Suru's neck. Suru, who had a trail of blood at the corner of her mouth, glared at John without a word. Sister Tsuru Jion, who too was found lying on the deck, shouted while trying to muster her strength to stand up. However, it was to no avail, and she grimaced while holding a deep wound by her side. The battle was in the pirate's favor, with the two commanders of the marine fleet having fell at the hands of the pirate captain. The marines were having a difficult time in maintaining their line of defense against the ever-advancing pirates. However, Suru, in this circumstance, then smiled, much to John's confusion. Of course, I was aware, said Suru. I don't excel when it comes to brute force, and never have I been in type to charge into a battle like a certain idiot. John opened his mouth with a raised eyebrow, about to ask where Tsuru got her confidence from. However, he then stiffened for he felt a strong presence that entered his range of observation Haki. I decided to fight you for one simple reason John. Tsuru, leaning her back against a rail, chuckled. It was because I was confident of stalling you, Ice Age. Until the arrival of the backup, John panically turned around. In his eyes were the world of ice, be it his crew members, 12 pirate ships of his, or the sea around them all, were frozen into the cold and sturdy ice. Arara, did you predict this, Surusan? Kuzan was found standing right in front of Tsuru and having his back facing John. Tsuru grinned while lowering her head, just a little hunch. Shaiki's presence in North Blue was the give-off. Jion, at some distance away, sighed in relief before relaxing her body. Aokiji. John scowled in annoyance, having recognized Kuzan. Kuzan, in response, shifted his cold eyes at the man. Damn, sneak attack as always, John finally sighed, before tightening his grip over his swords. Kuzan, tensing his body up, breathed out a cold air as he readied himself for the fight. Then, swoosh. Kuzan shifted his body to his left, and dodged two swords that were slashed onto his previous position. Immediately after ice block, partisan, the surrounding moistures in the air condensed into multiple spears of ice, before slamming onto John at a point-blank range. Clang clang clang. John protected his body with the hardening of armament Haki, shattering the ice spears instead. The battle has just started. Swoosh. Cancer ducked to dodge barrel sword slash before using Soru to dash to Barrels behind. However, Barrels, having expected such a move from Cancer, utilized Soru simultaneously. By the time Cancer reappeared and slashed his sword, he was hitting nothing but an empty air. Then, Cancer urgently tightened his body. Tekai Clang. Barrels, standing behind Cancer with a grin, slashed his sword against Cancer's exposed back. Cancer, grimacing from a jolting pain, immediately turned his body around by spinning around his embedded sword and sent forth a kick, Rankyaku. Clang, Barrels' sword and Cancer's sharp blast of air met, preventing Barrels' advancement for a brief moment. Barrels, not giving Cancer any time to rest, dashed toward Cancer and raised his finger up. Shigen, Lash Kami E, bang. Cancer's body unnaturally bent and managed to dodge a finger gun that was fired by Barrels. Immediately after, he plucked his sword out and swung against Barrels. Clang Huff Huff Cancer, whose sword was clashing against Barrels, huffed while glaring at Barrels. It's already been around an hour or so since he began fighting Barrels. And the fight was going in a bad direction, with him getting slowly exhausted, 
and barrels still looking good to go. One opportunity nonetheless. Cancer gathered his resolve, one is all I need. Boom. Cancer loosened the strength behind his sword and let Barrel's sword slam onto the ground. He subsequently stabbed his sword forth at Barrel's chest to which Barrel's didn't bother to dodge. Tekai. Clang. The tip of Cancer's sword broke upon striking Barrel's sword. Barrel's looked with amusement as the shortened sword of Cancer was trying to push its way into his chest, but to no avail. Cancer Drake, at far distance away, shouted out of worry. You are weak, Cancer, and there is no way for you to pull out a win against me. Barrel snickered, physical capability, Rokishiki, swordsmanship, I'm superior in all those aspects. Simply put, I'm the better version of you. Barrels pointed at the broken sword against his chest, just look Cancer Barrels laughed boisterously. Your weapon broke against my bare skin. What's the point of fighting any longer? when the outcome is obvious. Drake looked at the scene with despair. He wobbly stood back up and lifted his own sword back up, wishing to prevent the worst scenario from coming true. And then, obvious. Cancer, whose eyes were shadowed by his bangs, grinned all of a sudden. You're right, this victor of this battle was decided from the very start. One opportunity where Barrels lowers his guard. This was just the moment that Cancer was seeking for from the very start. Barrels, confused by Cancer's antics, raised his eyebrow. Then, his eyes widened in shock as Cancer's broken sword, still pushing its way against his exposed chest, began changing its color into that of a pitch black. It was the armament Haki, hardening, the feats that Barrels was never able to achieve in his life. You Barrels urgently shouted as he tried to get away from Cancer's sword. However, it was too late by then, Puck. For the broken sword effortlessly was driven right into Barrels' heart. My strength may be lacking in comparison to you. Physical capability, Rokushiki, swordsmanship. Yes. I didn't get as much time as you to hone my skills. However, if there is a reason why I can guarantee my victory against you, Cancer, plucking his sword back out from Barrel's bloody chest, stated, It's because my will never falls short against a scum like you. Barrel's, at the last moment of his life, expressed nothing but disbelief, that he lost to a young man whose age didn't even reach 20. Drake, watching this scene from far away, dropped his sword in disbelief. Huff Huff Barrel's fell, and Cancer remained standing with a vivid exhaustion. Cancer, turning his eyes at Drake, gave him an angry middle finger, to which Drake reacted with a nervous gulp. And just then two heads landed in front of Cancer's feet. Ha! Huh. Cancer, dumbfounded, froze up. Those two heads Cancer immediately recognized them as Mozambia and Strawberry, the two marine officers who were to deal with Crocodile. Cancer raised his head up. Within the snowy weather, the sand managed to make its way in, swirling within the sky and rendering the atmosphere chaotic. In the middle of it was Crocodile, who looked down on him with an interest. Barrels lost. Crocodile exclaimed to you. Cancer then looked at the fallen barrels. Next to the fallen man was the chest that contained the oak oak fruit. Moving his eyes away from it, Cancer checked the field ahead of him. There stood nothing but corpses, all marines, and all pirates except for Crocodile all were dead. You, Cancer growled at Crocodile. You killed your own subordinates. Crocodile grinned madly. Before they became my underlings, they were once marines. In addition, I no longer have a use for them. Crocodile then held his right hand out. Hand over the oak oak fruit now, and I will give you a painless death. Cancer's face darkened. He stayed silent for a little while, before leaning down and lifting up the chest. Then, Drake Cancer abruptly threw the chest at Drake, and bravely dashed toward Crocodile. Drake, receiving the chest with a stiffened body, then gritted his teeth in realization before throwing his own sword at Cancer. Cancer, flying toward Crocodile with the use of Gepo, caught the flying sword and encased it with the hardening of armament Haki. Higher, Cancer let out a wild war cry as he swung the Haki-coated sword with all his strength. However, clang. Crocodile, raising his right arm up, effortlessly blocked Cancer's strike. And from this clash alone Cancer came to realize, Haki Cancer whispered in shock, you have it too. Unlike Cancer, Crocodile didn't utilize his armament Haki to an extent where the hardening effect occurred. However, it was sufficient enough to defend against Cancer's attack, and from this clash alone, Cancer realized that there existed far too much gap in in overall strength between the two of them. Crocodile, with an amused grin, 
then swung his sand-morphed hand through Cancer's left arm, Bajan. Cancer found his eyes bloodshot from pain as he fell down to the ground. His left arm, robbed of all its moisture, was horrifyingly shrunken. Gah, he, rolling in pain, then vigorously ate away the nearby snow out of instinct, and managed to restore the arm back. Drake watched this with fear creeping down his spine, however, then saw that Cancer stood back up from his spot and glared at Crocodile once again. Crocodile, now frowning in annoyance, asked, Why are you fighting? Why are you resisting? You know that there is no point. No matter how hard you try, you won't be able to win against me. Why ignore the easy path and take the hard one? Huff 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 shut up Cancer huffed while sweating profusely. His sword trembled from his exhaustion. But Cancer's eyes still held the determination that Crocodile was unable to comprehend. Then, Cancer dashed at Crocodile one more time. It was between one to two months ago when I found myself in the starry night of Marineford, gazing at the stars next to Cancer. Will you look at that? muttered Cancer as he stared at the sky in awe, a milky way. Galaxy, was it? He raised his hand up as if reaching for it. I wonder if it's possible to go on an adventure there like Gupsan once said. Upon hearing Cancer's words, I too came to wonder if it was possible to do so. Unlike my previous world, perhaps there existed an air to breath in the space. Smoker. Then, Cancer, seeming melancholic, called out my name. We've come quite a far away, didn't we? I still remember when you first arrived and knocked Maynard out with one shot. Man, it was fun. He lowered his head and bit his lips expressing anguish. And he began speaking. You know, I used to live in the whole cake island back then. Of his past that I was never aware of before. I was a part of a prestige family where all men became the knights of the royalties who ruled over the Total Land. Back then, I aspired to become one also. Haha <laughs> Cancer chuckled hollowly. And then the big mon pirates invaded our land and took it over. The royalties managed to escape through the escort of my family, who were all killed in return. The marine attempted to regain the control, but lost the war against the big mon pirates. It was the worst week of my life, and to this day Cancer's right hand, shaking without a control, slowly reached for his pocket. However, I held his wrist and prevented him from taking out a cigarette. Cancer looked at me with widened eyes, sighed, before dropping his arm. Do I want revenge? Perhaps I did in the past. But now, I don't know. Cancer placed his hand on his chest. Back then, when we escorted the civilians back to their home from the Sabaudi archipelago, I felt a sense of achievement. It felt as if I was actually being a marine for once. And after that, I felt my hatred for the big mon pirates weakening. I think I kind of understand now, of what you mean by being righteous. Cancer, then looking at me and forming a light smile, said, So you know, if a situation like that arises again, the situation where there are those in help, tell me. I'm ready at all times, smoker. I, in return, gave him a grin of my own, of course, hey. Within the Dark Minion Island, the snow stopped. The top of the hill, instead of snow, was filled with vast volume of sand. The island was silent, deadly almost. And in such a place, Smoker stood with a crestfallen expression. Hey Cancer. In front of Smoker lied Cancer, who was no longer talking. Judging by the blood pool around the blonde, along with a huge gaping hole in the middle of his chest, Cancer was already gone. Say something, idiot. Smoker traveled for days without a rest, at his maximum speed. Say may kaiken. Ghost body. The use of black smoke, the application of sorrow and gepo smoker, used all that was available to him. And yet, he was late. Can sir. Drake, who had the chest next to him, muttered in a dazed off state. Baby five, horrified by the corpses that laid all across the area, covered her mouth in fear. Smoker gritted his teeth. He, with a trembling hand, leaned down and closed the man's eyes. Tears escaped from his eyes, with him unable to conceal his sadness. It hurt him. The pain of losing a close friend right in front of him at pain Smoker worse than any sort of physical agony that he's undergone before. He couldn't bear it. He saw nothing but red as he stood back up and directed his enraged eyes at the killer of cancer. White Hunter Crocodile, thinking that the situation has become troublesome, growled. The veins were popped out of Smoker's forehead, showcasing that he was more outraged than he ever was. Rest in peace you non-cancerous cancer. And there, his wrath began. Swoo Drake shivered as the smoke slowly poured out from the standing form of Smoker. 
It spread throughout the dried up land and swirled. What a ghastly scene it is, Drake couldn't help but think. E, get back. Drake, quickly taking hold of the petrified Baby Five and the chest containing the oak oak fruit, began running away from the scene. Crocodile, citing this with a visible annoyance, was about to interfere Drake. However, Crack Crack froze on his spot as the pebbles nearby began to rapidly bounce up and down. The ground quaked lightly before parts of it broke and crumbled down. Brutum. Crocodile finally realized in shock of the incredible surge of Conqueror's Haki that emanated from Smoker. The air screeched, the buildings down the hill wobbled, and then there was the strong pressure of the air that sent Crocodile skidding back. Quite emotional, aren't you? Crocodile forced a shaky grin on his face, trying to hide his surprise. There are hundreds dead in this place. And yet, you are angered by the death of one man. Crocodile steeled his mind, for he has overcome many arduous situations. It was no different this time around. Desert then, Crocodile, with his eyes locked on Smoker, raised his right hand up. And at the next moment, Sparta. A vertical wave of sand was sent flying toward where Smoker stood, at a frightening speed. It ground the soil that lied along its path. And with the newly formed sand joining the wave, the sheer volume of sand, by the time it reached right in front of Smoker, was simply mind-blowing boom. Crocodile's wave of sand was blasted apart in an instant. The air screeched from an explosion of an unbelievable magnitude, and by the time Crocodile's eyes widened from witnessing such a view, Clang Crocodile was found shielding his face with his two arms, coated with armament haki. Hardening against Smoker's haki-imbued fist. Boom. After the initial clash came the sudden explosion of white smoke from Smoker's fist. The pressure from the smoke slammed Crocodile right onto the ground, and Crocodile, not even having enough time to register the pain from Smoker's attack, then had to morph his body into the sand and retreat as the released white smoke of Smoker's subsequently turned into multiple snakes that threatened to bite on him. Swoosh! Crocodile, through the use of his observation haki, barely managed to dodge Smoker's abrupt appearance by his side. Bajan Crocodile immediately retaliated with a strike of his own, but Smoker simply leaned his body backward to dodge the Sandman's attack with ease, before slamming his right foot onto Crocodile's chin. ECH! Crocodile, quickly regaining his bearing and hovering in the air now, glared at Smoker while holding his palm out. Swoo immediately after, a miniature storm of sand was generated on Crocodile's palm. Just when Smoker vanished from his spot, Crocodile turned his body around and threw the miniature sandstorm, Sables. The sandstorm instantly expanded into a gigantic scale upon leaving Crocodile's hand. And in front of said sandstorm stood Smoker which puffed away upon receiving the blow. White Spiral. Crocodile flinched as Smoker's voice was heard from his back. And then, boom. Shusui, having its hilt wrapped around by Smoker's long smoke made arm, impacted upon Crocodile's haki coated arm. Boom. Crocodile attempted to evade Smoker's attack, but to no avail as Smoker's eyes, locked onto his own, were flashing in red. Crocodile, gritting his teeth while instantly bursting out heavy mass of sand from his body, boom 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 boom, began parrying Smoker's unpredictable whip-like slashes with dense layers of sand. Though the sand crumbled down every time Shusui slammed against it, Crocodile quickly restored with the new supply of sand. Eventually, Smoker's Shusui lost its momentum, and Smoker, retracting his smoke-made arm back, came to hold Shusui with his bare hand. Heck, Crocodile then let out a smirk at Smoker, whose left index finger was pointed at him. Huh, Tobushigan, white gun, poof. Crocodile's vision was obstructed by the suddenly released volume of white smoke in front of him. Aren't you underestimating me too much? White Hunter Crocodile growled. Sables he, finding Smoker's intent through the thick smoke with the use of his observation haki, generated another miniature storm of sand from his palm. Simultaneously, the vast volume of white smoke in front of Crocodile was sucked away by Smoker, who was flying at Crocodile with Shusui resheathed and his right palm holding a swirling mass of black smoke. And as Crocodile gritted his teeth and threw his mini sandstorm, Pesado slash, Black Blast. Boom! A magnificent explosion occurred as two potent techniques clashed against one another. The sand, red in color and extremely hot to the verge of melting, was blasted off everywhere. Smoker and Crocodile, both shielding their faces, were knocked away from the area of impact. Tap tap. As two men landed back on the ground, Smoker, 
though not speaking a single word, was found huffing with dark bags under his eyes. But nonetheless, Crocodile didn't dare to lower his guard, as he grimaced with a cold sweat on his back. Not giving Smoker any time to take breather, Crocodile then slammed his palm to the ground below. Ground Seco. The already dry ground began to crumble. The layer of snow was long gone before, and upon Crocodile's technique, the ground became a barren land comparable to that of the Kuan village. Now, the portion of the hill of Minion Island has become the mountain of sand at Crocodile's disposal. The platform below Smoker shook before crumbling down into the sand. In this state, Crocodile's hand on the plane pushed through the ground, Desert Girasol. Upon Crocodile's call, the barren ground sank, and a sand pit, several times more huge than the one he used against marines previously, came into existence. The sand enveloped Smoker's feet and began sucking him inches high. Smoker, in this situation, took in a light breath while closing his eyes. Not dodging as his surroundings morphed into the sand and began pulling him into it, Smoker eased his exhausted and anger-filled mind. He, while his legs were engulfed by the sand, turned his head and looked at the very distant Drake and Baby Five. Looking at him with worry, Drake seemed to be shouting to him to get out of the sand pit that he was being sucked into. Flevance. World Government. Oak Oak Fruit. Crocodile. Many things happened recently, and there's no way back. Smoker reminded himself that cancer sacrificed his life, so that the oak oak fruit won't fall into the hands of the criminals and hypocrites. If a knowledgeable doctor like Dr. Trafalgar eats it, the amber lead syndrome will effectively be cured, and the fruit will be put to good use. It's not the time for me to act mindless, is it? Smoker opened his eyes as all parts of his body, except for his head, were now engulfed in the sand. He looked up at the sky and whispered, Don't worry, I'm not going to waste your sacrifice. Smoker's eyes, now just above the rapidly sucking sand pit, blazed in a cold rage. It held a dark resolve to rip apart the despicable pirate who unleashed yet another sharp wave of sand. Just before his entire body was engulfed, and just before the sharp wave of sand imbued with weak armament Haki cut him through, Smoker whispered, Blackout. Booyom the incredible volume of sand erupted from an explosion of black smoke. Crocodile. Not having expected such retaliation from Smoker, was knocked away from the sheer pressure as the latter walked out from the no empty pit. White Hunter. Crocodile gritted his teeth, so what if if out of shock Crocodile stopped his words? Smoker was holding out his right palm, and on top of it was a miniature smoke storm, swelling rapidly. It was the replica of Crocodile's sables, but with smoke instead. Swoo White Storm, Smoker then released his technique impassively. Pisado. Boom. The storm was shot at Crocodile with incredible velocity and pressure, instantly subverting Crocodile's view. Crocodile, for the first time since his arrival here, coughed blood out. Crocodile. Flipping his body back and regaining his bearing in the air, glared at Smoker with bloodshot eyes. Desert however, Smoker wasn't done. He, glaring at Crocodile down on the ground, snapped his fingers, transmutation, black. Whoosh. The blasted tornado of white smoke suddenly turned into that pitch black. Immediately after, the black smoke combusted into fire. And now, Crocodile was laid in the middle of the blazing firestorm, which rapidly swelled at an accelerating pace, before, boom, exploding into a huge fit. Huff huff within the cloud of smoke after the explosion, there lied a dome of sand encased with the armament haki. The sand dome then crumbled down, revealing Crocodile who was found huffing lightly. And at the same time, Crocodile too noticed boom. Smoker's foot slamming onto his cheek and sent him flying. Cough. Crocodile grimaced as his vision became hazy from the pain. He couldn't help but wonder why Smoker's attack hurt when he not only condensed his body with moisturized sand, but also covered the area of impact with hardening of armament haki. Swoosh. In the middle of Crocodile's non-intended flight, Smoker appeared on top of Crocodile in an instant, with his right fist clenched tight. Crocodile, through his hazy vision, then noticed an enigmatic, liquid-like energy wrapped around Smoker's fist boom. Crocodile felt as if his eyes were popping out as he was slammed on the ground by Smoker's punch on his abdomen. His jaw dropped and trembled from the impact alone, and he, panically morphing his body into sand, escaped just in time to evade Smoker's foot stomp. 
that blasted the impacted ground into multiple pieces. Swoosh. However, even before Crocodile had time to celebrate for successfully dodging Smoker's attack, Smoker was right in front of him once more with both fists, emitting wisps of black smoke clenched tight. Crocodile's eyes gleamed in horror, and just then, Black Barrage. Boom. The thin layer of sand armor on top of Crocodile's skin crumbled down. Boom. The pitch black hardening of armament Haki on Crocodile's skin faded away. Boom. Crocodile's nose was rendered into a bloody and non-recognizable piece of flesh. Crocodile's entire body screamed in pain as Smoker's explosion containing fists didn't know when to end. He was propelled back and forth as Smoker continuously pummeled him against the direction that he was flown at. And he, uh, unable to bear the pain any longer, finally let out a horrified scream out of instinct. His mind told him to give up, to resign and beg for a painless death. And then, a voice was heard in his ear, Captain, live on and find one piece for us. That dream of ours. You know cough greater than Crocodile's eyes widened. He, even while having his body bloodied and broken, gritted his teeth, boom, before the huge volume of sand suddenly exploded from Crocodile's body. Smoker, caught off by the sudden attack, was flown to the huge pit that was previously generated. Die, 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 die. Crocodile, breathing with difficulty due to his broken nose, screamed with craziness. He relentlessly poured all the available sand to where Smoker was crushed at. It was a monstrous scene to witness, for the sand wave was so enormous that it shadowed half of the pit. Smoker, landing at the bottom of the pit, spat out the blood to the side. He, looking up too, saw the wave of sand that began to descend like rain. Smoker crouched his legs down in silence. While doing so, the wisps of smoke exited from his mouth. Then, he vanished, swoosh. A trail of smoke was left in the slightest gaps generated between the sand rain. Smoker repeatedly vanished and reappeared, moving upward to the exit of the huge pit, without having himself hit by the sand rain. Swoosh. Smoker landed on a side wall, before propelling himself once more. Swoosh. Smoker was in midair, morphing his body into the smoke to dodge the sharp waves of sand that cut through the trail of smoke that he left behind. Swoosh. Smoker was right standing right before Crocodile, who expressed nothing but malice and madness. Sable's Crocodile blasted the incredibly concentrated storm of sand. Grand Pasado boom. Smoker, tilting his body at the last moment, managed to evade Crocodile's technique from blasting him back into the pit where the sand has been restored. And instead, the pressure from Crocodile's technique sent him flying high up into the sky. By the time the momentum died, Smoker was above the thick layer of clouds where the brilliant stars of night greeted him. Muttered cancer, indeed. Smoker let out a hollow chuckle as he stared at the starry sky. An adventure to space sounds like a ton of fun. The immense volume of cloud below Smoker began to swirl. Smoker raised his right hand up, and on its palm, all the cloud, along with the emission of the armament Haki they began to gather and condense into a miniature galaxy, swirling in a mesmerizing color of the rainbow. Or perhaps, you two have begun yet another journey in another world. Who knows? A smile died down from Smoker's face, and he clenched his fist. As renishingly, the entire miniature galaxy above his palm was sucked into his fist. Then, cocking said fist back, he began to descend at an accelerating pace. He headed his eyes downward to where Crocodile stood within the incredible mass of sand. Crocodile, watching as Smoker began dropping toward him with the huge, swirling mass of cloud, whispered, Desert Crocodile instinctively felt that this was going to be the final clash. Raising his shaky right hand up and straightening his bloody nose with a brutal grip, Crocodile clenched his left fist tight. Grand, however, Crocodile miscalculated. Even before he readied his technique, Smoker, at the sky, at a far distance away from Crocodile still, abruptly punched his right fist forth, White Galaxy. Crocodile's eyes widened, and his left arm dropped to his side out of despair. I've returned from the dead in the dark stomach of that despicable sea king. I survived for months and yet be on. And at the next moment, Drake and Baby Five at far, far distance away came to witness a gigantic explosion of energy that engulfed Crocodile and the entirety of the sand pit. However, in contrast to its destructiveness, the scenery, for some reason, seemed beautiful in their eyes, sparkling in a variety of colors, as it reflected the dim lights of the stars above. Tap. 
Smoker landed on the ground, and the pirate named Crocodile was no more. Instead, there were only the broken skeletal remains of the Sandman, which gave a hollow grin at him. Smoker frowned, and, crack, mercilessly raised his foot up and crushed the skull into the powder. Smoker, then raising his head up to view the now clear sky, sighed. He reached his shaky hand into his pocket, and took out a cigarette that he previously retrieved from cancer. Ha! Huh. Smoker chuckled with his eyes shadowed. He slowly brought the cigarette to his mouth, and bit on it. Smoker flicked his finger, and the tip of the cigarette was lit up. He, for the first time in his life, took a puff out of the cigarette. Who? And, just as he expected, the taste was bitter. Goodbye. Thud. By the time the smoke died down from the cigarette, Smoker lost strength in his legs, falling down to the ground powerlessly in front of one tombstone that he briefly made. Smoker felt as if his mind is drifting away from consciousness into the deep slumber. No. However, Smoker willed himself once more. There still were works for him to complete. The oak oak fruit the matter hasn't been resolved yet. Oh, so he lifted his body back up shakily, reopening his exhausted eyes that threatened to close at any time. Smoker gritted his teeth that was still biting onto the used cigarette. Drake. Smoker then spoke. Behind him were Drake and Baby Five, staring at him in a mix of worry and wariness. In Drake's hand was the chest containing the oak oak fruit. What is it? Smoker stated firmly, take Baby Five and go to a marine branch away from this island. Claim that you are unrelated to me, and return to the marine no Baby Five, immediately rejected Smoker's words with a tear-filled voice. D don't throw me away. Smoker frowned while turning his head back. His expression looked terrifying in Baby Five's eyes. However, she glared at Smoker with her lips bit. Her fists were clenched, and with her entire body, she expressed her will not to adhere to Smoker's order. Same here, Drake then growled, giving Smoker a rebellious look. Why must I go back to that hypocrite-filled organization? I don't feel safe there, and same with this girl here. You. Two Smoker groaned in fatigue as he placed his hand over his face. He sighed deeply, before turning his head back and walking away. Drake and Baby Five looked at each other with widened eyes, before cracking light smiles on their faces. Baby Five, not minding the bloody scenery, followed the back of the cloaked man. On the other hand, Drake turned his eyes to the tombstone. His eyes turned teary, and he lowered his head slightly at it. Thank you. Then, Drake ran up to one man and one girl who were walking ahead. January 25th, 1506. Flevance, North Blue you look awful, commented Senor Pink as he looked at the cloaked smoker standing with Drake and Baby Five, and suspicious too. Yes, I bet, replied Smoker whose demeanor was filed with nothing but extreme fatigue as he walked past the man with sunglasses. Drake, uncaring of Senor Pink, immediately followed Smoker. Tired, huh? Senor Pink muttered as he watched Smoker walking toward the hospital, before finding a gaze on him. Turning his face, Senor Pink found Baby Five looking up at him. What? Baby Five squinted her eyes, you are the one with sunglasses. Ha! Huh. Senor Pink said in confusion, but Baby Five was running by then, leaving him dumbfounded. He then jolted up, before shouting at Smoker. W wait, boss, there is one thing that I didn't tell you yet however. Smoker and Drake were already in the hospital building by then, walking up the staircase. Dr. Trafalgar. Smoker spoke weakly as he looked around. Hello. Drake raised an eyebrow. Where has he gone to? Dr. Trafalgar is dead. Then, a voice, one that belonged to a young boy, was heard. Smoker and Drake both turned their head in the direction in which said voice came from, and saw a black-haired young boy with a white fur hat. He overworked far beyond his limit for a year and more. He was already terminally ill with a variety of diseases but his cause of death was a heart attack that was likely induced by stress. Smoker felt a headache. He, closing his eyes and massaged his temple, then asked, Then who are you? Trafalgar Law, the boy replied in a monotone, Dr. Trafalgar's son, and also a doctor. Smoker's half-lidded eyes widened. He took a clear look at the boy, and only then did he realize that the boy was Trafalgar D. Water Law indeed. His lack of sleep was really getting to him. And what of the other doctors then? Drake then asked while looking around. Law snorted cynically, what other doctor? Those mediocres ran away a long time ago. Doctor Association. Ha, I am better than them anyway. 
Smoker, finding the current situation unbelievable, chuckled. At this point, he wondered if it was the Devil Fruit's truly possessed wills of their own, for every single Devil Fruit up until now was taken by those who received that same fruit in canon also. Ugh, what's this place? Then, Baby Five entered with a frown. Why are there so many people lying downstairs? And it smells bad too. Behind Baby Five was Senor Pink, who looked troubled as he stared at Smoker. Listen, law. Smoker, suppressing his depletion as much as he could, placed the chest down on the table. In this chest lies the Opo fruit. This fruit is the treasure that the world government was willing to pay 5 billion Beely to get their hands on it. And I stole it. What? Law initially tilted his head. Then, his jaw dropped after processing the information in his head. He subsequently squinted his eyes at Smoker. Are you insane? Insane. Drake suddenly exploded in anger. Shut up, kid. But was stopped as Smoker raised his hand up. This fruit does wonders. Such as being able to keep a patient alive and painless during surgical operations. Even if you extract an essential organ, and even if you slice apart the nerves, the patients will be kept alive. This fruit is probably the only way available, Smoker said, to extract the amber lead out of one's body. Law's breathing quickened hearing Smoker's information. He locked his eyes on the chest that Smoker opened, on the hitch of devil fruit that lied within. Oh, boss, Senor Pink stuttered in disbelief, don't tell me that, eat it. Law, Smoker stated impassively and become the hero of Fleavance. Smoker's half-lidded eyes then gazed at the corner of the room, where two pairs of eyes were secretly peeking. Smoker let out a light smile as he closed his eyes, realizing that they were Law's mother and little sister. He could see that Law was trying to protect his family in his deceased father's stead. Fine. Law finally said with his arms crossed, before getting his back slapped by Baby Five. Gah. What the hell? Hey, aren't you being too ungrateful? Baby Five pointed her finger at Law with anger, at least say thank you. My head is a million times more precious than an airhead like you. Fuck off, girl. Law, frowning in annoyance, raised up his hand and gave a middle finger back at her. Ho! Baby Five didn't seem like she was going to retreat. I-5, Smoker then lifted her up by the back of her shirt and began walking out. Don't make any further fuss. We're leaving. Smoker, therefore, exited the hospital along with Baby Five. Senor Pink immediately followed, and Drake gazing at the devil fruit for the final time with a grimace, finally turned around and walked out. And now, Law sat still on his spot for minutes, staring at the devil fruit hollowly. Then, he finally tapped the table twice, and signaled to his family that it was safe to come out. Oak, oak fruit. Huh? Law's eyes teared up. Dad, your wish has come true. His small hands shook, and he lowered his head, crying silently. He then stood up wobbly and kowtowed toward the direction that Smoker exited. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ha! Huh. At the edge of the Fleavance, Smoker sat alone. In his mouth was an unused cigarette, but it wasn't lit up. He, uncaring of the fact that the snow below his butt was drenching his pants, began nodding his head, slowly going to sleep. Over the night, Law was busy. He, with the newfound power of the Opo fruit, conducted the surgical operations on himself, his family, and all the civilians in Fleavance, and miraculously resolved the case of Amber Lead Syndrome. Smoker, as Law did so, watched from afar without sleeping, ensuring that everything went well without an issue. And Law asked after all was over, less than why did you go so far for us? Greater than. Smoker replied back then. Smoker now had his eyes closed. Though he was still in a sitting position, his body swayed, close to falling to a lying position. Fleavance is safe now, right? Though I'm not sure about how things will progress from here. At least that Amber Lead Syndrome is no longer a concern. Currently, Senor Pink, X Drake and Baby Five were waiting for him at the port, ready to depart. Smoker, lifting his heavy eyelids back up and standing up, decided that it was time to leave back to the polar island where his friends were waiting, and then get some sleep. For once, the sky above Fleavance was clear. The sun gently shone down the island, which the surrounding snows reflected and brightened up the area. The usually harsh wind was currently calm and soothing. Overall, it was a nice weather to enjoy, Smoker thought optimistically and you are. Ash before an intruder entered the scene. White Hunter Smoker, it sure took some time to find you. A masculine voice was spoken from Smoker's back, 
Who would have expected for a man to travel across the vast sea of North Blue in a span of two days? You got me amazed on that one, I admit. Behind Smoker, one agent was standing. He had a white suit, a matching white hat, and a clown-like mask covering his face. EP0, mumbled Smoker. Why, hello there, the agent bowed. I go by the codename of Piero. Pleased to meet you, criminal. Smoker didn't reply. Instead, he raised his mini den den mushy strapped wrist up and spoke into it. Pink. Leave without me. Smoker ended the call, unstrapped the mini den den mushy, and placed it on a nearby tree branch. He similarly took out the white den den mushy from his cloak and placed it next to the mini den den mushy, to which Piero exhibited a surprise. A rare breed, him Piero hummed. How did you attain it? I wonder. But nonetheless, taking his attention off of it, Piero then asked, So, have you finished your parting words? Smoker didn't say anything in return. Then, swoosh. Smoker vanished, intending to end the fight as quickly as possible, due to his unbearable exhaustion. He appeared right behind Piero White Piero, to Smoker's shock, was standing behind him instead. Having foreseen the latter's move, and managed to move at an even quicker speed, Smoker stood with his right fist outstretched, punching through the empty air. Smoker's eyes then widened as two fists were placed on his back. Then, Rakuigan, Golden Roar, Boom. Rakuigan, enhanced with the flowing, advanced use of armament Haki. Internal destruction, blasted through Smoker's body at a point-blank range. From Smoker's agate jaw, the blood spilled out. Smoker's eyes hollowed out and he began to fall to the side powerlessly. However, Tat, Smoker, gritting his bloody teeth and mustering all his strength to his legs, prevented himself from falling down. His body trembled as he struggled against the gravity that was pulling him down. Ho, Piero muttered in amazement, as expected from someone who's been trained by the marine hero. Kirk Smoker, managing to stand back up, dashed toward the agent with a hazy mind. He instinctively unsheathed Shusui and swung it with all his might. Swoosh. Ah, a black blade Shusui. I see. Piero remarked while effortlessly dodging Smoker's slash. As far as I remember, this belonged to the legendary Ryuma, the protector of Wano. Wano? Kaidu aha swoosh. Moria. I see. Right, you defeated Moria before. Piero, casually remarking, then turned his body around and kicked Smoker's Shusui holding arm. Smoker, focusing all his attention on keeping himself awake, couldn't prevent himself from losing the grip on his sword. Then, Piero, with his left hand having casually taken over Shusui, pointed his right index finger at Smoker's bloody chest. Ha! Huh. From the contact alone, Smoker instinctively knew that he lost. He, understanding that this may potentially be his end, bo ha 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 ha, laughed genuinely with his eyes closed from an unknown sense of elevation in his mind. And then, Shigen, Rylatachi, boom, a potent attack struck through Smoker's chest, effectively knocking the latter out. Thud, huff huff, within one uninhabited island, where the trees and vegetation were ruined and destroyed in a chaotic mess, the man with long and spiky blonde hair, Golden Lion Shiki was found huffing while leaning his back on a tree bark. Hair. However, Shiki then grinned. What caught your attention? Gup. For you to give up on chasing after me. For days and nights, Shiki was relentlessly chased and attacked by Monkey D. Gup. Shiki retaliated to his maximum capability. But his loss would have been guaranteed if the chase were to continue. However, Garp suddenly ended the chase and left Shiki by himself. Even if the opportunity to attain the Opo fruit has already passed, Shiki doubted that Garp would have given up the chase without a substantial reason to do so. Whatever, Shiki then muttered, that devil fruit wasn't that important to us anyway. He then raised his head up and gazed at the sky wistfully. This time around will succeed, right? Shiki whispered in anticipation. After all, if what that punk said is true, if he really is the successor of Zebek's will, he will awaken that fruit and become the Earth God. He'll complete what we so yearned for in Zebek's stead to change this disgusting world into the true age of pirates. Shihaha! Shiki grinned, as long as I can see that coming true, be it losing my entire crew or losing three of my limbs. The rocks pirates we haven't collapsed yet. The wind blew ominously, as if reflecting the dark desire that Shiki held. And on this face, there existed nothing but that of bliss in contrast to his heavily injured state. January 31st, 1506 in the cold and harsh weather of Polar Island, 
Hina stood in disbelief as she gazed at Senor Pink, Baby 5, X Drake, and surprisingly, Law, W, what do you mean? Hina whispered, Hina confused. No, Hina must have heard it wrong. Say it again. Senor Pink lowered his head and frowned in anger. His clenched fists shook in frustration, and he finally muttered, Boss, has been caught by CP0. From Hina's back, Rosinante stood with dark expressions on their faces. And it wasn't an average one even by the standard of CP0. Senor Pink explained with a shaky voice, that man's strength it was far beyond your imagination. I wish to help, but there was an order from the boss to retreat with these people. Law lowered his head. It frightened him that smoker. The man whom he was intimated throughout the brief conversation was silently defeated and taken away. He, knowing that the opope fruit is an extremely valuable fruit, came to fear that he may place his mother and little sister in danger and ended up coming here with Senor Pink, Baby 5, and X Drake with uncertainty in his decision to do so. Mom, Lami Law thought with sadness, will I be able to see your faces again in the future? Just then, a nearby Den Den Mushy rang. Law seized his thought, and Hina, with sharpened eyes, immediately grabbed the dial and accepted the call. This is Dragon of the Revolutionary Army. Aramaki, who was leaning against a wall with his arms crossed, narrowed his eyes at the Den Den Mushy. In which smokers caught, Hina said stoically, am I wrong? The Den Den Mushy frowned, expressing Dragon's annoyance, calm yourself down and listen. Dragon, from the other side, sighed. He, seemingly in quite a stress, clicked his tongue as he continued. Within this silence, everyone listened to Dragon's words with their utmost focus. What the fuck are you talking about? Rosinante, finding himself in confusion, whispered, Marine Hero Gup is your dad. Another voice of Ankov's was heard through the same Den Den Mushy. The Den Den Mushy's eyes widened before Dragon's voice was heard, disregarding what I just said. How do we disregard that? Thought everyone, but Dragon nonetheless continued, just... As Dragon said, Smoker isn't the only one caught. Said Hina after the call has ended, with a fresh newspaper on a table. Ice Witch Whitey Bay, one of the Whitebeard Piratus executives that decided to build her own crew, has been caught by Blackbeard Marshal D. Teach, one who's been given the title of Warlord in return. Hina's cold eyes sharpened as she gazed at the picture of Whitey Bay. That was displayed on the cover page of the newspaper. Whitebeard moved out of his territory, obviously in order to retrieve Whitey Bay. Essentially, Whitey Bay, to Marine, is nothing but a ticking bomb with no merit whatsoever. Hina snorted, as far as I can think, Fleet Admiral Sengoku will bring Whitey Bay out of the Impel Down. Out of concerns that Whitebeard wreaking havoc in the Impel Down will release all the criminals and return all Marines' works to Null. Rosinante muttered, is it possible to defeat Whitebird even? I, too, have the same doubt. And if we can think of this, so can the five elders of the world government. Hina grimaced, I have a bad hunch. It just seems a little strange to me. Just a short period of time after Whitey Bay's capture, Smoker 2 was captured. If a war is to occur, and all the eyes will be focused on it, then due to the mistakes made by the staffs of the Impelled Down, the prisoners will accidentally be released from their confinements. And in the middle of this chaos, White Hunter Smoker will be killed by those malicious pirates. CP0 Agent Piero or the former Admiral Blaze stated as he genuflected, and prior to those pirates escaping the facility, the immediately dispatched CP agents will resolve the situation that is the plan that I have set, dear gods. Too risky. Far too risky for our liking, remarked one among the five elders who were found right in front of Blaze. However, earning Gup's disobedience is worse than having those pirates escape. Furthermore, the very presence of White Hunter Smoker itself is proving to be a threat to us, in a sense that Marines are coming to question their loyalties. But still, another elder then spoke solemnly, initiating an operation of this scale during the war against Whitebeard. There are too many variables to consider. It is because of said war that now is the only time, dear gods, Blaze then said with his head lowered still. Marine Hero Garp will certainly be required to face the wrathful Whitebeard, along with Fleet Admiral Sengoku. They won't have the time to process the ongoing operation in the Impel Down. The assassination that you ordered for me this is likely to be the only chance. The five elders, in silence, looked at one another. They deeply contemplated for a while, before one among them finally stated, It is permitted. However, with one condition, the elder grimaced. 
Do not free Demon Air Douglas Bullet under any circumstance. Wall. Whitebird moved. In the darkness, there sat one extremely muscular and huge-sized man. He, characterized by gigantic horns on his head, drank away a bottle of liquor while reading the newspaper in his hand. Interesting. The man grinned. Is it because his subordinate is caught alive this time around? Would you have come if I kept Odin alive instead of killing him? Throwing the bottle away, he roared, Reefal. His voice thundered across the room, and the walls shook from the sheer force generated by it. One servant entered while sweating profusely before hurriedly exiting the room with the empty bottle on the ground. Wereroro the man, casually throwing the newspaper away, chuckled while standing his huge body up. He said in glee, it doesn't matter, does it? War will happen for sure, the war between the strongest man in the world, the marine hero, and the golden Buddha Wereroro. His body shook in excitement. He aggressively grabbed a huge and spiky kanabo, named Hasekai, before swinging it few times around impulsively. Boom! The air pressure generated by his casual swings destroyed the surrounding walls effortlessly. But engulfed by the excitement, the man ignored the damage around him and shouted with a wide grin, King Queen, get ready to sail. His voice boomed across the entire island. The servants, petrified by the man's domineering burst of conqueror's haki, then fell simultaneously with their mouths foaming. We're going to a war where Ororo, he was Kaido of the Beast, the warmongering maniac who's been defeated seven times throughout his life, caught and arrested 18 times, tortured and locked up for countless occasions yet came out alive. Being one of the three known catastrophes with Whitebeard Edward Newgate, he was being called as such by people nowadays. The strongest creature in the world. Impelled Down, known as the world's greatest prison, is commonly known to be constituted of five floors. Level 1. Crimson Hell. Level 2. Wild Beast Hell. Level 3. Starvation Hell. Level 4. Blazing Hell. Level 5. Freezing Hell. Also, it was known that the lower the floor, the greater the threat level, and the committed sins of criminals. However, there lied one hidden floor beneath the freezing hell, named the Eternal Hell. Harboring only the worst of the worst, this place served to erase their identities, deeds, and everything that constituted them from history itself. That teach. Who would have known that he was hiding such a color within his idiotic look? And in this prison, a woman of long blue hair and thick lips, Whitey Bay, snarled while being cuffed on her wrists and ankles. Damn it, Whitey Bay cursed in anger as she tried to move her body around. However, strapped by all limbs, she was fully immobilized. Eventually, she sighed while loosening up her body, before gazing at an individual within the same cell as her, also locked up by the cuffs on his wrists and ankles. White hair and toned physique. This man looked young, around 17 to 18 in terms of age. He was Smoker, one who currently was snoring without a care of the world, with a huge snot bubble inflating and deflating as he breathed in and out. White Hunter Smoker Whitey Bay muttered, having recognized Smoker right away. I wish I can be as relaxed as you. Just by the look alone, Smoker looked as if he was in a fine hotel instead of the world's worst prison. But, really, when are you going to wake up? Whitey Bay said out of curiosity. After all, Smoker was sleeping for days ever since his arrival. Jeez, you are just like Pop's oi, woman. Then, a deep voice was heard from the darkness, causing Whitey Bay to freeze. Be quiet, will you? A pair of eyes glared down at Whitey Bay and she instinctively shivered in response to it. Subsequently, before Whitey Bay could say anything, woman, said another voice within the darkness, ha 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 ha, before a sipping sound came, ha 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 ha, wait, hold on, Whitey Bay squinted her eyes, what are you drinking? The laughs and sipping noises abruptly stopped, and the silence returned, what were you drinking? Damn, Blaze's abrupt resignation at this time, why? In the quiet office of Marineford, Sengoku muttered with a strong headache, Borsalino's promotion, Smoker and Whitey Bay's imprisonment, Whitebeard last found in the Fishman Island quite near, Sengoku, unable to think any further, bit his lips out of frustration, what am I supposed to do in this situation, Gup? In front of Sengoku stood Gup whose entire body trembled from an extreme rage, his face was red, his large fists were clenched tight, and his eyes were glaring at Sengoku heatedly. In response, Sengoku gritted his teeth. If I were to free Whitey Bay, Marine as the entire organization will lose the trust of the public. 
a worthless organization that backs off the moment they come across a formidable foe. It is an idiotic move to make Sengoku shouted with exhaustion in his eyes, and what a freeing smoker then. It will, without a doubt, cause an uproar from the Celestial Dragons the funding, promised backups for the war, justification of Marine's existence, all will be denied. And what a freeing both, you ask. It will serve as a blatant act of opposing the world government forget freeing both, just one will suffice Sengoku found himself in a ridiculous circumstance, with his hands and feet tied. Within two days, I presume Sengoku weakly said, Whitebeard will get here. At this point before Sengoku could finish his statement, Garp took out a crumbled up paper from his pocket and threw it at Sengoku. Sengoku, frowning in confusion, straightened up the paper before standing up from his seat in shock. Garp Sengoku, with widened eyes, shouted with a reddened face, have you gone insane? The paper was none other than the resignation form, fully filled and signed. Garp, who relaxed his body, now glared at Sengoku coldly. I took a look into this girl named Whitey Bay. Garp opened his mouth, just for being Whitebeard's crew member, she became wanted. And Whitebeard too he clicked his tongue with a frown, has initially become wanted for being a crew member of the Rocks Pirates. In essence, none of them committed a wrong worthy of their bounties. And same with Smoker. Garp, pausing momentarily, lowered his head. Up until the present, Smoker accomplished many deeds. All of them were to Garp's liking, and in his eyes, Smoker hasn't strayed from the path of righteousness. And that meant if a puny reputation is worth the deaths of thousands, and if the wrongly placed bounty is enough to condemn a free individual, then it wasn't Smoker who was in the wrong. No, the Marine, from the very start, was not in the right. Under the name of Justice Garp, Sengoku stated in disbelief trying to shut his friend down, but to no avail. This organization has been nothing but a hypocrite, seeking to please the world government rather than save those in need. Sengoku, losing strength in his body, slumped back into his seat. Garp, turning away without any more word, began walking away. Right when Garp placed his hand on the doorknob, Sengoku muttered, Time. Garp stopped momentarily without turning around. Give me some time to think. Then, Garp opened the door and walked out. In due time, night has arrived. Sengoku, with dark circles under his eyes, gazed at the outside scenery with his hands joined on his back. Rosanate. He couldn't help but think of his adopted son, the marine officer whose whereabouts are currently unknown. If there is one thing that I am still sure of, it's that you are a good man by nature, thought Sengoku, and that man willingly followed Smoker's decisions. Flevance, in the end, was saved from that amber-led syndrome. I, Sengoku, sighed deeply, thinking that he was getting nowhere. Turning away from the outside view, Sengoku reached for the Den Den Mushi and called. The other side immediately accepted it, and said, it was one deep voice belonging to the newly promoted Warden of the Impel Down. Magellan, have yourself prepared, said Sengoku, I'm coming right now. Hey, it was in a gloomy looking bar of unknown location, where only two customers sat by. One among them was an orange haired man dressed finely. Blaze, strange, muttered Blaze as he held a glass of wine in his hand. He swirled the liquid around repeatedly, having his mind filled with nothing but uncertainty. And what may a chief be concerned of this time around, said one beautiful looking blonde woman with blue colored eyes sitting next to him. She casually sipped down a red wine before licking her lips seductively. If you, the one who wasn't worried about Kaidu's strange movement, is now in a state like this, I can't help but be curious. Stussy, Blaze, gazing at her sharply, shifted his eyes back to the wine before opening his mouth. If I were to vote on what's the world's greatest mystery. I will debate between your age and the devil fruits. Chum. The blonde woman's eyes twitched, but she quickly masked her emotion with a smile. Foo 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 now that wasn't nice. But disregarding the first option devil fruits. Blaze, uncaring of the woman's attitude, continued interestingly, some devil fruits are similar in nature. Deducing from many factors, the world classified some as superior to another. Some examples include magma magma fruit and flame flame fruit, ice ice fruit and snow snow fruit, kilo kilo fruit, and ton ton fruit, etc. Blaze clicked his tongue, expressing his irk. Placing the glass down, he leaned back on his seat, but there was one thing common for all of them. A direct superior or not, the abilities provided by each devil fruit never overlapped with one another. 
For the case of kilo kilo fruit and ton ton fruit, even if ton ton fruit allows its user to become much heavier than the user of kilo kilo fruit, the extent of heaviness is measured by the unit of ton. Therefore, the user can't control his or her weight as finely as the user of kilo kilo fruit can. The woman leaned her cheek into her palm with an amused smile. Yes, and... But what of the case of smoke smoke fruit and gas gas fruit? Blaze took in a light breath. Smoke, by literal means, is a part of gas. Gas gas fruit. Did you see from that white hunter? Blaze, raising his hand up and rubbing his forehead, replied thoughtfully. The lingering smokes around the air after that man's fall. They were absorbed into his unconscious form, and miraculously, he somehow healed though to an insignificant extent only. Heal. The woman muttered, is Loja capable of doing that? What I'm currently wondering is, Blaze stated darkly, is smoke smoke fruit a loger even? A sudden and quick fight it was, I thought. Within the darkness, unknown of whether I was conscious or not, unknown of whether my eyes were opened or closed, I gazed at the pitch black and reflected of my clash against the self-proclaimed Piero. That flow, it was more than just the external emission of armament Haki. It had an intent I chuckled lightly, internal destruction. Huh. Of course, I was aware. The knowledge that I managed to accumulate from my past life wasn't for nothing. However, theory isn't enough. Haki was an enigmatic power that I was extremely unfamiliar with, and the fact that one's will can be physically manifested and honed like how the martial artists from the earth do, I couldn't grasp how I was supposed to make my will flow. So I reflected once more. The moment in which I was hit with the six king gun that was combined with the armament haki. Internal destruction I focused on the pain during the strike. The most important aspect of haki is one's desire. What am I willing to do? Where does my faith lie? Back then, that CP0 agent's intent was solely focused on damaging me. In correspondence, his haki moved, blasting through my body and knocking me out from the inside out, just like the black impact of mine. Silently, I try to raise my hand up within the darkness trying to see if I can replicate the concept of armament haki. Internal destruction. Heh, but of course, it was to no avail. Though making haki flow seemed theoretically simple, the idea of imagining Haki as a form of tangible energy was a strenuous and ambiguous task. If only I can experience that technique one more time, I thought to myself. Then I will be able to at the next moment. I found my eyes wide open in the middle of a dark cell. Ha! Huh. All four of my limbs were cuffed. For some reason, I couldn't muster strength in my body, and breathing alone was taxing. From my back, I felt a hard and cold texture, which informed me that I was currently in a lying position. I wandered my eyes around. Metal bars. Are there cells where the individuals with prisoners' uniforms sat, all cuffed? And then, one blue-haired woman, similarly cuffed as I am, on the opposite side of this same cell that I was in. From one glance, I immediately recognized her, Whitey Bay. She, without a doubt, was a member of Whitebeard Pirates who's recently formed her own crew. Said Whitey Bay, upon hearing my remark, opened her eyes and let out a dry smile. So you finally woke up, sleepyhead. Frowning lightly, I quickly assessed my situation, and it didn't take me for long to realize that I was currently locked up in the impel down. Judging by my bounty and the surrounding features, I came to chuckle. I see. This must be the sixth level, still and silent, excluding the plopping noises generated by the droplets of water. The eternal hell or sixth level of the impel down. Seen never changing frozen almost. Some has recently been placed while some lived here for countless years. Though there were drastic difference in for how long they've been in here. One thing was for sure. As time passes by, people will gradually come to forget them. No matter how infamous they used to be, people's attention will shift to the superstars of the new generation. They will rot in this mundane prison for eternity until their death arrives in the name of salvation. And in such a place, Smoker looked relaxed. Eternal. No way out. None of them were of his concern. Actually being refreshed for once after many sleepless nights, he was more energized than ever in this gloomy dungeon that is. So, gazing at the ceiling in a relaxed form though he was fully cuffed he asked Whitey Bay. The woman cuffed right across him. How did you end up here? That's the first thing on your mind. Thought Whitey Bay, unable to believe how uninterested Smoker looked at his current circumstance. Few moments ago, 
He woke up and lazily looked around himself, and instead of lamenting over his imprisonment, decided to ask her such a question. To some extent, Smoker reminded Whitey Bay of Whitebeard himself, the man who sleeps soundly in the middle of the battlefield. Eventually, Whitey Bay responded with a snort, that's what I'd like to ask you. The infamous rookie known as White Hunter or White Snake, assumed by many to be the future Admiral of Marine until his corruption, suddenly ended up here. Don't you find this more ridiculous than my situation? Huh? Smoker's body shook in a silent laughter before he replied, I suppose that you aren't wrong. Logical wise, Smoker's circumstance wasn't good. Having earned the hatred of celestial dragons and world government, the only reason why he was still alive was thanks to the presence of Monkey D. Garp. I simply revealed my fangs far too early, far before I was ready to go. Swallowing the saliva and wetting his dry lips, Smoker continued, I had choices. I could either ignore the injustice in front of me and pretend to be one of their loyal dogs, or to stop said injustice. In a way, it was the question of whether to sacrifice a few for the sake of saving many in return. But hey, isn't it idiotic? Get me involved in your morality shit. Whitey Bay rolled her eyes, to which Smoker laughed in return. She then dropped her head and sighed. Well, at least my part is more straightforward than yours. She said, I'm here because of one betrayer. Betrayer. Smoker found himself interested among your Ice Witch pirates. ECH no, among Whitebeard pirates. What? Not noticing the gleam in Smoker's eyes, Whitey Bay growled. That damn teach calling himself Blackbeard and attacking me in the middle of the party. Gra Smoker opened his mouth, but no word came out. Blinking his eyes, he thought, what the fuck? Is the year 1522? Did I somehow travel 16 years into the future? If only Pops didn't give that accursed dark dark fruit to him. He even has that fruit. Smoker felt a sudden rush of headache. Groaning, he closed his eyes and rolled his brain. Damn it. The question of how doesn't matter. What's important is that acquiring that fruit removes Blackbeard's reason to stay in Whitebeard Pirates. Smoker then came to wonder, but judging by Whitey Bay's nuance of speaking, Blackbeard wasn't perceived as a betrayer before attacking her, and he was personally given the fruit by Whitebeard himself. If I were to put these all together, why did Blackbeard betray in the first place? In the canon, Blackbeard betrayed in order to steal the dark dark fruit from Thatch, one of the Whitebeard pirates. Subsequently, he ran away and built his own crew from scratch. Then, adhering to his plan of trying to become one of the Seven Warlords, by catching a pirate whose bounty amounts to a 100 million bealy or more, he initially chased after Luffy, before changing his target to Whitey Bay Wait. Smoker asked astutely, he caught you alive and handed you over to Marine. Sham PH yes, in exchange for acquiring the title of a warlord. Then the next step of his plan might be. Smoker's eyes widened as he instinctively raised his body up. The cuffs clanged in response, resisting his pull. Coupled with the fact that the cuffs contained sea stones, Smoker helplessly flopped back onto the floor, huffing from the sense of fatigue that overwhelmed him. Watching his abrupt action, Whitey Bay muttered, What's with you all of a sudden? Just then, the walking noises echoed along with the sound of chains clanging against one another. Turning her gaze, Whitey Bay saw multiple jailers coming toward the two of them. Prisoner Smoker, you have a visitor. With a genuine surprise, Whitey Bay asked, H huh? You saw them coming ha huh, Smoker, letting out a sigh, said dryly. Let's go with that. As the cell was opened and the chains were detached from Smoker's sea stone cuffs, many eyes peered onto him. Watching as he was getting pulled out by the prisoners, some whispered angrily, what even is this? A visitor and the impel down. To one placed in here. The lowest floor of all levels. Oh I boom. Then along with a growl. One prisoner slammed the bars. Let me out also and I promise you. That I'll kill every single one of you here as painfully as possible. Smoker came to a stop as the prisoners holding his arms. Ceased their walks. In the front of the group. There stood the newly promoted warden Magellan. Glaring at the mad prisoner in contempt. There were no words of reply. Magellan simply raised his hand up toward the prisoner, and Hydra, in a split second, burst out a deadly wave of poison engulfed the entire cell. Drenched in purple, the screaming prisoner, along with his jail mates, stood with their bloodshot eyes, reflecting the agony they were undergoing through. Egar, W.Y. attack us also with a thud, they helplessly fell. Acting as if he hasn't seen anything, Magellan continued to go his way to which the other jailers naturally followed with Smoker in their hands. 
However, Smoker wasn't paying any attention to the fall of fellow prisoners. Instead, he was looking elsewhere into the dark where one pair of eyes stared back at him. He is then, one jailer's body blocked Smoker's view. Taking his eyes off of that particular direction, Smoker relaxed his body and let himself be guided. Beyond the several layers of metal bars, there was one metallic elevator, large enough to contain multiple at once. Smoker was brought inside this machine after Magellan, and then Magellan stated, clean up the corpses and continue on with your duties. Upon the pull of a lever by Magellan, the elevator door closed and began ascending carrying only Smoker and Magellan. Damn it. Reading the newspaper in her hands, Robin snarled. It was deep into the night, and she was currently wearing a pajama. Below her were many female trainees, those who also were under Zephyr's care at the current moment. Wrinkling up the newspaper in anger, Robin whispered, Becoming wanted and then getting caught, of course you'd act in accordance to your emotion, even if you knew the risks. You've always been like that, smoker. Robin recalled back in the past, that doomsday of Ahara. Even during that day, Smoker saved the demon child, and willingly placed himself in danger simply, because he believed that that was the right thing to do. And then, going as far as fighting the nightmare for something like creating an alibi. He truly was a reckless fellow. But what now? Robin grimaced. How are you going to get out of that prison in the first place? The more that Robin stayed in this organization, the more she realized how corrupt it was. The connection that Marine had with the world government was deep, and instead of righteousness that Smoker valued, only the hypocrisy could be seen in her eyes. Robin closed her eyes and took in a deep breath, calming herself down. Biting on her lips, she mumbled, I have to do something. Smoker was her only hope. He was the only one whom she trusted with her life. If he were to fall, there will be no way to bring down the world government. That despicable organization that not only killed her mother, but also the scholars whom she admired and followed. But how? Thought Robin, what can I do in this situation? Hum. Why aren't you sleeping yet? At the next moment a voice was spoken from Robin's side, causing her to panic. Turning to the direction that the voice came from, Robin was met with the sight of one girl with long and light red colored hair. Kujaku. The metallic noises of gears cranking and skidding entered his ears as they slowly moved up. Not minding them, Smoker looked to the front in silence. Visitor, they say. Smoker couldn't help but think, who can it be? Then, Magellan spoke, we're currently on our way to my office, located on the fourth level, known as the Blazing Hell. As Smoker raised his eyebrow, Magellan continued, I've been following the news regarding you since the start. As the warden of this prison and the worker of the world government, I should treat you the same as any other prisoner. But Magellan stared at Smoker grimly. This time, even I came to question of what truly is the right thing to do. The elevator came to a stop before the door reopened. Beyond the door was the fine-looking office that contains a floor covered by a red carpet, a round table that supported a candle that was lit, and Fleet Admiral. Muttered Smoker is Sengoku, munching away a rice cracker and leaving crumbs all over the table, flinched upon noticing Smoker and Magellan's arrival. Quickly gulping down the entire rice cracker, Sengoku put on the serious face of a Fleet Admiral. You're finally here, Smoker. Ignoring Smoker's dead ban, Sengoku tapped the seat next to him, come take a seat next to me. Processing this sudden development, Smoker slowly turned and looked at Magellan questioningly. Magellan looked back at Smoker with uncertainty on his face, before sighing lightly and speaking to Sengoku, you have one hour, Fleet Admiral. I can't give you more than that. Thank you, Magellan. Guiding Smoker's powerless body, Magellan dropped Smoker on the seat pointed by Sengoku before walking out of the room. So, taking in a deep breath, Sengoku said, shall we talk? Smoker sat still with his eyes squinted in thought. Then, he spoke up, that rice cracker you just ate. Is it from Kukabuka Town? Eh? Seemed like it from what I could tell. Sengoku was left dumbfounded. Can't sleep. Kujaku was a fellow whom Robin met not a long time ago. Intelligent and sensible, she was probably the only one in this training facility, other than Zephyr, whom Robin bothered to actively talk to. So this is why you seemed more tired than the usual recently. Huh, it's none of your concern. Now now, don't say that. Sliding the wrinkled up newspaper out of Robin's hand and unfolding it, Kujaku smiled. Let's see, what may be the cause of our broody girl's worry? Exhibiting annoyance, Robin turned her head away, 
gazing at the moon outside through one window. Ah, about Vice Admiral Smoker's recent arrest. Kujaki spoke softly. Don't call him Vice Admiral here. Robin said in a cold manner. He's no longer a Marine, but an imprisoned criminal. Yes, you're right about that one. Frowning lightly, Kujaku then asked. But what wrong has he done to deserve this treatment? He killed the warlord without a valid reason. Kujaku's gaze turned into a glare. For getting rid of pirates. Yes, he did. With a stoic expression, Robin shifted her eyes at Kujaku. He disobeyed the world government by doing so. Kujaku refuted heatedly. With her previous calmness gone, we aren't the government's dogs. Hey, what's going on? Ugh, so loud having momentarily forgotten the fact that Robin wasn't using the room alone. Kujaku's words managed to wake others up from their slumber. One among them was Ain, one of the trainees who's been staying in this facility for the longest time. Arobi. Kujaku. Standing up, Ain questioned the two in a displeased tone. What are you two doing there? Talking at midnight. Placing her hands on her waist, she awaited the answer from Robin, who stared back at her impassively. In Kujaku, who was sweating in nervousness. And at this time, Robin's brain, quickly processing the current circumstance, reached one conclusion. Kujaki gulped as she spoke up. Ha ha ha, you see, I just got up to go to the washroom. And then I happened to Ain. Don't you think the current marine is rotten? And then Robin dropped the bomb all of a sudden in front of all her peers. How's Rosanante? After waking up from his trance, Sengoku asked in concern. He was fine when I last saw him, stated Smoker. Though I left him with a couple of kids to take care of. But no worries, there also are Aramaki, Gina, and that new dude named Senor Pink to help out. Ha! Huh. Sengoku let out a deep sigh, emotionally driven by the approaching calamity. With a grimace, he then said, Will you tell me what happened since your last departure? Smoker looked at Sengoku in a blank expression, before cracking a small smile. Sure. And so, he did. The abrupt attack from the Martini Pirates. The horrible condition in Flevance, assault of three vice admirals, fight against crocodile after cancer, Mazambia, and strawberries deaths, and the CP0 agent named Pierohi, spoke all of them without leaving anything out. During the entire way, Sungoku listened in silence, with his face gradually darkening as the story continued on. And that pretty much sums it up. Placing his hand over his forehead, Sengoku sighed once more. Just how deep have we fallen? Mumbled Sengoku. With a dark expression, his sunken eyes dazed into the air. What is the Marine's identity? Are we the protectors of justice or the hired workers of the world government? Sengoku then closed his eyes and shook his head. I used to believe that the reason why the world was able to sustain up to this far was thanks to the goodwill behind the world government's actions. Though their orders may be questionable sometimes, I thought that in the end, they will prove the reigning justice I suppose that I was naive. Smoker, not bothering to reply, poured himself a cup of water, for he saw this as a great opportunity to quench his thirst. As Sengoku sighed, Smoker raised the cup up and chugged the water down yesterday. Gup threatened me to free you. He said that if I don't do that, he will quit Marine. Sengoku stated, his act was a wake-up call for me. If even that idiot understands how corrupt the current W what. EFFFF before spraying it all over Sengoku's face, surprised by the fleet admiral's information. Bohahaha. He said that Sengoku, whose entire face became drenched in water and smoker's saliva, sat with his face twitching in anger. You brat W wait, Sengoku-san. I'm still cuffed with these sea stones, you know. M mercy, boom. A few moments later, Smoker was lying on the ground with his face swollen in a comical manner. Clenching his fists tight, the fuming Sengoku clicked his tongue. You even had the same laugh as that gut for Nika's sake. Do I seriously have to deal with two of you now? Well, Smoker spoke through his swollen lips, which, astonishingly, were returning back to normal size at a rapid pace. You shouldn't have made it funny then. I mean, a marine hero quitting marine hair, just think about it. What part of that is funny? It's a serious matter. Sengoku growled while massaging his temple, before taking in a deep breath to calm himself down. Meanwhile, Smoker fully recovered already and sat back up somehow, being able to muster enough strength to move by himself now, even when he's under the effect of sea stones. Now, back to the topic. We don't have much time left. Sengoku said in a serious tone, You must have seen Ice Witch in the same cell as you. Smoker nodded in an equally serious demeanor, 
Knowing that it wasn't the time to joke around, caught and brought in by Blackbeard Marshal D. Teach, she was utilized as the proof that he is fitting for the title of Warlord. Sengoku lifted up his right index and middle finger. With this, Whitebeard now has two reasons to move. One, to rescue Ice Witch, and two, to deal with Blackbeard, who's officially the hired worker of the government. At this rate, the battle against Whitebeard pirates is inevitable, and there's more. Bam! Curling up his hands into a fist and slamming it down on the table. Sengoku gritted his teeth, Kaidu of the beast that warmongering filth he's also begun to move toward here. Ha! Huh. The canon event that he's read through in his previous life flashed through Smoker's vision. The Marineford War, the all-out war between Whitebeard pirates and Marine. Back then, Kaidu also moved doing the same as what he's doing right now. Why wasn't he part of the war again shit? Smoker found his head hurting. Red hair shanks. He hasn't even been seen for quite some time, and I doubt that he's able to match Kaidu in terms of strength right now. Kaidu on top of Whitebeard sounds like an absolute clusterfuck. Sungoku agreed grimly, though, your way of expressing such thought is vulgar indeed. For the past few days, Sengoku's been thinking of ways to minimize the loss. Lives, money, reputation, relationship with the world government he's been thinking of ways to preserve all of them and successfully lead Marine through this adversity. However, he saw no way out. One or the other, some of the said values had to be sacrificed to preserve the others. The burden on his shoulders was surreal and Sengoku came to wonder what he's doing here, showing his concern in front of the 18-year-old. The world government promised support. Troops from various kingdoms and on top of that, Sifopol agents. This is a double-edged sword, for this so-called support also serves as an implication that they've been preparing for this war. But then, Sengoku felt as if he was trapped in the dark, with even his friend, Garp, Acting like he never has before, he didn't know what to follow. For what reason are Marines placing their lives at stake? What is the significance of this upcoming war? Sengoku lamented, is defeating the strongest man in the world a goal? Is luring Kaidu out a goal? Is Whitey Bay truly worth the countless lives? He didn't like it. No, he hated it. In this situation that the Marine was trapped in, he felt that... Are we nothing but the chess pieces for those five elders to use? The world government wasn't treating them as human beings. Smoker, sitting still, didn't bother to say anything in return. He simply waited as Sengoku breathed rapidly after his rant. In a collected state, he observed as Sengoku calmed down and said lazily, Are you dumb? Then, Smoker said something completely out of Sengoku's expectation, release Whitey Bay. Sengoku's eyebrow twitched. Having heard something that should never be spoken by a marine words of releasing a renowned pirate. However, he then realized that there was more for Smoker to say. Elaborate. Smoker, recalling what decision Whitebeard made in regard to Odin's death in Wano, spoke astutely, as far as I can tell, Whitebeard is a sensible person by nature. He knows that going to a war such as this will cost him many lives of his sons and daughters. Rather than revenge, he will pursue peace within his family. If we were to free Whitey Bay, Whitebeard's anger will solely be directed at Blackbeard and the world government who accepted his deal. Sengoku opened his mouth, about to retort. But Smoker then raised his finger up, effectively shutting down the fleet admiral. Ice, which will die, but Whitey Bay will live on. Search for a female prisoner of similar characteristics as Whitey Bay. The appearance doesn't have to be exactly the same, since most didn't even get to see her face to face. In Whitey Bay's stead, said female will be executed. The world government will notice right away. They will. Are you afraid to face them, Fleet Admiral? Sengoku stiffened up, unable to say anything in response. Directing his eyes away from the man, Smoker thought of all that he's gone through up until now. And boy, life was harsh, whether it be the past or the present. Standing in front of many crossroads, he was forced to make decisions just like Sengoku at the current moment. You asked if we are the protectors of justice or the hired workers of the government, if we are the human beings or the simple pawns at their disposal. And you know what? Raising his right hand up, Smoker looked at the sea stone cuff around his wrist. You, the fleet admiral, 
are the one who decides which is the correct answer. Sengoku couldn't help but watch in dumbfounded expression as Smoko relaxed his body and leaned back in his seat. He thought, is this what you meant by the future of Marine, Garp? Hanazumi was old and conservative. Sakazuki was extreme and far too rigid. Borsalino was lazy and self-centric, concerned about his safety only. Coupled with the majority of vice admirals being satisfied with their current way of living, the water named Marine has stopped moving, and the water that sits still eventually rots beyond return. It was the time for the new generation to replace the old. Though the shifts in tide may bring forth an unclear future, if sitting still will result in an inevitable damnation, then it was worth the risk. Then what? Therefore, Sengoku asked hoarsely, after freeing Whitey Bay and executing Ice Witch what happens. Actually, before that, with a victorious grin, Smoker raised up his arms, you replace these with non-sea stone ones. Dark in the night, within the calm polar island, one figure was silently making his or her way to the outskirts of the village to the hidden shore that the villagers didn't bother checking. Busily stepping over the pile of snow, the individual left footprints along the way. Upon reaching the shore, the individual immediately boarded the marine warship that was waiting nearby. With familiarity, the necessary preparations for sailing out were made, such as retracting the anchor, unfolding the sails, and more. Click. But then, a flashlight was suddenly lightened up from the ship, shining onto this individual who was now revealed to be a pink-haired woman, Hina. And the one holding the flashlight was none other than Rosie. Rosinante, who stood on the deck with a smirk. He then nudged his side, told you. Next to Rosinante stood Aramaki who was grinning by. Looking at Hina in amusement, he remarked, Rahahaha. You're just as reckless as Smoker-san. What are you guys doing here? Hina, with a blank face, muttered, Hina confused. Rosinante shrugged, we'd like to ask you the same question. Hina paused momentarily, pursing her lips, she then stuttered. I was just trying not to forget how to operate this ship. What? Aramaki, leaning in with his left ear facing Hina, pretended as if he didn't hear her properly. Did you just say that you wanted to go help Smoker-san alone? Hina was at a loss for words. Slumping in the end, she rolled her eyes and nodded. Rosinante chuckled before turning off the flashlight. You thought it'd be too dangerous to bring us along didn't you? Hina sighed. It's the impelled down that we are talking about. It is very likely that the attempt will fail. No need to follow me to the depth of hell. Aramaki snorted. If anything, it's you who should stay back. You're the weakest among us. What did you just say? Hina growled, to which Aramaki grinned daringly. Am I wrong? Rosinante watched the two's interaction in amazement, wondering how Smoker managed to keep these bulls at bay before. Eventually, Hina was the one to take a step back, Thinking of what may be the best course of action holop, you three until a masculine shout was spoken from some distance away. Flinching in surprise, the three of them turned in the direction of the voice and found Senor Pink standing with Baby Five, X Drake, Law, Monet, and Sugar. Ha! Huh, Hina tired already. Sighing, Hina sat down. Hina thought that she'd be able to leave quietly, but never mind. Hina's underestimated all of you. Um... Well, Rosinante scratched the back of his head, Senor Pink, and those kids weren't really part of our plan. Senor Pink, immediately getting kids on board and coming up himself, crossed his arms while staring Hina, Rosinante, and Aramaki. So you were planning to leave me with these damn kids, didn't you? Well, to bad your secret departure was within my expectation. Law by the side murmured, No, you didn't. I did. Drake eyed Law and snorted, I did before you. What? Stop sprouting lies. Not lying. Monet, standing away from them, deadpanned, why are they fighting about this? Sugar was still asleep, dangling around Senor Pink's arm. Baby Five, on the other hand, seemed nervous, looking around the surrounding with shaky eyes. She's been like this since Smoker's absence. Hina immediately shook her heads, we aren't bringing kids along to the world's worst prison. I agree to you on this one, said Rosinante. Kids. Drake, hearing this, snarled with his fists clenched tightly. I'm not a kid, I'm a soldier capable of fighting Smoker Sand saved my life, and it is only natural that I do the same. Senor Pink grinned in approval. Well said, kid. Now that was pretty hard-boiled. Hard-boiled. Law raised his eyebrow. I think you meant stupid. Drake, glaring at Law, immediately slammed his forehead onto the smaller boy, 
What part of my resolve seemed stupid to you, Mr. Smartus? Law snorted haughtily, unfazed by Drake's threatening demeanor. One's resolve doesn't come for a reason. Resolve because that's what my heart told me to do. Greater than it's something that comes from your heart. My resolve comes from my heart also. Oh, really? I thought that. Before the heated argument between two boys worsened, a hand grabbed Drake by the shoulder and pulled him away from Law. It was Aramaki who finally stepped up with his grin intact. Rahahaha, so in the end all of us had same thoughts. Looking around, he asked, aren't you scared? Everyone simply looked back at him without words. Aramaki shrugged, guess not, A eh? Reaching for the rail, Aramaki's ability manifested. The vines grew toward the back of the ship, and within seconds the plants that reminded everyone of propellers were sitting by. Thens, let's go. All of us to the impel down. Hina, sighing, let Aramaki speak without any interruption. Rosanante rubbed his temples and groaned, but in the end respected Aramaki's decision. It's all or nothing. Either we save Smoker San, or lose all. And this was the event that happened a week before Smoker regained his consciousness. February 9th, 1506, two days passed since Smoker and Sengoku's secret meet. And on this date, the whole world tensed up, instinctively feeling the great calamity that was coming on the way. Whitebeard Edward Newgate, the strongest man in the world. Kaido of the Beast, the strongest creature in the world. From the Marineford, the non-combatants such as Kola were evacuated to Sabaudi Archipelago. Simultaneously, all the available Marines were gathered before being divided into two groups. What's the situation in G1, Admiral Hanazumi? In response to Sengoku's words, the Den Denmushi replied, the secondary group consisting of Admiral Hanazumi, codename Heronazumi Admiral Sakazuki, codename Akainu Admiral Candidate Tensei, codename Kirauma and many more they, were to prevent the Beast Piratus advancement to the Marineford. A good deal of force was sent to Marine Base G1. Some questions Sengoku for this saying that it may be better to deal Whitebeard and Kaidu altogether, but the latter dismissed such opinions. Then, what of the primary group waiting for the Whitebeard pirates? On the plaza of Marineford, here they stood. Admiral Borsalino, codename Kazaru Admiral Candidate Kuzan, codename Akiji Vice Admiral Tsuru, other Vice Admirals, and much more. And what of the troops sent by the world government? The royal guards and infamous warriors from all around gathered. There also were many Sifopole agents in black suit, standing in nervousness of their own. Behind all, there was an execution stand that peaked high. On top of it stood Sengoku and Garp, the two legends of Marine. In the middle of them was a blue-haired woman waiting for her execution to come. She must be the infamous ice which many came to deduce. And secretly, among the platoon soldiers stood one white-haired female marine, standing still with nervousness written on her face. She wetted her dry lips as she recalled the words of the white-haired man, Smoker, back in the impel down. Staring forward and ensuring that she didn't meet anyone in the eye, this woman the true ice which wiped the sweat off of her forehead. Dumb, 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 dumb. The military band beat the drums repeatedly. The horns were blown, adding to the intensity of the atmosphere. One of the royal guards named Igram, sent from Alabaster, remarked as he listened to this sound. I heard that the heartbeat of the well-known sun god commonly known as Nika sounds like that of a drum. Loud and boisterous. It is said to bring forth liberation upon humanity and thus people named it the Drum of Liberation. Alongside Igram stood the other warrior from Alabaster. His name was Chaka, a young man who was recently promoted. Sun God, you say? Chaka said dryly. Myth says that the world contained four distinctive gods, each modulating the domains of sun, rain, forest, and earth. But out of the four, it was only the sun who was recognized, remember, and praised upon is this the reason why our land is full of sand now. Shem HM, Ma 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 Igram, clearing his thought, replied with a chuckle, you think too seriously, Chaka. Just think of it this way. Sun God is the reflection of people's desire, the desire to be free from all burdens. Sounds like an idiotic desire to have. As the two talked among one another, the warrior from another kingdom was found saluting at Vice Admiral Tsuru, 
Greeting the great advisor of Marine, I am T-Bone, the Royal Knight of the Bomben Kingdom. I am honored to contribute to Marine's noble decision of facing the notorious Whitebird Pirates head-on. Suru Sweat dropped, why, aren't you an energetic one? Thank you for the compliment ma'am. And on the other hand, at the edge of the crowded plaza was one man wearing a white suit and mask over his face. The agent of Sifapol Aegis Zero, he raised up his wrist and spoke into the mini Den Den Mushi attached to it. I switch Whitey Bay is currently seen on the execution stand. Everything's been prepared. I'll notify you upon Whitebeard's arrival. But unbeknownst to the agent, Garp was silently gazing at him from afar, frowning and turning to Sengoku. He remarked grimly, can I punch that one? Unfortunately, no. Not yet. Sengoku, staring at the front, replied stoically. Then his eyes narrowed as, here he comes. The execution stand began to tremble ever so slightly enough for Garp and Sengoku to realize. Prepare yourselves then, Kuzan, stepping up and stating firmly, glared at the front. Reflecting his caution, the air around him dropped few degrees. The nearby marines and other warriors shivered. Robin, standing on a marine battleship that's sitting on the sea right outside the marineford, grimaced as the sea churned and the ship shook. Standing with her were Ain, Binz, Shuzo, Kujaku, and the other trainees under Zephyr's command. Watch and learn, said Zephyr, with his arms crossed. This is what it means to be marine to fight, even if your foes are the monsters whom you don't see any chance of winning. Yes, Zephyr Sensei. Ain immediately replied, tightening her grip over her sheathed sword. The pebbles around Marineford's ground bounced up and down. The waves became progressively wilder, and then the enormous tide, so huge that it had the potential of engulfing the entire Marineford, revealed itself. Are you what in the world is this? Ebon, standing nearby Tsuru, expressed his terror as the wave shadowed the marines at the plaza. Similar to him, the others gaped open their jaws wide. Taking a step back in disbelief, Chaka mumbled, Is this something that a human is capable of? Oh how scary at the back, Borsalino exclaimed in a casual manner. The other vice admirals stood with their justice coats draped around their shoulders, looking up at the tide in dark expressions. And up at the execution stand, quite angry, aren't you? Sengoku frowned. Hair. Though the serious gleam remained in his eyes, Garp grinned. Go, Kuzan. As the tide began to drop right onto the Marineford, Kuzan jumped up, heading straight toward the disaster. Extending his hand out, he unleashed his ability, Ice Age. The moisture in the atmosphere condensed into the cold ice. Upon contacting the falling volume of water, the freezing spread at a rapid pace, and within seconds, the entire tidal wave has become a mountain of ice. Who with his breathing quickened from the excessive use of the fruit ability, Kuzan landed back on the ground crack crack. Then, the mountain of ice began to form cracks at its surface. It was an indication that the extreme degree of force was being applied on it. Subsequently, boom. The entirety of ice shattered into countless pieces. And from the beyond, one ship, resembling that of a whale, entered right through. E that's. One marine shouted in horror. I tease the Moby Dick. There stood on the foremost section of the whale-like ship named Moby Dick, one tall and broad man with a wavy blonde hair and a crescent-shaped white mustache. Whitebeard Edward Newgate. With a rage-filled grin on his face, Newgate jumped off the ship, right toward the execution stand. It's been quite a while. Garp and Sengoku Bohahaha. You seem healthy as always, Whitebeard. HMPH, a bad news for us, I suppose. The two legends of Marine jumped up. Garp's cocked back fist blazed up from the emission of the armament haki. On the other hand, Sengoku's body morphed into a gigantic golden Buddha, ready to meet Newgate's descending Najinata. He pops, wait from the above, one of the Whitebeard pirates shouted. We're still within the range control boom. Then, they clashed. An incredible, booming noise occurred. Countless individuals lost their consciousness all of a sudden, dropping to the ground with their mouths foaming. Modi Dick swayed as it slid along the falling pieces of ice. And in the middle of this chaos, those who were able to withstand the vigorous burst of Conqueror's Haki, managed to see the sky, splitting into two. The gusts blew violently. The split open sky revealed a bright sun, one that caused some to cover their eyes from the intensity. Boom, boom. One by one, the chunks of ice crashed onto various parts of Marineford. Shattering into pieces upon the collision, they bounced everywhere in a dangerous manner. Kuzan, standing in seriousness, 
held his hand out, instantly generating a large dome of ice from thin air one, in which the shards attached themselves upon contact. Upon high in the air, the gigantic Moby Dick was falling right onto the Bay of Marineford. Numerous marines and other combatants expressed nervousness as they locked their attention on it. Then, one among them shouted, T there's more to them just as he said, along with multiple splashes and wild waves in the sea, numerous ships revealed themselves from the depth of the water. La 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 where's my booze? I need my booze to fight Bohemian Night Pirates, Thunder Lord Pirates, De Calvin Brothers, Maelstrom Spider Pirates, and more ones that showed themselves in front of Marines and Government Associated Warriors were the infamous pirates of the New World. Splash! And as Moby Dick landed right onto the bay, the water erupted up high. Sitting in front of all those ships, everyone got to understand of what if means to offend the white bid pirates. Right under the sun, the clash seemed to have ended as Newgate's Najinata separated from Garp's fist and Sengoku's palm. His eyes, filled with hard-earned wisdom, swept through the supposed ice which on the execution stand. Tap! While Garp and Sengoku landed back on the execution stand, causing the wooden platform to wobble slightly, Newgate's face revealed that of amusement. As he did so, he was free-falling from the sky, and considering how huge he was in terms of size, of how his height reached over 6 meters, his descending form, to those below, seemed like a human meteorite. Boom. Accelerating beyond imagination, Newgate landed on the plaza in a split second. The nearby ground broke into numerous pieces before blasting upward. The nearby individuals fell to their butts, being unable to maintain their balance on top of the quaking plane. In the middle of this chaos, Newgate's eyes briefly landed on the white-haired woman the true Whitey Bay. She, hiding her delight as much as she could, slowly began to sneak her way around. And just at that moment Kuzan appeared right in front of Newgate, expanding a chilly air around him, and condensing air moisture into lethal lances of ice. Ice block. Partisan Newgate simply grinned as the lances began flying right toward him. Standing with his Najinata held upright, he didn't take any action before or boom. With a swoosh, one blonde man with phoenix-like flame wings was suddenly floating in front of Newgate. The first division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, as well as one of those who are speculated to be the second in command of Whitebeard Pirates. Glaring at Kuzan, this man smirked, haven't you played chess before? You don't attack the king right from the start. Kuzan, narrowing his eyes with a smile of his own, remarked, Marco the Phoenix. The massive volume of blue flames suddenly swelled out of said Marco. Swelling as a whirlpool does, his technique successfully defended against the ice lances of Kuzan. And while all this was happening, Newgate marched forth, ignoring all those whom he considered as peasants. Crack. Crack. Each of his steps amplified the quake of the Marineford once, again reminding everyone why he was hailed as one of the three catastrophes. There was no fight, but the jaw-opening scenery of people abruptly fainting and falling with a thud. From afar, Robin, watching Newgate's march, then realized that she was holding her breath. Her entire body, having grown goosebumps, was sweating profusely. Her face was pale, and her fingers felt cold. Wondering how she managed to maintain her consciousness, she turned and saw Zephyr standing in front of all trainees with his arms crossed. Hair, hey, that white beard. But even Zephyr seemed to be facing some extent of difficulty. As he wiped sweat on his forehead, he hasn't changed not by a single bit. Crack. Let's go, boys Kai Kyakya. Kill them all as pirates swarmed out of their ships with their blades ready to slay. The war has officially come to a start. Clang clang clang. And from afar, one CP0 agent spoke into his mini Den Den Mushy. Whitebeard has shown himself. So it has begun, said one old aged man in a black suit one among the five elders. Currently in the renowned Pangia Castle of the Holy Land Marriageoir. The five elders were gathered in the room full of Den Den Mushes paying attention to various ongoing reports. How's the situation with two warlords, Hawkeye and Blackbird? What of the impel down then? The voice quickly informed one of the five elders, dressed up in white garments and characterized by round glasses, bald hair, and a sheathed katana nearby him, stated in a stern manner, you heard that? Yes, my lord. Yes, my lord. Up high in the impel down, one mysterious man with the clown's mask, 
white hat, white suit, and white cloak around his shoulders Piero of the CP0, was found standing on one hot balloon-like transport. With his hand raised up, he was currently speaking into his mini Den Den Mushy. Then, I shall start the operation. Gazing down, Piero watched as the forms of guards of the Impel Down suddenly became stiff, before they began walking away in a robotic manner. Another CP0 agent behind him then said, All clear. Without any hesitation, Piero jumped, falling straight down from the sky. It seemed as if the man was going to crash right onto the ground before he held his hand out at it. Open. Surprisingly, a large-sized zipper was formed right on top of the ground, and as if it was a jacket, unzipped open revealing the floor right underneath. And that wasn't the end. The floor underneath, then underneath of that as if generating a tunnel. The zippers subsequently appeared on the floor beneath, and opened wide all the way to the sixth level of the impel down, the eternal hell. Swoosh. As Piero dropped through the holes, the zippers above him closed immediately. It was one swift and efficient entry into the world's worst prison. One that would have caused the staff of the said facility to exhibit disbelief. Tap. And as the man landed lightly on the bottommost floor, and the zipper on the ceiling zipped close, he was standing right in the middle. Upright and confident, he looked around at numerous cells that contained noteworthy pirates. And at one shadowy area, his eyes narrowed as they sighted one familiar-faced individual, fully cuffed on all four limbs. Splash. Splash. With casual yet refined steps, Piero began walking at his destination. As he walked, the target's features. Long and messy white hair reaching all the way to shoulder, hazel-colored eyes, and muscular feature, all of them became apparent. So we meet again, smoker. Piero stated impassively. Have you been enjoying your stay in our number one hotel? Ha! Huh. Smoker, ignoring Piero's words, chuckled. What was that just now? Zipper. As in, one that's the part of a jacket. Piero stood still, unbothered by Smoker's words. Wahahaha Smoker then laughed, being unable to hold it in upon getting to know the truth. The so-called Piero of CP0. A mere jester for the Celestial Dragons, turns out to be the former Admiral of Marine. In one organization, he was sitting at the apex. But in another, he was nothing but a clown, a lowly being who existed only to give laughter out of the nobles. Smoker laughed, laughed so much that the tears came out of his eyes. However, it wasn't one filled with amusement only. No, rather than amusement, he found the rage filling up in his heart. Why, I'm glad that you found it funny. Piero, all blaze, bowed elegantly. But you must know also, of what it means to learn my identity behind the mask of a clown. Then, Blaze snapped his fingers. Onto the metal bars of various cells, multiple zippers were formed before opening up by themselves. Just like that, many holes were generated in cells housing prisoners. Ch hey. Then, one criminal exclaimed in confusion, as the chains locking him down, were cut by the same zippers. And his body suddenly stood up on its own. W what's going on Gar? Why is my body moving on its own? Who ugh? Who do you think I am? I am the great one by one. The prisoners moved out of their cells stiffly. With red faces. They tried their best to resist. But to no avail. Their body moved regardless of their will. As if they were being hijacked and controlled. Blaze, staring at Smoker through his mask. Stood with his hands held together on his back. The prisoners, one by one, slowly walked towards Smoker's cell. One that was also ripped open by Blaze's ability. Jacket! Huh! Smoker muttered keenly, you aren't controlling their bodies, but rather, the garments on them. Blaze's eyes flashed coldly. Does it matter if you know or not? Deadman speaks no words, I believe that this is the phrase that fits right in your case. Bohahaha! Smoker laughed, exhibiting no fear. It seems that even your death is a form of entertainment for you. Raising his eyebrow, Blaze briefly wondered if Smoker has some hidden scheme. But in the end, he deduced that such would be impossible, for the Cipherpole agents had been watching him for days, ensuring that he came in contact with no one. Now, let's see. Blaze, rubbing his chin, hummed, the cause of your death shall be being pummeled by the prisoners who were accidentally freed by a novice staff. Multiple prisoners, right in front of Smoker now, raised their fists up. You've been quite a trouble for us, but it's all over now. Farewell, White Snake, are you filming, Jion? Blaze stopped as Smoker suddenly spoke up. Jion, that name, Blaze remembered hearing some time ago in Marineford's restaurant. With an impending chill down his spine, 
he turned his head to where Smoker was staring at the exact same place. That Whitey Bay used to be cuffed until three days ago. Yes, and the feminine voice replied with her words trembling in anger. Yes, everything's been filmed well. One woman, whose hair was currently dyed purple, was holding onto a visual den den mushy named Kimeko. Brought in two days ago as part of the group of criminals that included the Cipherpole agents, she was supposed to be Rumblebus. The Manhunter one whom Vice Admiral Kuzan managed to catch all of a sudden, his mini Den Den Mushy cried. With a frown behind the mask, Blaze picked it up, boom. Just then, the prisoners under Blaze's control were suddenly blasted back, and from beyond, Smoker slowly stood up, easily cracking open the cuffs with his hands. Blaze stood still for a few moments, processing the current situation. Then, still in a daze, he ended the call. Slowly reaching for his mask, he came to laugh in a silent manner. After a long silence, he finally said, Amazing. Blaze clapped. You've outplayed me, White Snake. In trapping me in this snake pit of yours, I'm proud of you as a fellow snake. But then, raising his arms up in a questioning manner, Blaze stated, But does this change anything? Regardless, you're a criminal one who not only broke the laws set by the world government, but also designed this pompous plan of revealing the ends of the Impel down. In the end, all that you succeeded in doing so is to publicize your execution. Why? You seem confident. Smoko grinned as he walked out of the cell, in the middle of the war. CP0 Agent 1 called Chief by another reveals himself in the depth of Impel down to secretly kill one former Marine Ha. I won't be the judge. Turning to the Den Den Mushy held by Jion. Smoker stated, decide by yourselves of who's in the right. Smoker. In the crowded Sabaudi archipelago, Cola, standing among the strangers, whispered with her eyes widened. The other two, momentarily forgetting that the horrifying wars were ongoing in Marineford and G1, gazed at the screen in front of them with vivid confusion. Currently, the whole world was witnessing the clash of two snakes in the deepest hell of the world. Dark and gloomy. Humid and unpleasant, I felt the eyes of the world's forgotten criminals peering onto me with variety of emotions. Are you excited, amused, surprised by this event that suddenly occurred in the most still and unchanging part of the world? In front of me stood the tall and fit man in white suit. Covered by the mask and a white hat atop his orange-colored hair, his overall appearance spoke elegance in my perspective. Piero the chief of CP0 or the former Admiral Cedar Hebby. Blaze. That was his name. And standing in opposition to him was my filthy self with messy hair and prisoner's garment. On that night, I predicted that the world government will attempt to assassinate me. Coupled with this anomaly named Marshall D. Teach, doing nothing would have meant the inevitable doom for not only me but also those close to me and there was no way I was going to tolerate that. It wasn't of my expectation for Piero to show up, and it certainly wasn't for this man to be turned out as the former Marine Admiral. In addition, being a man who defeated me and locked me up in here, it was evident that the fight wasn't going to be an easy one. What exactly is justice to you? Adjusting his hat, my foe then asked. What drove you to this extent, revealing this hidden floor of the Impel down? The criminals forgotten are now revealed to the public once more. The world governments paid so much effort to erase them from the people's mind. And look how you made it futile. How long has it been? For how long has it been since I arrived this world? For how long has it been since I began my career as a Marine? For how long has it been since I was branded a traitor and was chased after? So many things happened since. I not only advanced all the way from the bottom to the night top in Marine, but defeated many pirates who would have inflicted greater wrongs in the future. I was reckless while doing so, and ended up in here fated to rot until death. Justice. Huh. The world was watching. I found a cold sweat running on my back. But hey, this nervousness was an emotion that I welcomed wholeheartedly. Though speaking my true self in front of the world government wasn't an easy thing to do, my heart told me that this was the right thing to do. It is bold of you to assume that justice, that hypocritical and malleable concept, is the source of my motivation. Tapping my finger against my temple, I said, justice is the means of manipulation under the disguise of education. Well, government justifies the recruitment of marines by saying that marines' utmost priority is to protect the civilians. But the underlying purpose of them is to be the government-affiliated soldiers, ready to carry out any order given like mindless dogs. I crackled in hilarity, 
The root of the amber lead syndrome that I encountered in Flevance lied in the world government's greed, thirsting after the mineral that had no use other than the cosmetic aspect. In order to hide your exploits, your loyal dog named Martini Hook was sent after me only for the result to be the opposite of your expectation. Ha! Huh. Blaze, raising his hands up for a questioning gesture, snorted at that, the civilians aren't easy to fool, dear criminal. Sprout those conspiracy theories as many times as you want, but all you're doing is to waste your energy. Like I said, I said it's up to them to decide who's in the right. Bar bump. Can I win? At the final moment, a voice in my mind whispered. In response, I talked to myself. It isn't the matter of whether I can or not. Rather, I must do it. Swoosh. Subsequently, both of us vanished at speed beyond an average folk's imagination. Boom. My outstretched fist was knocked back against the sharp and clean burst of Haki from Blaze's palm. Though my hand shed blood from the impact, I resumed my charge at Blaze with the strongest grin I could muster. Remember that feeling. The flow soft yet strong. The internal destruction. Clang. Blaze's extended index finger met my own. Shigen. Rylatachi. Lash Shigen. White Gun. Boom. Yet another collision between the still emission and the refined internal destruction. My attack was once again unable to match the vigor behind Blaze's attack, and found my whole body pushed back this time around. Hair. But I snorted it off as my feet landed right on the hard wall of stone. Blaze then vanished once more, before suddenly appearing right above me. His leg was about to slam onto my neck. But I immediately morphed my neck into white smoke, generating a gap for Blazer's leg to pass right through. I subsequently rotated his body. White blow. Lash overcoat. Boom. Blazer's cloak suddenly hardened with the use of armament haki, and effectively blocked my strike. In this state, I asked casually, So, where's my shusui? Blaze snorted, must I answer that? Wahaha. No, we simultaneously vanished before clashing fist to fist. Blaze immediately blasted the flowing armament haki, turned internal destruction out onto his fist. But I, having predicted this not by observation haki, but his intuition alone retracted my fist and used said pull back as a momentum to swiftly turn. As I did so, my left hand was holding onto one swirling mass of white smoke, white ball. Leaving my hand, the swirling ball flew at the man in white suit. He, watching such, commented truthfully speaking, it baffles me, his haki emitting fist suddenly extended out its index finger, right onto my approaching technique. How are you planning to match me? Boom. The powerful Shigen from Blaze's finger penetrated right through the white ball. Said white ball, losing the momentum upon the blow and dispersing all across the environment rendered the scenery more hazy to view. Then, the ground below me suddenly morphed into the snakes of delicately folded jackets. In an instant, they coiled around my legs tight. In both the aspects of armament haki and observation haki, you fall short against me. In addition, my mastery over the devil fruit much surpasses you. I gazed at the jacket snakes impassively, not feeling any threat in regard to it. Shifting my eyes up at Blaze, I watched the man shrug. The last time also you weren't capable of putting enough resistance even. Even in terms of our past ranks in Marine, I stood at the position of Admiral while you were merely that of a vice admiral. From my dark surroundings, more jacket snakes arose from the hard floor. Utilizing the awakened ability of his jacket jacket fruit without any sign of exhaustion, an admiral was an admiral indeed. Then, those slithery jacket snakes launched themselves at me simultaneously with malicious intents. With two of them still around my legs, I was facing the literal definition of snake pit. In this state, I grinned and returned Blaze's gaze with my own. I said, are you done hissing? The dispersed smoke all around, which contributed to the haziness of the air, wriggled. As the freshly generated smoke came in contact with them, the snakes of white smoke came into the existence, before coiling around the approaching jacket snakes. Transmutation. Black Blaze's eyes narrowed, and I extorted my will onto the smoke, Hydra. Boom. The gloomy and dark level brightly lightened up as the snakes of white smoke abruptly turned black before exploding magnificently. All the present snakes faded away as the room returned to that of a darkness. And, with a dash so fast that the normal pair of eyes can't follow, Blaze appeared right in front of me. Swoosh. Rankyaku, followed by a Shigen, along with the irregular movement achieved by the mix of Sorrow and Geppo. Blaze launched flurry of attacks at me, Smokey. 
and I countered with the gaseous movements that appeared ghastly in the eyes of spectators. My body unnaturally morphed back and forth between physical form and smoke form, and the gusts generated by Blaze's attacks was suitable enough for my body to be pushed back prior to being hit. How creative, said Blaze, before his eyes revealed a red gleam. My body suddenly lost its balance as the ground below me churned, having morphed into a rough fabric. Although I quickly adjusted my form by morphing my body into smoke, the careless elementalization in front of well-trained Haki user simply meant greater hitbox for him. Tap. Blaze's fists came in direct contact to my smoke state chest. Jion, whose hands held onto the Den Den Mushi firmly, felt her hair standing up from the intensity. As I was exposed for Blaze's incoming attack, she instinctively shouted, Smoke a Rikuigan. Golden roll. Boom. The extremely condensed blast of Haki blasted through my chest. I felt as if my heart stopped for a second, and a trail of blood slipped out of my mouth from the injury. In proximity with my back, there was a wall paved from the force generated by Blaze's sudden technique. Jion watched in a crestfallen expression, understanding just how powerful Blaze's technique just now was. Who my body took few steps back to prevent itself from falling. It wobbled, and I released a deep breath full of smoke, having attained a substantial degree of injury from the former's attack just now. Blaze silently observed my state, and my eyes were in a daze, looking up at the dark ceiling. Dusting off his hands and closing his eyes, he stated, it's over. My eyes quivered, staring into the darkness. I wasn't in a state to hear anything around me. Flow, move my eyes slowly widened in wonder, I can feel it. Before my body fell, the left foot firmly tapped against the ground and prevented such. Raising my body back up from the falling position, lowering my view, and locking eyes onto Blaze. I came to grin in delight though I was painted with my own blood. What? Blaze's eyes opened and revealed a puzzled gleam, surprised by the blazing will within me. Contrary to the last time where I fainted, I currently stood with a newly attained insight. Swoo and at the same time, the smoke began to swirl on top of my right palm. White for the first time, the stationary armament Haki began to move actively mixing with the swirling smoke. Holding this cluster of chaos, I confidently dashed at Blaze, with disregard for pains that coursed all around my body. Flow, Blaze, not having expected my aggression, quickly dashed back boom. Ash only to be struck right on the face by my technique. From the blow, the elegant looking fellow was drilled into one wall, and his clown's mask was completely shattered, revealing his pain-filled expression to the world. Jion released a breath she didn't know she was holding. Huff huff bohahaha laughing wildly. I cracked my bloody knuckles. Get up, you piece of trash. Blaze, slowly raising his hand up, touched his face. Instead of the cool sensation of mask, there was a soft skin. Looking down at still shocked Blaze, I said, what do you mean it's over? We're just getting started. E1. C erupted from the cannonballs and other robust blasts. Marines and pirates clashed out in the water, breaking ships, slashing, shooting using all means to win the war. The sky was filled with meteors of magma, and the sea itself was boiling from the impact of them. The situation in this place was by no means in order. Were Aurororo and under the meteorites, there was one gigantic azure dragon, whose voice echoed throughout the entire area as he freely swam in this chaos. Kaidu of the Beast the user of Fish Fish Fruit model. Azure Dragon. He was the force to be reckoned with and Admiral Hanazumi, currently facing off this catastrophe with his sword, found himself shocked by how strong the former has managed to become. So long it has been, old fart Kaidu, instantly morphing into his human dragon hybrid form, slammed his spiky kanabo named Hasekai at Hanazumi's sword, Uom. And with the thundering noise, the Admiral was sent crashing onto one marine ship. A-R, I it's hot many marines cried as the ship explode, and they, having fallen, were directly exposed to the boiling water. But you've grown so much weaker, Damn it, ignoring said marines, Kaidu roared at Hanazumi. You should have retired, so that I could have fought someone stronger. Hanazumi, frowning in a sense of humiliation, stood up from a wooden plank, and held his sword upright. Though his breathing was quicker than the normal state, he seemed woundless mostly, having managed to block Kaidu's attacks skillfully. A Admiral Heronazumi won marine in the boiling water, then asked out of desperation, P please, help swoosh only for his head to be cut by Hanazumi's merciless slash. Looking at the headless corpse, the Admiral remarked, 
There is no place for a dead weight in this war. ESSS the other marines in the sea, who were slowly being cooked to death, expressed despair from the admiral's words. From on the deck of one marine warship, another admiral, Sakazuki Orokainu, deeply frowned as he heatedly glared at Kaido unbothered by how his fellow marines were dying from the boiling hot sea created by his fruit ability. ECH Mythical Zone Devil Fruit. Ha thought Sakazuki, ones considered as the rarest and strongest type even among the rarely seen devil fruits of the sea. Kaido not only mastered this fruit in variety of ways, but also possessed the incredible mastery over Haki his eyes sharpened, we must somehow drag him down into the sea. That's the most thorough way to immobilize that filth. Clang, right below, on one of the beast pirate's ships, the well-known swordsman, Hawk I Dracul Mihik, was found clashing his tall, black sword against the dinosaur-like man's metallic arm. Queen the Plague Mihik said with distaste, what a pity. I was looking forward to fighting that swordsman one of yours instead him. Perhaps I should fight that marine admiral instead at this point. What? said Queen roared in rage. Are you saying that I'm weaker than that stupid King Swoosh? Hey, a snot dropped from Queen's nose as a thin gash appeared on the surface of his metallic arm. Mihik retracted his black sword euro back and exclaimed with his eyebrow raised, Oh, it didn't cut through. I you queen cried in disbelief, H how come this is happening? It's literally my newly developed Q metal that we're talking about here Mihik, not answering queen. Smiled in a newfound interest, now this is quite worthwhile. From afar, there stood one obese and hairy man, with black cloak and black captain's hat, he, Marshal D. Teach the Blackbeard, stood proudly while crushing the enemies under his hands ones, that emanated ominous wisps of pure darkness. Hey Keck, this has been completely out of my expectations. Turning and stoically gazing at the red line, that was barely viewable by sight, Teach muttered, placing me in here to deal with Kaidu instead of in Marineford to serve as a bait for Whitebeard pirates. This isn't the Sengoku that I knew of. After a sigh of disappointment, he chuckled. Well then, it seems that I won't get to confirm if that Caesar's poison I injected during my final visit was successful. The battlefield was filled with booming noises and screams of pain. Magma ended up crashing onto some marine ships, setting them on fire, as the result for Sakazuki placed more care in killing the beast pirates than preserving the marines' lives as many as possible. Coming to grin in the end, Teach said, Zehahaha, I hope that you die as fast as possible, Pops. In the fourth level of the Impel Down, the thunderous noises repeatedly boomed across one after the other. Judging by the horrendous stench that was foul, bitter, and simply unpleasant, there was no doubt that the Warden of the Impel Down, Magellan, was having yet another diarrhea. The doorway to Magellan's office was unlocked and opened. Numerous jailers made their way in it, hoping that he'd get out of the washroom and resolve this situation. Egar Warden, we're in an emergency right now. Things are happening in literally the hidden level, and it's being broadcast all across the world. We need you right now, so hurry up please, one jailer pleaded while holding down his nose. However, B-R-R-G-H... The only response from Magellan was to release the gas that swept across all the awaiting Impel Down staff. Unable to handle the stress, few fell unconscious, and the others swayed, unable to remain sane in front of a horrible smell. Hu hu. And in this situation, there stood one jailer. Lowering his eyes, he looked at the keys hanged around one fallen jailer's waist. Now, I used to romanticize the thought of working here because I believed that I would be granted a right to kill any criminal as I saw fit. Then he frowned, but such authority was granted to the head warden only. A disgrace really, for I can see that I won't be becoming one for a while with you sitting on that seat, Magellan. Withstanding the foul stench that emanated all around in Magellan's office, the man continued walking. At the end of his walk, there was one set of keys. I imagine myself working here for years. The result of such simulation was that I'll probably go crazy, filled with nothing but boredom. And while worrying about my future, here came the opportunity. Taking the hold of keys, the man smiled. I heard that a Cipher agent is authorized to kill without consequences. And a one below there, fighting against a criminal, is the chief of CP0 himself. So, if I successfully help him in suppressing the criminal, won't I be able to get what I want? Staring down at one unconscious jailer, his eyes flashed in lust. His hand slowly reached for a sword sheathed around his waist. 
but he managed to restrain his vulgar temptation, stopping his hand from unsheathing it. Chuckling, he walked out of the room, while saying, it was nice working under you for a month that is, Magellan. He was Shiyu, a no-name swordsman. And while all this was happening, Magellan had no way of knowing, for he was occupied with a stomachache worse than ever. Getting started, you say. From the dark, the man in a white suit stood back up, holding a stoic expression along with cold eyes that exhibited a cold gleam. He, Blaze, gazed at the one named Smoker, standing across him. Getting started. Getting started, hum. Letting out a sigh of exasperation, Blaze exclaimed, I don't understand the logic behind your words. Disregarding that his face was now shown all around the world, Blaze leaned down and picked up the white hat that he previously wore. It seemed torn and ripped, and its clean and mesmerizing quality could no longer be seen. Looking at it in disdain, Blaze eventually threw it away. Did you, perhaps, think that a small improvement in your battle prowess will make a difference in the outcome? Smoko watched as the entire surroundings began to churn. From the walls, non-sea stone cells, cuffs, and all that were registered as non-living objects, the jacket snakes arose. Countless in number, they crawled across the ground and slowly moved towards Smoker just like how a snake approaches its prey. In this dark environment full of snakes, Blazer's eyes glowed dangerously, seemingly red in color. He then stated, one second after, you would leap at me. Smoker, about to dash at Blaze, stopped on the spot, with his eyes narrowed. Even his observation harky. Blaze chuckled. Oh, the future changed just now. Swoo at the next moment, snakes simultaneously flew at Smoker like a tidal wave. It was frightening and to some extent ominous. The unveiled scenery was something that even Gion and multiple prisoners of level 6 were unable to maintain their calm for. Shifting his eyes all around him in a quick moment, Smoker reacted immediately, white blast. A vigorous blast of white smoke dispersed upon smashing into the approaching wave of jacket snakes. Dashing back, transmutation. Black Smoker controlled said white smoke through a wisp of smoke connected between it and his arm. Black spark. Boom. An abrupt explosions occurred all over the approaching jacket snakes. Many of them burst and loosened back to the stones and other objects that they once used to be. A few of them were set on fire, which quickly spread over the fabric made snakes. Blaze, watching Smoker's retaliation, stated, If I were to mention, the jacket on fire is still a jacket nonetheless. Upon the man in white suit's finger snap, the burning wave of jacket snakes spun like a vortex, as they resumed their travel towards Smoker. And though you may be immune to smoke, fire is a different story, isn't it? Boom boom boom. Multitudes of snakes crashed from left and right like a rain of fire. Brightening up the dark and gloomy floor in a horrifying crimson, the incoming snakes and spreading fires made Smoker far too occupied in simply evading all of them. Boom. Shift to the left, morph into the smoke to swiftly fly through the deadly snakes. And clang. Few snakes among countless were imbued by the armament Haki. Blaze, taking extra care in controlling those, utilized his observation Haki. Future sight to its full extent. Smoker, being unable to dodge them, was forced to apply his newly attained armament Haki. Internal destruction to effectively repel them away from him. Boom. And finally, as the final jacket snake missed and crashed onto the ground next to him, the entire level 6 was now filled with cracks and damages all around. Few cells were rendered broken by Blaze's technique, but surprisingly, none of the freed ones dared to exit their cells, knowing that there was no way for them to survive against someone of Blaze's caliber. Smoker, however, was found sweating ever so slightly. After all, Though he's taken a substantial degree of damage from Rakuigan, Golden Roar last time around, his durability and stamina were on the level of absurdness all, thanks to Garp's training and various experiences of his. Good. And upon observing Smoker's tenacity, Blaze with cold eyes opened his mouth. It would be far too anticlimactic for this to be the end of you. He then raised his arms up. In correspondence, the walls, cells they began to morph into another batch of countless jacket snakes. Let's dance for a little longer. Smoker grimaced upon coming across such a scene. Gion, on the other hand, no. Wei murmured with a pale expression flabbergasted by how strong Blaze was. Then, as Smoker's hair stood up instinctively warning him for the incoming attack he dashed back, boom boom boom. Just in time before the multiple jacket snakes slammed right on the ground he was standing by. Subsequently, quickly raising his left arm, boom, Smoker blocks an incoming Shigan from Blaze. 
Blaze's armament Haki attempted to flow into Smoker, dealing internal damage. But Smoker's own retaliated with its own flow outward boom. Ash and simultaneously, Smoker was struck on the back by the jacket snakes, which piled up on one another to form a hammer-like shape. Also imbued by the armament Haki, Smoker was sent flying toward one set of metal bars ones, that was partially made out of sea stone. White clone, poof. Right at the last moment before he came in contact with it, Smoker formed a As the clone dispelled, he morphed his body into smoke and flew upward, successfully preventing the collision with the sea stone bars. Cess SS the jacket snakes, pursuing him tenaciously, instantly circled around him in an attempt to entrap him. In response, Smoker swept his right arm in a circular motion, black impact. Boom. A vigorous blast of black smoke was released all around Smoker. Converged with the flow of armament Haki, the black smoke directly pierced into the jacket snakes and blasted them from the inside. Swoosh. But then, Blaze suddenly found right in front of Smoker as the ruined jackets fell to the floor and morphed back to the stones that they used to be, held his hand out right at Smoker's chest. As Smoker's eyes widened from the sudden attack, conspicuous suppression. Blaze's hand, zipping open into numerous pieces of a jacket, swiftly surrounded Smoker and hardened with the imbuement of armament Haki. ECH. Smoker immediately acted, white male. Boom. The thick layer of white smoke quickly surrounded Smoker's body. And just as the jacket strips gripped onto Smoker's form, he hardened said layer of white smoke with the utilization of armament Haki. But regardless of his technique, Smoker was now fully caught by Blaze's jacket turned hand checkmate. And in this state, Blaze coldly stated, Rakuagan, Serpent's Damnation, Boom. Smoker, even after having blocked Blaze's technique with his utmost capability of fruity ability and armament Haki, received an incredible surge of pain coursing throughout his body. The Haki on white smoke retracted, and the smoke itself dispersed, away revealing the body covered by the blood from head to toe. Thud. As Blaze dropped him, Smoker flopped to the ground with his mouth agape, and the blood oozed out of him, painting the floor red. Huff huff Smoker, at the shortness of breath, watched as Blaze turned away from him. And that's the end of the story. This time around even someone of your tenacity won't be capable of getting back up. Blaze, certain that Smoker won't be standing back up this time around, muttered, die a slow death, dear pompous criminal. Currently, Blaze's eyes were headed at the Den Den Mushy holding Jion. Smoker saw this through his hazy vision, and gritted his teeth, ignoring his body screaming and trying to stand back up. Did you enjoy the show? Unfortunately, it's over now. And Rear Admiral Jion for your act of treachery. You will be considered a criminal of equal standing as White Hunter Smoker. Blaze, with his eyes glowing in deep red, took a step at Jion, with the intention to cut the Den Den Mushy's signal. He, initially taking a step, then began walking with a sense of elegance. As per the treatment, you'll be executed on the spot. His footstep stopped. With eyes shaking, Blaze stood still. Though he didn't see by sight, he felt the still blazing Haki one that was somehow stronger than before. In a deep frown, he turned around. Plop, plop. The blood dripped out of his body like a mild rain. But nonetheless, Smoker was found standing for another time with his grin still intact. What in the world? Blaze, whispering in vexation, stomped his foot on the ground. The waves of jacket snakes rose for the third time, and they slowly crawled at Smoker who seemed nearly dead at this point. Why aren't you staying down? With genuine curiosity, Blaze asked, why choose a hard path of getting back up when you can have a painless death by staying down? Flabbergasted, he then mumbled, no. Before that, why did you even bother to risk your life for this show? By the broadcast, what else do you attain other than the chance of convincing the public? Snake? This animal was probably the one that best resembled the man named Blaze. And right now, he was unable to comprehend the fellow snake named Smoker. If you've been freed secretly, you could have attempted an escape like Golden Lion once did. Instead of wasting your energy on something as useless as this, you could have been more efficient. Ha, huh? what am I saying? Blaze laughed. Saha ha. -ha. Just die. Then, all jacket snakes simultaneously flew right onto the standing form of Smoker in an instant at a speed that raised Goosebumps out of Jion. And in this circumstance, Smoker spoke through his tired breaths. 
That chance half is worth much more than you think. Since the very start, the world government was the one in the wrong at least in Smoker's opinion. The deaths of his friends, in the end, were essentially caused by the world government's decisions. Who Smoker, then closing his eyes and ignoring the incoming jacket snakes, said, Joan, brace yourself. Blaze raised an eyebrow at that, wondering what Smoker had in his mind. Then, he flinched upon seeing the split second into the future blackout. Boom. The entire floor shook from the impact as the tremendous volume of black smoke was expelled out of Smoker's body at the next moment. Covering up the entire room and exploding in a disastrous manner, Joan quickly lowered her body to the ground, unable to breathe properly in this environment of smoke. Then, the air suddenly returned back to her as the blazing smoke suddenly rushed out of her. Additionally, the screams of agony resounded, as the scorching smoke entered through the lungs of prisoners burning them from the inside. Scarily, even their screams were muffled in this thick layer of smoke, and in the end, they were burned to death before dying by suffocation. Even Blaze, caught off guard by Smoker's terrifying technique, found his partially burned skin tingling in pain. Though he quickly encased his entire body in armament haki, a mission to repel all the smoke, his white cloak and pants, have long been burnt, reducing his overall exquisiteness. And then, there was another problem. With smoke dominating the entire floor, and the majority of oxygen having been utilized for the combustion of the black smoke previously, the air has become scarce. Blaze found his breathing quickened, trying to inhale the small wisp of air that remained around him. He cough, cough k kek. There's no way ha that I'm dying here from suffocation clang. Clang. L let me out. The still and silent prisoners acted in desperation, knowing that their lives were at stake now. ECP-01 among them cried. Kill White Hunter Blaze's face darkened. Lowering his head in this situation, his body shook in a silent rage, embarrassed by the fact that this scene was currently being broadcasted live. Raising his hand up, he then clenched it into a fist, and simultaneously, a huge zipper was formed on the ceiling and was zipped open. A cold air from the fifth level blew in, and the good amount of hot smoke was expelled out. Just then, someone jumped into said zipper formed hole from the fifth level causing Blaze to narrow his eyes. Huff huff. Meanwhile, from some distance away, Smoker huffed heavily while genuflecting to support his weight. Internal destruction. Flow. Smoke smoke fruit. Flow gas. Joan, watching Smoker worriedly, opened her mouth as if about to speaking something. However, before she could say so, she had to dash forth in a panic with Den Den Mushy sitting on her previous spot clang. In order to block one incoming sword right at Smoker's exposed neck. Oh, who are you? Jion growled, pushing the mysterious foe's sword away from Smoker and herself. Blaze too stared at the sudden intruder, and said intruder bowed at Blaze. Former Admiral Blaze or CP0 Chief Piero, whatever you may prefer. He raised his head up, showing his eyes beneath the jailer's cap on his head. I am Shiyu, the aspiring candidate for the position of a Sifopole agent. Smoker's half-lidded eyes headed at the man, filled with a glimpse filled with many emotions. Shiyu of the rain. Ha! Huh. Blaze initially revealed a puzzled expression. Then, he eventually came to laugh out of amusement. Sahahaha. Shiyu, smiling shrewdly, asked, well, then Blaze's laugh abruptly stopped. In a cold expression, he ordered, if you manage to destroy that Den Den Mushi, then I may consider, Roger, that chief, Jion, smoker, at the same time, whispered, can you stop him? But, we have to keep the elders' attention diverted, and lower the chance of their potential involvement to Marineford. The call is yet to come, right? Yes, but still Jion. Jion, Gritting her teeth, looked at Smoker in nothing but a worry, before eventually dashing back. You better not die. Smoker smiled softly, of course. Clang. Oh, Joan and Shiyu clashed their blades against each other, generating a metallic noise that seemed fresh in his mind. Taking in a deep breather, Smoker lifted his body back up from the genuflecting position. Flow. Smoke. Wiping the blood from the corner of his mouth, Smoker stared at Blaze in seriousness. If facing you at my current maximum isn't enough, then I'll simply go beyond. Broom, the ground nearby cracked and trembled from the sudden intensity on the atmosphere. The Conqueror's Haki. It corresponded to Smoker's blazing heart. The will that has been trained and honed through countless experiences up until the present. Same A Kaiken. 
The dispersed smoke, all of a sudden, began to swirl back into Smoker's body. Then, they were expelled back out like how a steam locomotive does. ESSS, steampunk, steampunk. It was an idea that Smoker came up with within a short period of time, as well as the next step of same Kaiken. Ghost body. ESSSS dilated blood vessels, along with the shift of muscles such that they were placed closer to one another. And most importantly, the blood ones that oozed out of Smoker's body, slowly morphed into a gaseous form, and re-entered Smoker's body. ESSSS. That's right, the back and forth movement of concentrated smoke in Smoker's body its purpose was to amplify the strength of Smoker's heart, one that will be handling the relatively lighter smoke blood instead of the usual liquid blood it's been working with. In contrast to Ghost Body where his innards were entirely morphed into gas, Steampunk focused on the gas transformation of blood only. Bar Bump said gaseous blood delivered oxygen throughout the body at a phenomenal speed at least a hundred times faster than before. The faster delivery of oxygen not only meant greater stamina and heightened overall physical capability, but also intensified senses. Bar Bump Smoker, with his long white hair floating due to the pressure of air and smoke continuously expelled out of him, locked his eyes onto Blaze's own, who seemed to have gotten cautious. His hazel-colored eyes brimmed with life even after taking multiple critical hits. And currently, within his sight, numerous jacket snakes were approaching at a speed notably slower than before. But it wasn't that they've gotten slower. Smoker simply became faster by a lot, that is, sorrow. Swoosh. Blaze stiffened with his eyes exhibiting a red gleam, and Smoker simultaneously moved. Through his advanced observation haki, he saw a glimpse into the future, and managed to see. Habuom. Smoker's fist landing straight onto his face. Swoosh. And subsequently, Smoker weaved through the incredible number of jacket snakes at once. Blaze's eyes, as he quickly readjusted his position while wiping the blood under his nose, shifted left and right quickly, continuously looking into the future. Clang. Blaze then grimaced as Smoker's kick came from the side. By stomping his foot on the floor and raising a wall made out of jacket, he barely managed to block said attack. Black impact. Ash before Smoker released a potent blast of black smoke that penetrated right through the jacket wall. Boom. Losing his calm due to this unexpected power up from Smoker, Blaze gritted his teeth in frustration. How come? Future Sight granted him a vast amount of information. By literal means, it showed him what will happen in the future, and allowed him to prepare for it. However, such information meant nothing in front of Smoker's unbelievably potent strength and speed. Swoosh. And there it was yet again. Smoker, standing in front of Blaze all of a sudden, was holding onto a swirling ball of black smoke. Behind him, the countless jacket snakes were found ripped, burning, and morphed back to stones and rubbles. Without a doubt, this was the future that I saw. Blaze thought with his eyes trembling in disbelief. But I don't have the ability to change it. A ball of black smoke then slammed onto Blaze's exposed chest. Black flow. Boom. Blaze was drilled back, his back driving through several stone walls that constituted multiple cells around. For the first time after the fight, he coughed blood out, indicating the internal damage from Smoker's technique. And finally, Blaze crashed onto the exterior wall that seemed not too far away from crumbling down. And his flight ended with the rise of the dust cloud. Huff huff. Meanwhile, Smoker was breathing heavily with sunken eyes. It was evident that same Akaiken. Steampunk was inducing extreme stress on his already injured body. How much time do I have? Briefly looking to the side where Joan was battling Shiyu, Smoker raised his body back up with all his strength. In his ears, he heard the time ticking. And he was aware that once he stops moving, all will be over. Swoosh. Therefore, he, without thinking any further, dashed into the cloud of dust using everything that he had to take down the monster ahead of him. Marineford, filled with those hailed as the best fighters of the world, was currently experiencing the might of the world's legends. Whitebeard, also known as Edward Newgate. His Najinata was clashing against the haki imbued fist of the grinning man of grey-coloured hair and similarly grey-coloured beard. Monkey D got the marine hero, Brujom. Thud. Left and right, marines, pirates, and government-affiliated combatants fell abruptly, unable to withstand the might of conquerors. Their hollowed eyes stared into the thin air as Newgate and Gart consecutively exchanged blows ones that strangely didn't touch. From the sheer impact alone, 
The ground underneath the fallen body's tremor though it was unknown if this tremor was the effect of Newgate's tremor tremor fruit. Huff huff w what in the world? Sweating from head to toe, T-Bone struggled to keep his body upright. His sword was embedded on floor, serving as a cane that upheld his weight. We'll simply be a nuisance to Gup San if we were to stay close to them. One vice admiral with black mohic hair atop his mostly bald head, named Momonga, bit his lips to inflict pain on himself. Without said twinge of pain, it was impossible to maintain sanity in this mouth-agaping situation. Boom. Abruptly, Newgate stabbed his Najinata named Nurakumajiri one of the infamous 12 supreme grade swords on the ground. As Garp halted his fist and raised his eyebrow questioningly, Newgate looked up at the execution stand. The blue-haired woman, tied up, was found unconscious along with the guards who were supposed to execute her minutes ago. Gararara, I don't have time to waste with you. Garp. Grinning, Newgate then clenched his right hand tight, before slowly readying it for a punch. Wahahaha, so you're finally done playing around, huh, Whitebird? Garp's eyes widened along with his grin, showcasing how excited he was. The gusts of air wildly blew out of him as the armament harky. Emission on his hand expanded and accelerated to an extent where others didn't think it'd be possible. The two of them then jumped at each other, all of Yu Goku shouted in an authoritative tone, Take cover, hypocenter attack, lash galaxy impact. Two fists, without directly touching one another, generated an incredible ripple across the entire sky. The black lightning sparked and crackled, showcasing what it meant for the marine hero and the world's strongest to clash against each other. The collision between two powerhouses the Marineford couldn't handle it. The wind stormed by, pushing everyone away from the eye of the storm. The buildings shattered, the fallen ones were sent into the air, and the ground beneath broke into several pieces. Marines, pirates, or others their identities, didn't matter in front of the inexplicable catastrophe, and they had to exert all their focus on surviving this situation. Sungoku, quickly transforming into his Buddha form, descended the collapsing execution platform with two unconscious guards in his arms. And the unconscious Whitey Bay on the other hand freely fell into the cloud of dust. At the eye of the storm, the surrounding sound became muted for a brief moment due to the chaos all around. During this time, Newgate spoke, what are you marines thinking even? Gerarara, this is unlike what I've seen from you folks for years. Hey, if you're talking about that ice witch of yours, Garp snorted, thank my apprentice for that. If not for him, she would have been killed a long time ago. Apprentice, Newgate's eyes narrowed. That white snake brat. Garp grinned, who else can it be? Boom. As the clash ended, two men were blasted back from one another. While Newgate was blasted into a crumbled down building, Garp was flown all the way out into the sea, causing the water to erupt all the way up to the high sky. And then, a silence momentarily engulfed the entire Marineford, before one person muttered, Where is Whitey Bay? Multiple quickly flinched in realization, coming to learn that Whitey Bay was lost into during the disastrous clash. Yamakaji? One of the vice admirals immediately shouted in panic, Do not let the ice witch go into the hands of Whitebeard if necessary. You're permitted to execute her on the spot. Another vice admiral, named Doberman, stated, Whoever kills her, the reward will be hefty. The ambitious marines and other warriors, those who managed to survive through Newgate's conquerors, Haki immediately acted, jumping into the cloud of dust giddily. Out of panic, members of the Whitebeard pirates shouted, They are about to kill Whitey Bay. Stop them meanwhile. Newgate stood back up from the rubbles with a grin. His eyes briefly headed to the back, where the white-haired woman in Marine's uniform dove into the bay. Gerarara finding amusement, Newgate then watched Boom. As Marco, with a groan, crashed right onto the ground on his left with a few burns across his body due to Borsalino's attacks. Ugg huffing, Marco stood back up. In a hurry to prevent the death of Whitey Bay, he desperately opened his flame wings once more, about to fly Marco. The Phoenix Man stopped as his captain called him. Newgate, grinning at his son, said, we're retreating. Shh, ha, what do you mean by that, Pops? Whitey Bay's Marco, crying in disbelief, stopped in the midst of his sentence. Looking at Newgate's confidence-filled visage, he was rendered confused. As the noises of guns, metallic clanging sounds, and screams were heard from all around, Marco stood still, processing what Newgate just said. Then his eyes widened. Turning around, he shouted loudly, Whitebird pirates all of you. Jozu, the man of burly physique, raised his eyebrow at Marco's sudden yell. 
as he blocked another attack from Kuzan with ease. What's with you, Akiji? Shozu muttered. I was looking forward to facing the Marines burning ice. But you, we're retreating, what the fuck? Shozu hurriedly turned his head to Marco who was seen nearby Newgate who was on one knee. Redirecting his head to the cloud of dust, he saw numerous Marines and other combatants breaking their formation and running into it like madmen. Shozu's face turned pale, before his eyes turned bloodshot in a rage. Why? Retreat. Who said that we'd let you do so? Then, Kuzan let out a chilly breath as his right hand gripped onto a sharp sword made out of ice. Ice saber clang. A sword suddenly found its way onto Kuzan's ice saber. Landing in front of Day's Jozu, Vista the man with a fine-looking moustache spoke solemnly. You heard that, Jozu. We're pulling back. We haven't even got her back yet, Jozu growled. What do you mean pull back? Did Pops lose his mind? With keen eyes, Vista leaned in at Jozu and whispered, because she's already with us. Jozu frowned in yet another confusion, wondering what Vista was speaking of. But nonetheless, Jozu then grabbed Vista by the hem of the his shirt and pulled him back, clang clang, preventing Kuzan's ice shards from attacking Vista with his diamond turned arms. I saw that coming. Vista mumbled. Yes, obviously. Splash. Right at that moment, the stationary Moby Dick was back to its operation, turning its huge body around in an instant, and generating a wave that splashed onto the plaza close to the bay. Many Whitebeard pirates who were on the ship shouted, Let's go, everyone some seemed confused, and some seemed angered. Many Whitebeard pirates questioned Newgate's decision, but regardless boarded for now, thinking that they'll get to hear the explanation later on, huh? Ash and then they found, Newgate huffing heavily all of a sudden his hand clasped over his blood-spilling mouth. E pops your acting, right? Marco, paling up from the sudden sign of sickness from Newgate, whispered. How? Is the situation in Sabaudi Archipelago, currently in Pangia Castle of Marriageoa. The five elders were overseeing the multiple collisions at Marineford G1 and impelled down simultaneously. Five elders, standing with well-hidden nervousness, exhibited darkened visages. The call was cut, and walking back and forth, they spoke among themselves, Smoker. Managed to free himself, meaning that cuffs weren't seastone. With Rear Admiral Joan present to broadcast our plan it is evident that someone in Marine decided to side with him. We can't ignore the possibility of there being a betrayer among the staff of the Impelled Down. Though situation seems to have gotten strange, Piero will defeat Smoker with no problem. What must be worried about is the situation after. Judging by how Sabaudi Archipelago refuses to comply, it is evident that the impact of that criminal has been much more severe than what we anticipated. However, the biggest issue is Garp. The purpose of this plan, in the first place, was to assassinate Smoker without Garp's notice. Now that the whole world knows. Once the war is over, a voice was spoken from different Den Den Mushi, earning all five men's attention. Yes, speak, already. And that wasn't the end as another Den Den Mushi rang even before the call with the other ended. Feeling a headache coursing through his brain, the elders picked up the call. What? The elders looked at each other puzzled by these abrupt changes. The overall situation has left their hands and was turning into something completely unpredictable. Huff huff why are you attacking us? Standing on a sinking ship were multiple Cipherpole agents bleeding to death. They, lying with helplessness, said to their foes ones with blue skins and jagged teeth, fish men. We've seen what's going on in Sabaudi Archipelago. One among them spoke up, crossing his arms as he stood on top of one wooden piece. That used to be the part of the sinking ship. Our benefactor has been locked up for a ridiculous reason. And yet, he managed to devise a plan to expose the world government's cruelty to the entire world. With a firm expression, this fish man barks, such man cannot be forgotten. If now isn't the time for this rotten world to change, then when will it be? This fish man, characterized by a round body and features that resembled a whale shark, glared at the CP agents, I, Jin, and the man who knows honor, and we, the whole fishman race knows that scums like you can't be allowed to reach the Sabaudi Archipelago. ECH. At the back, another one with sore-like nose wrinkled up his face, expressing his disdain in words spoken by the whale shark fish man. You're ridiculous as always, Jin, though I do like the idea of killing all humans here. E please TTT the world government will kill us if you continue to do this raising his hands up. 
One Marine officer cried in a tear-filled tone. He was the Commodore Barricade, and currently, on his neck was a gigantic blade held by the huge man of jagged red hair, Bastille. I don't care, Dara. A.R. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, Park. Knocking Barricade unconscious with the hilt of his great sword, Bastille gazed outside through the window, where everyone was watching the huge screen that showed the situation in the impel down. Slamming his bandage-covered fist on a nearby table, Bastille's face held that of frustration and helplessness. Smoker. Bastille stared at the white-haired man on the screen, overwhelming the angered man of orange hair, Blaze. But in his eyes, Smoker seemed at his last breath, huffing rapidly with his body shaking in exhaustion. This is all that I can do, Dara. Along with Joan, he received the top secret information regarding Smoker's plan from the fleet admiral himself. Acting as if his wounds didn't heal to an adequate amount, he joined the group of people who evacuated to Sabadi Archipelago and hijacked the screen present in Grove 33 the Sabadi Park. Right now, Bastille felt powerless. He wished to go to the Impel Down and aid his friend, but he knew that in that circumstance, he'd only be a deadweight. Having the whole world witness the true face of the hypocritical world government was the only thing that the current Bastille could help in. But still Bastille wistfully thought, I don't want to lose you like Dalmatian, Masterson, and Cancer. Me? Hina, Dol, Ain, Bins, Shuzo, all of us believe that you'd be the one to lead us in the future, to truly show what it means to be a Marine Dara. Watching the bloody showdown between Smoker and Blaze, Bastille hoped, so don't you dare die on us Dara. E1. As of the current time, its glorious features were no more. Ruined and shattered from the intense battle against the Beast Pirates, the Marine's infamous base was rendered into a disastrous mess. That without a doubt, will take a long period of time to restore. You've given us quite a ruckus, Kaido. And in this state, Sakazuki coldly stated with sharp eyes, uncaring of the blood that flowed down from his forehead. Ha! Gritting his teeth, Sakazuki adjusted his still intact cap. He then muttered, but so what? So what if there's been quite a good deal of losses for us? What we started here, we will complete thoroughly. Hanazumi, a fellow admiral, was found standing aside from Sakazuki, with evident signs of injuries throughout his body. He repeatedly bumped his arched back as he held his sword embedded on the ground like a cane. HNG, I've grown far too old for this. Kaido, can't you go a little easier here? In the surrounding sea, corpses, ruins of ships, and more all of them were scattered around. Many were in need of help, and if they were taken to care just in time, recovery would be possible. However, the two admirals firmly held onto the belief that all is for the greater good, and that their sacrifices will be worthwhile in capturing one of the three catastrophes of the new world. But, the one standing in front of them was none other than Kaido of the Beast himself. There was no guarantee that this monster will fall by the hands of Sakazuki and Hanazumi, for the title of strongest creature in the world wasn't for nothing. Wurororo, with a burst of boisterous laughter, Kaido, uncaring of numerous gashes, bruises, burns, and all sorts of damages present on him, grinned in pure excitement. He barked at the two, now this is getting fun. Swinging his spiky club, Haseikai, Kaido's body slowly inflated into an even bigger form, along with the appearance of azure colored scales all over his skin. His teeth sharpened, and now standing in the hybrid form of fish fish fruit model. Azure dragon, Kaido readied for yet another clash against two admirals of marine. Noticing Kaido's upcoming attack, two admirals raised their caution, K. Kaido San dash into one of his own, called him from the back, with a sense of urgency. Kaido, whose grin died down in annoyance, turned his head around with a murderous gaze in his eyes. They seem to be speaking, that if the reason he's been called isn't plausible enough, there will be consequences for interrupting his fun. We got a contact from King San and Nigashima, it's currently under attack, and, unfazed by the news, Kaido growled in a rage, What's the need for us to be worried when King himself is defending it? They aren't just one. Gig Mom and Golden Lion, they've invaded us simultaneously. Kaido's eyes widened in shock. Simultaneously, Sakazuki and Hanazumi too flinched, having eavesdropped the information that appeared detrimental for the Beast Pirates. What? Watching Kaido's outburst from far back, Sehahaha, it seems that they've finally begun. Teach laughed as he sat on a ruined section of G1, enjoying a bottle of rum in the middle of the battlefield. The cannonballs endlessly flew back and forth, the cries and roars from marines and pirates relentlessly boomed forth, 
and the induced destructions generated dark smoke that levitated up high and covered up the sun. To teach, such a scenery was akin to a side dish that added a flavor his alcohol. Begun. Mihik, who was sitting nearby teach with his legs and arms crossed, raised his eyebrow. He casually lifted up an empty stone cup supposedly carved by his skilled swordsmanship, and teach, chuckling in amusement, poured some of the rum into it. Why, are you interested in joining me? Hawkeye, chugging down the rum, Teach subsequently turned to look at the Queen, the obese man with a huge bleeding gash across his chest. Currently, said man, having a huge gash across his chest, was being carried by the goons of Beast Pirates. You seem to have gotten bored of your toy quite quickly. Who knows? Zehahaha, perhaps I can provide you a fun more intense than this. HMPH, Mehek snorted, keep your schemes to yourself. The only idea that I once has been interested in was to fight Golden Lion. But a man without three limbs is akin to a lion who's lost its fangs. Zehahaha, come whenever you feel like. There's always a spot for strong ones like you. A chance. Meanwhile, Sakazuki locked his eyes on the distracted Kaidu who was in a deep frown, seemingly in contemplation. Briefly shifting his gaze to the right, he saw Hanazumi nodding slightly. ESSS Sakazuki's right fist emanated a scorching hot magma that bubbled in a dangerous manner. Just by the existence of it, the nearby surrounding rapidly heated up causing many marines and pirates nearby to move away from the scorching air. Hanazumi took in a deep breath of said hot air and held his sword horizontally. With his eyes closed, he encased the blade in a fine armament haki. A mission ready to resume the battle against Kaidu. Kaidu's goon, witnessing the admiral's sudden burst of strength, opened his mouth trying to warn Kaidu Buom. Ash, however, it was far too late by then. The magma splattered all around, boiling up the ocean and melting down the solid objects it landed onto. Sakazuki's fist was found struck right onto Kaidu's scale-covered chest, and Hanazumi's blade also was embedded right by Kaidu's side. K. Kaidu San the goon screamed in horror, completely overwhelmed by the sheer pressure generated by the Admiral's attacks. Damn it. And surprisingly, Kaidu didn't even express an ounce of pain. Still engaged in a thought, he cursed, fucking old bastards. So you want my road poneglyph, don't you? Then, raising his hand up and swatting away the handful of blood that fell from his lips, Kaidu sighed in genuine disappointment before saying in a low tone, disregarding the attacks done onto him. We're retreating. Hum, Hanazumi and Sakazuki attempted to pull their sword and fist back out, but to no avail. Kaidu's bleeding and wounded body had a hard grip over them, and in this point-blank distance, Kaidu raised his Hasekai up. EAZZZ the terrifying jolt of electrical conqueror Haki. Infusion one that sent shivers down into the spines of two admirals burst into existence. My apologies, growled Kaidu. Unfortunately, there is no more time for me to enjoy the fight against you two. Unconsciously, Sakazuki and Hanazumi gazed at the Hasekai above them with shaky eyes and cold sweat, knowing full well that it was too late to dodge. Sakazuki, instinctively, tried to blast the magma out throughout his entire body. However, conquered three worlds, Hasekai was faster. Ragnaraku, Ujum. Chase, after them don't let a single one escape. One vice admiral, named Lakrox, yelled at his lungs, engulfed by the complacency that the marine successfully drove away the Whitebeard pirates. Out in the sea, the suddenly sick Whitebeard was found in his Moby Dick, along with the rest of his crew. Moby Dick itself was followed by multiple pirate ships, belonging to the subordinate crews of the Whitebeard pirates. Marine warships, the ones that have been surrounding the Marineford, immediately sailed forth, chasing after the pirates and bombarding cannons one after the other. Boom, boom, boom. In the plaza, quite a few government-affiliated soldiers were found celebrating, laughing in a crazed manner as one among them held onto the decapitated head of the supposed Whitey Bay. Ha 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 reward. Where's my reward, Marine? From one warship that remained instead of chasing one where Zephyr and his trainees boarded stared at the speaker of vulgar words in dislike, especially Robin. Something feels off. There simply was no way that Whitebeard would have thrown away his crew member like that. Robin, narrowing her eyes in suspicion, whispered, 
but his demeanor back then, he seemed confident. Whitey Bay previously locked up in the impelled down Robin, quickly ran her brain. And the only conclusion she could reach was, she's alive. Marines shivered as they cautiously stared at the retreating Whitebeard fleet, unable to let their guards down. After witnessing Whitebeard at his full might, in this situation, Suru turned at Sengoku, seemingly with a stern expression. Sengoku, in a seriousness of his own, turned to Garp who stood by his side. Garp, in a stern expression that's unlike his usual grinning self, looked at the horizon where the Whitebeard pirates were sailing away. Sengoku, he then chuckled slightly. What we are about to do now it will change the world. Indeed, Sengoku found a weak smile on his own face also. Turning to look at where Garp's eyes were headed at, he whispered, Perhaps, I was aware of the world government's true self from the start. But for the sake of peace, I turned a blind eye to their acts. He raised up his trembling hand, letting out a breath. Sengoku stared at it, being reminded of what it meant to be nervous. Is this the right time to act? It isn't a matter of time, Sengoku. Garp replied. In his view, there stood the white-haired teenager, one who taught him what the Marine is truly capable of. We'll never find the right time. We'll never be ready. From the start, it was the question of whether we can muster enough courage or not. Courage it is. Huh. Closing his eyes, Sengoku erased all thoughts that brought him to nervousness. For a brief moment, he stood still like this, no longer speaking anything. Subsequently, one by one, people began to turn and look at him. It was the conqueror's haki, revealing itself from the depth of Sengoku's heart. Yes, he too had the quality of a supreme king after all. I have something to say to all of you. Halt the chase. Slowly, Sengoku lifted up the baby Den Den Mushu, one that served as a voice amplifying speaker. Now isn't the time to chase after the Whitebird pirates. The marines murmured among themselves, confused by the serious demeanor of Sengoku. Approximately two hours ago, in the midst of war, I received a signal from Rear Admiral Jion who was given a top secret mission on the lowest floor of the Impel Down. Mission. One marine let out a dumbfounded remark supposedly filled with exhaustion. Proko a variant of Den Den Mushi. That project signals from Kameko. Just now, Sura handed it to Sengoku and Sengoku placed it atop one broken piece of stone. Upon pressing a button on it, the viewable screen sprang forth, displaying the ongoing battle between Smoker, the former Vice Admiral, and Blaze, the former Admiral somewhere in the impelled down that the majority didn't recognize. W what is this? Kujaku? Standing nearby Robin, widened her eyes in shock. Currently, this scenery is being broadcasted live in Sabaudi Archipelago. From that place, the Kamekos held by many individuals are indirectly streaming this situation throughout the entire world. Sengoku stated solemnly, former Admiral Blaze was revealed to be the chief of CP0, Piero. He secretly infiltrated the hidden level of the Impel Down, the place where the former Vice Admiral Smoker was locked up for the supposed sin of defeating pirates. Supposed. Vice Admiral Yamakar narrowed his eyes at this, finding Sengoku's wording zirking. And then, Sengoku dropped a bomb. Said pirate, Martini Hook, was revealed to be a slave, branded with the hoof of the Soaring Dragon, long before his rise to the title of Warlord. His path supposedly overlapped with former Vice Admiral Smoker during his sail to the Fleevance who's in the wrong here. Or, Zephyr, taking his sunglasses off, said with a cold sweat, Are you for real? Sengoku, Fleet Admiral himself, siding with one whom the government branded as a criminal. What is justice? For whom does the Marine exist? Sengoku cried, letting everything out of his mind. Is it to protect the suffering innocents from the pirates who trample upon their daily lives? Or is it to serve as the mundane workers hired by the government and engage ourselves in a hypocritic notion that we're in the right simply because a name is Marine? The outsiders T-Bone, Igarum, Chaka, and more they watched this sudden development with a rising nervousness, feeling that the situation was taking a strange turn. Among Marine, few nodded, fully agreeing with the Sengoku's words. Some grimaced, feeling conflicted. Many expressed fear afraid of earning the world government's hostility. They glared at Sengoku, wondering if he's gone insane. Decide for yourself of what truly is justice on Sengoku's right and left stood Garp and Tsuru. Though they didn't speak a word, everyone recognized that they were with Sengoku. The legendary trio of Marine decided to oppose the world government. Smoker is fighting that man. 
the same one who locked him up in that prison. Without a doubt, he was sent by the government to assassinate Smoker, while the attention was diverted to the war against Whitebeard. Robin said in a shaky tone, having finally reached the truth, so that's why they decided to take Whitey Bay in. As Kujaku stood still, dazed, Robin quickly turned and looked at everyone on the ship. The trainees they all gulped as they looked back at her, but eventually gave a firm nod. Vice Admiral Smoker is in the right, muttered Kujaku. Ain, in nervousness, asked Zephyr. What do you think of this, Zephyr Sensei? Brazen, reckless, headstrong. Zephyr commented, there's no way the idea came from Sengoku alone. He then paused. In his mind, the images of his passed away family came up. His wife used to say, eh, Zephyr found himself grinning. That slithery white snake. How did he even manage to coax that uptight Sengoku? Then, turning and facing the trainees who were staring at him, Zephyr ordered, turn the ship around. We're going to head to the Impel Down and rescue Smoker. Robin found herself unable to conceal her rising smile. Zephyr crossed his arms and said, any objections? No, sir. Boom. Left and right, along with the wisps of white smoke, Blaze was being bombarded by the consecutive repeats of punches, kicks, and a variety of techniques of smoker, all enhanced by the application of the armament haki, internal destruction, ECH. And it was evident that Blaze was struggling against Smoker, much to many shock. Huff Huff Smoker's breathing, however, was notably heavy, and his lungs were burning from the piling up exhaustion. It was evident that he was on his last strand of stamina. Boom. Will Blaze go down before Smoker runs out of energy? Or will the former persist until the latter's fall? Such was the world's question, spoken in a mix of curiosity and anticipation. But regardless of the result, one thing was clear. The end of this battle was near. Smoker. Into the Tarai current, a huge spiral ocean current that flows between the world government's three major facilities. Marineford impelled down, and Eni's lobby numerous marine ships entered. Standing atop one ship was Garp with his arms crossed. In the past, I came to resign. After learning the true face of the world government, I concluded that an incomplete peace under the oppression of the government's tyranny was better than a world full of war and chaos. He's been through the deaths of many comrades. He's been through many sufferings, but was able to come on top of them only thanks to his belief in the justice. And then, that fateful day in the God Valley, Gup saw the celestial dragons torturing other humans whom they considered slaves. Upon the arrival of the calamity named Roxdi, Zebek, they immediately revealed that of a fear, before ordering him to fight the pirates and get them out of there. During that day, he chose the fake peace and complied with their orders. After the event passed by, he wondered over and over, up until the present, if he should have left them to die. He thought back then, justice, in a way, was the ideological manifestation of the fake peace. Gart believed that this is who he'll be until his death before Smoker came into the picture, that is. Smoker the fellow whom Garp has no idea where he came from completely shattered his reluctant belief. Although young and weak, Garp knew from the start that something was different about him. That white-haired kid, his eyes brimmed full of dream unlike his withered self. Smoker, gazing at the sky where the mesmerizing clouds brought forth a pleasant rain, said back then, perhaps it was from that moment, that Garp's heart began beating once again finding hope in the future of the Marine. Hair. Back in the present, Garp grinned as he gazed ahead at the Gate of Justice. That was barely visible by sight. What will happen here from now on, Smoker? Sungoku, Suru, Zephyr, other Vice Admirals, Marine Officers, Marine Platoon Soldiers, and many more all of them were heading to the Impel Down. Some may be favorable to Smoker, while some may contain ill intents, along with a notion that Smoker is just a criminal. In this situation, Gup could tell one thing. Through this uproaring event in the Impel Down today, the so-called fake peace of the world will start to crumble. Petty. Trivial. Worthless. Such were the thoughts that Blaze initially held in regards to Smoker. Best then brother, watch out. That man something is different about him. Greater than the warning from his younger brother, Bayard, was perceived as insignificant by Blaze. Blaze snorted back then. However, in contrast to his confidence back then, Boom. He was currently in the process of receiving Smoker's fist right onto his cheek. ECH. Blaze, with his back sitting on one vertical plane with evident cracks, wiped a trail of blood that ran down from the corner of his lips. Clicking his tongue, he narrowed his eyes ones that continued to process the information acquired from Observation Haki. 
future sight. Left, pushing his feet against the wall behind him. Blaze motioned his arms forth, causing the said wall to morph into jackets, piled up against one another, and surround his sight's tap. Dash and then, Blaze was once again filled in disbelief as Smoker was already past the jacket wall, placing his palm on the former's exposed chest. Huff, 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 although huffing rapidly to the extent that he was practically gasping for air, Smoker's eyes didn't lose the light in them. Black Impact the penetrating black smoke produced a synergistic effect with Armament Haki. Internal destruction. Breaking through Blaze's Armament Haki and reaching his inside boom. Blaze's eyes became bloodshot as the blood dripped out of his parted lips. And that was just the beginning, with Blaze's defense having completely gone down by said strike. Boom. Black blow. Boom. Black ball. Boom. Black flow, black snake, black gun, smoker punched, kicked, blasted, and bombarded Blaze with all techniques that he was capable of not, giving his foe any time to retaliate. His gaseous blood circulated around his body at an unbelievable speed, and his heart continued beating at a speed that resembled a steam engine. Huff, 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 utilizing Geppo to quickly propel himself further up, smoker flew right at the airborne Blaze above, with his right fist cocked back. Blaze, with his eyes narrowed grimly in the midst of pain coursing throughout his body, immediately covered up the entirety of his body in the thick layer of armament haki. Emission, Smoker, noticing Blaze's quick guard, sent forth a powerful uppercut. Boom. The fist didn't touch. Instead, the wave of black smoke mixed with armament haki. Internal destruction blasted right onto Blaze's form, struggling to break Blaze's thick armor. He gurg. Blaze, unconsciously wincing with the veins popping out of his forehead, prevented the technique from penetrating through his innards with all his might. As a result, he was pushed upward before being slammed right at the ceiling of the current level. Boom. Tap. Landing back on the ground of the sixth level, Smoker halved with the evaporating wisps of sweat all over his body. His body trembled in stress, telling him to stop this self-destructive technique right now. However, simply grinning and raising his head back up, Smoker refused. Cough, huff, huff on the other hand, Blaze's head spun, bringing an extreme degree of dizziness onto him. His body was sweating all over, his orange hair was burned and disheveled, and his exquisite white attire was utterly ruined into filthy-looking rags. Calm down. In this state, biting his lips and angrily wiping the blood off of it, Blaze clenched his hands tight. Calm down. Blaze, momentarily closing his eyes, took in a deep breath. Who then, as he reopened them, he muttered, is... That it, Smoker. Letting out a dull expression, Blaze remarked. Does this change anything? Does this ensure your victory? A temporary means of attaining a physical capacity beyond limit. It's akin to a double-edged sword. One that does more damage to yourself than your foe. Blaze, with his eyes flashing in a cold rage, growled in a low tone. In the end, you still are nothing but a worthless worm to me. Smoker. Holding his chest, thought 30 seconds. Either I win before then, or die trying. Wahaha, weak laughter exited through his huffing lungs. Smoker then propelled himself upward, at Blaze who was still stuck at the ceiling. Ha! Huh. Upon Blaze's will, the entire ceiling that he was stuck onto began to wriggle, transforming into a pile of jackets over a thousand in the count. Subsequently, millions of thin jacket snakes stretched out of said jacket wall in a frightening manner, Swarming downward at Blaze's front where Smoker was found with a dangerously swelling ball of white smoke on his left palm. Boom. As the white smoke and jacket snakes clashed, the zipper formed on the jacket wall right behind Blaze's back and sipped open. From the pressure generated by the clash, Blaze was propelled upward into the cold environment of the fifth level. Swoosh. Smoker, not wasting any time, utilized Geppo to propel himself up in midair and accelerated his speed by morphing his legs into the pressure producing white smoke. Simultaneously, Blaze motioned his arms in wide arcs, causing the entire fifth level to instantly morph into layers of jackets. That rushed in, and surrounded Smoker's flying form, narrowing his eyes, boom boom boom. Smoker didn't hesitate and sent his punch to the numerous jacket layers. Accompanied by the mix of his steampunk dash enhanced physique, Soru, in Geppo, Smoker weaved through the countless jacket snakes, punching and kicking at an instance where he couldn't afford to dodge them. Swoosh! In the meantime, Blaze dashed upward once more, zipping his way into the fourth level. Huff, 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 ignoring the sheer cold that intruded his body. Smoker immediately resumed his chase for Blaze. 
who seemed to be set on running out of his range. Blaze, glaring coldly at Smoker with the outflux of blood stopped due to his subtle operation of Seimei Kaiken, snapped his finger as he passed through the ceiling of the fifth level. In accordance, said ceiling wriggled in a similar manner, before the entire ceiling collapsed as a weak jacket that instantly repped from the weight above it. Splash. And Smoker, from down, saw a huge volume of boiling blood, the well-known feature of the fourth level of the impelled down, pouring down at him like a gruesome nightmare. There remained a huge hole on the floor of the fifth level, and if the boiling blood were to be left alone, it was pumping a noteworthy volume of smoke out of him. He then quickly gathered all of the said smoke right on his right palm, forming a dense mass of white ball above it. Swoo then, he forcibly clenched it with his hand, bringing the size of the said ball to an even smaller size. Black TSSS encasing his smoke holding right hand with the strong armament haki. Emission, smoker shot out, said hand, raw, boom, immediately exploding upon smoker's palm opening back up. The black smoke vigorously shot out as a wide beam of hot flame. Upon colliding against the descending mass of boiling blood, the crimson steam arose along with the metallic scent that emanated through the entire fourth and fifth levels of the impel down. Roar. Jion, standing on the sixth level with her eyes shadowed, had her sword pointed at the neck of fallen and injured Shiyu. Shiyu, chuckling in defeat, thought, White Snake. Ha, huh, more like. Blaze, while Smoker was effectively blocking the crashing wave of boiling blood opened a gateway all the way to the first level of the impelled down. Standing high in the air, he held his arms out wide, looking down at Smoker with a stern expression that held a subtle arrogance within. I've seen the future. And there, Blaze said, the walls and floors all around the impelled down, just as he said so, morphed into countless jacket snakes that began to swirl around the orange head man. Exactly after our next clash, you will fall blaze grinned with your loss. That is, bar bump. Smoker, without a single word of response, blasted himself up, mustering up all his will for one final time. Just one more time, my heart thought Smoker, endure it. Bar bump. The countless jacket snakes merged and became one extremely large jacket snake one, that barely fit through the gap on each floor generated by the zippers. Said snake, hissing at Smoker's ascending form, stood aside Blaze Basilisk, and upon Blaze motioning his right arm downward, shot out at the white-haired man. Bar bump. Smoker's entire body swelled out an immense volume of smoke, merging with the crimson steam that used to be the boiling blood, as well as the previously generated smokes from multiple clashes. Smoker willed them to morph into a gigantic snake of white smoke, Raging Serpent. Boom. Two gigantic snakes crashed against one another, and right upon said contact, Smoker instinctively felt that his technique was weaker. Ha! Huh. So this was it, Smoker thought. And he smiled as the jacket snake from above obliterated the snake of white smoke, plummeting Smoker all the way back to the floor of the sixth floor. Boom! The cloud of dust arose, and from the sheer impact, the cracked walls of the sixth level shivered. Then, from one crack, a stream of water began to pour in indicating that the level will soon collapse. Smoker Joan, shrieking in a pale expression, left the night dead Shiyu, and ran toward the cloud of dust. Blaze, witnessing his victory with his very own eyes, gazed at the scenery in caution. But, this time around, then, he closed his eyes and remarked, It seems that you won't be standing back up. The cloud of dust cleared, and in the pool of his own blood, smoke allied with whitened eyes. Jion, quickly reaching the man's side, shook him in an attempt to wake him back up, but to no avail. Pearl face and dying heart, it seemed that Smoker's life was about to come to an end. And so, was this it? Was this the end of him? Yes, it is, growl Blaze, feeling a sudden shiver down his spine for no particular reason. Placing his eyes off of Smoker and Gion, and wiping a sweat on his forehead, he formed a zipper on the ceiling of the first level, and exited the ruined impel down, out onto the blue sky. Oh, there, he saw, one marine warship that sat on the sea in front of him. In the ship, there were the former marines Aramaki, Rosanante, and Hina, along with Senor Pink, whose faces held that of urgency. They, having sailed in secrecy up until now, were not aware of the live broadcast of Smoker and Blaze's battle. Former Admiral Blaze, Rosanante whispered in confusion, Hina, 
has a bad feeling about this. Hina grimaced, raising her caution against Blaze's casual self. What the hell are you doing here, former Admiral Blaze? Aramaki, standing at the frontmost section of the ship, asked stoically, ready for combat at any time. Five more inside, though they seem to be insignificant relative to these four. On my way to return after completing my mission, of course. Blaze, in amusement, stated. Aramaki frowned. And what may that mission be? Blaze smiled wickedly, assassinating White Hunter Smoker. Immediately after he said so, he found four individuals attacking him at the same time. Smoker. In the huge screen of Sabaudi Archipelago, the gruesome scene of Smoker's blood oozing out of his still and lying body was on display. Cola, the little girl standing among the civilians, trembled in tears as she hugged herself. Lost. The man whom Cola believed to be invincible was lying still. No. And she couldn't accept it. No, she believed that there was no way that her savior could have lost. Out of anguish, Cola screamed, with tears freely pouring down from her eyes. Stand back up Smoker jolting up from trance by Cola's scream. One by one, people resonated. White Hunter, Smoker San, my savior one who freed us from the inevitable slavery. Don't die. One by one, the world began to chant the name of one man one who was seconds away from death. Smoker, Bastille, slowly taking his mask off and gazing at the screen with gritted teeth, mumbled, look how many are calling out your name. Before reasoning, before logic and plan whatsoever, your resolve has reached them. That's right. Since the very start, Smoker never strayed from his words. So get back up, idiot, and prove it to me. Bastille clenched his hands in hope, reminiscing what Smoker said back then that you are capable of changing this world. Plop. The sky had swelled and shifted as the clouds rapidly stormed in. Slow yet speedy, one by one, the droplets of rain plopped down to the ground. The sensation upon Bastille's skin was cold, but at the same time, for some reason, warm. Plop. And back in the impel down, Joan witnessed the middle of the eternal hell. That was slowly being filled with pouring in seawater, swoo of all the surrounding smokes bizarrely entering Smoker's wounded body. Plop. Shh, huh? Taking a step back, Gion watched in teary expression. Plop. The pool of blood around Smoker's form began to ripple, even though Smoker produced no movement whatsoever. Plop. What was the cause? What was happening? Gion began to think with a rapidly beating heart, along with a strange sense of hope that suddenly invigorated her. Plop. And then, she saw a twitch of Smoker's finger. The plopping sound, along with the ripple they were of no more. The noise of seawater pouring in and the groans from prisoners of all floors they were of no more. There only existed silence. And in this state, Smoker slowly opened his eyes back up ones that were crimson in color, along with thin rings around their horizons. Holding the dominance capable of sending its opponents down to their knees, one will never agree such eyes to be that of a mere snake. Rather, they were akin to the eyes of a dragon. Cracked, withered, and damaged by the intense battle between Smoker and Blaze previously, there were huge holes spanning all the way from the 6th level to 1st level of the facility. Numerous prisoners were found dead whether by the boiling blood, falling, or more. In addition, the seawater was leaking into the 6th level, and eventually, the locked up prisoners will meet their end by drowning. However, something was strange. In this devastating situation, the entire impel down was in silence. And said silence didn't seem to be done out of free will. Many prisoners, with their faces paled up, seemed to be having a trouble in breathing properly as if being oppressed by an invisible force. Swoo their eyes followed the ghastly movement of smokes, which behaved as if they were alive and conscious. Those smokes slowly circulated around the form of one lying man, Smoker. Once more, his hand twitched. Then, his body jolted rumble. The thundering noise boomed throughout the entire impel down, sending shivers down to all the witnessing prisoners. Ruom next, the floor shook. The rubbles bounced up and down from the vibrations underneath. There was no doubt that the man whom the prisoners thought to have died, Smoker, was exhibiting his conqueror's haki to a magnitude that they couldn't fathom. Rumble. Many couldn't help but think, what exactly was the smoke smoke fruit for its awakening to generate an abnormality of this extent? Was there a reason why it was named as such? Was it truly the loger in the first place? Just like the lightning, Smoker's heart rumbled in a thunderous manner. Each beat of it caused the prisoners to wince and grimace in horror for the booming noises struck right into their corrupted souls. His prisoner's uniform, his filthy and messy long white hair, and his blood-filled appearance they 
mystically morphed into the soft-looking gray smokes. They flowed gently, and upon the rumble of his heart, blazed up ferociously. The snake it has shed its skin, and beyond the lair, there lied a dragon ready for its flight. Ah. Smoker's crimson eyes slowly moved, perceiving his surrounding. He mumbled, I'm alive. He wasn't operating Seimei Kaiken, and yet, his previously dripping blood was once again gaseous mingling among his body that was physical and smoke-like at the same time. Shion, falling down to her butt in relief, sighed, uncaring the fact that the water was soaking her bottom. Huff, huff, damn you, you had me worried there, smoker. Inspecting himself and his surrounding in wonder, came to chuckle. Wahahaha, placing his hand over his face, his body shook in laughter. He replied to Jion, I was damn close to breaking my promise there. Huh. Now that's infuriating. Shion deadpanned. You don't seem angry at all. Wahaha. Is it? His form then flowed like smoke does. And in a split second, he was standing with his head facing up at the ceiling of the first level. This elevated feeling in me how mysterious. And this appearance of mine, PFF it's not like smoke smoke fruit secretly was a mystical zone like gum gum fruit, is it? How ridiculous must that be? He had no way of telling. And you know what? He decided not to focus on the explanation behind the current phenomenon. Instead, with thanks that another chance has been granted to him, and with the newly rising determination in him, he raised his hand up at the ceiling he's been staring at. I know. I'll call this smoker's crimson eyes shimmered brilliantly. Arcane drive. Puff. The ceiling of the first level morphed into that of a smoke and stretched all the way down to the sixth level where Smoker stood like a rope. As Joan watched such a scene with widened eyes, Smoker's hand abruptly stretched and held Joan by the hem of her shift. Furthermore, from said hand branched out a tiny smoke-made arm that gripped onto the Den Den Mushy sitting at the corner. Hold on tight. We're getting out of this hell. Ah. Uh. Joan raised her eyebrow, but I'm not holding on to anything, Gar. The two humans and one snail-like creature shot up in an instant, rising all the way up from the depth of the hell to the surface of the overworld. Ten minutes. Within said span of time, Aramaki found himself lying on the deck of their marine warship, with the vines wrapped around the wound on his abdomen, pressuring it to stop the blood loss. Ugh. Rosanante, leaning on the rail with sunken eyes, was evidently injured quite severely. Senor Pink, with his sunglasses shattered and his waist stuck on the deck, was slouched having gone into that of unconsciousness. I you and Hina, she was currently being strangled with her feet up in the air. Her neck was held under the tight grip of Blaze, one who looked at her with cold eyes. Betraying the Marine and siding with the worst criminal that Marine ever gave birth to with a sigh, Blaze stated, Oh, just how disappointed must your deceased grandfather be at you, former Ensign Hina. Don't mock my grandfather, scum Hina, with her hands desperately trying to get Blaze's hand off of her, roared in rage. Sahahaha. Blaze seemed to be enjoying the current situation, genuinely. He laughed wickedly, with his chin raised up, his back arched, and his free hand on his stomach. Then, the laugh abruptly died from his face. And he, with a lazy expression, said, funny really, to be called a scum by a scum herself. I am getting quite an experience today. You. Hina bit her lips, unable to hide the swelling emotion of sorrow in her. Before the physical pain she was undergoing, before the devastating loss against Blaze, the fact that Smoke had died she felt useless. She regretted though she didn't know what exactly said regret came from. If only, if only hey, then a voice was spoken. It was from Aramaki, one who was still in a lying position at the deck. He, grinning in delight, spoke, Can you hear that? Here. Hina was rendered confused. From her sight, she saw that Aramaki had his eyes closed and arms spread out wide. Hear what? Blaze, narrowing his eyes, said, The Reaper calling out your name. There was no response from Aramaki, who was immersed in a bizarre sense of anticipation. Sighing in boredom, Blaze dropped Hina from his grasp, causing her to fall to her knees. Well then, raising his index finger up, Blaze pointed it at Hina. It was a nice dessert from my side. But it seems that the time for us to part has come. I'm a busy man, you see. Hina's breathing quickened, facing the intense nervousness born out of the approaching death. Listen. And yet, she decided to close her eyes, directing her thought elsewhere. Listen. She concentrated on her sense of hearing. There was the rushing sound of wind as Blaze prepared a dramatic Tobu Shigen in front of her. In addition, the waves crashed nothing unusual. Then rumble. 
There was the thunderous noise of lightning crashing down, causing Hina to jump in shock. Opening her eyes, she saw that Blaze was sweating profusely, and his index finger aimed at her was shaking uncontrollably. Plop, plop, plop. Then, there was a rain all of a sudden all over the impel down. What? Blaze, raising his head up in disbelief, viewed the abrupt rain. Numerous and thin droplets of smoke. No. Blaze's face paled, and he took a step back in horror. This can't be. Gritting his teeth, he shouted, This can't be how. Rahahaha. I knew it. Aramaki, lying at the back, embraced the white rain in a jovial manner. There's no way you'd lose against trash like that, right smoker San Ela. Subsequently, a female scream muffled by environmental factors entered Hina's ears. Gulping as she felt the soft sensation of white rain landing on her skin. Hina then witnessed, ah smoker, who was covered in grey smoke all over, flying out of the smoke-turned ceiling of the impelled down with Jion and Den Den Mushi, attached to his smoke-made arms. Hina, finding her eyes become moist in relief, cried, Smoker. Smoker's eyes widened as he sighted his defeated friends and subordinates, looking beaten and wasted. Hina, he felt a joy of his own, feeling thankful upon realizing that you've come all the way here to save me, haven't you? Tap. Landing on the deck, and placing Den Den Mushi and Jion down who immediately went to the side to throw up, he stood right in between Blaze and Hina. But why did you bring kids with you? At the same time, Smoke thought, and above all, what the hell is Lord doing here? Hina, immediately lowering her head in embarrassment, muttered, D don't ask Hina. It just happened, you know hey, that's not the point. Pouting, she turned away from Smoker, trying to hide her tears. I, if you were alive, you should have come out sooner. Wahaha. My bad. Yo, Smoker-san, Aramaki then said from the back, in a joking manner. How was your experience in the world's number one hotel? Been doing well, Aramaki. Grinning, Smoker said, was terrific on my side. Hey ugh, Smoker-san. Then, Rosanante waved from the back, barely managing to lift his arm up. Stay down, Rosie. Smoker, quickly glancing the beaten form of Senor Pink, then called, Law, Drake, get your asses up here and give a hand in treating these five up here. Huh. Meanwhile, Jion who was finished with her personal business, was looking at the Den Den Mushi brought up, you're still broadcasting. Ni, nee. quite a strong one even among your kind, aren't you? The Den Den Mushi simply huffed trying to appear strong. Impossible. And in this suddenly lax atmosphere, Blaze stood frozen, lost in disbelief. His eyes fell onto the strange form of Smoker, mentally frightened by the fact that yet again, the latter stood back up as if he was invincible. Creak. The doorway to the inner floor of the ship opened, and two boys revealed themselves from within. Law and Drake. Smoker. Law initially smiled widely, but quickly hid it under a broody look of his. Vice Admiral Smoker Drake, on the other hand, shouted in tears. I knew it, I knew that you'd be alive, there's no way that the man who destroyed that crocodile can be beaten. Good to see that you look fine. Smiling, Smoker pointed his index at the doorway behind. And yeah, keep those three inside there. It's still dangerous out here, you know. Bam. Law immediately nodded and closed the door shut, or... And from behind, a girl's scream was heard causing Smoker to sweat drop. But nonetheless, as Law and Drake quickly dragged Aramaki, Rosanante, and Senor Pink back, Smoker took in a deep breath and turned around. And so, Smoker, finally turning to Blaze, said, Shall we continue, dear Chief of CP0? Blaze, dazed and dumbfounded, found his feet glued to the deck of the ship. Over and over again, his eyes then gleamed murderously, feeling humiliated and at the same time, Helpless for some reason, no matter how many times I beat you down Blaze, clenching his shaky hands tight, growled. You continue to stand back up, taking a hard step forward. He glared at Smoker in contempt. How many times is it going to take for me to actually kill you? How come you aren't going down like the last time around? Who know? What even are you? Smoker wahahaha. Smoker simply laughed at that. There, you just said it. I'm Smoker. I'm me, period. Do you think I'm joking swoosh? 
at an incredible speed. Blaze dashed at Smoker, daring to strike the latter with the combined attack of his Haki imbued fist and the jacket snakes that arose from Smoker's exposed back. And in this state, Smoker simply held his hand up and clenched it, and Blaze was unable to move anymore. Ha! Huh. Raising his eyes up, Blaze saw that there was a gigantic hand extending out from the storming cloud above which descended all the way down and gripped onto his entire body. And the jacket snakes at the back, they were now the snakes of white smoke instead, freely swimming around Smoker without any sense of hostility in them. Then, Smoker swung his fist in a leftward direction, and in accordance, the gigantic hand of white smoke lifted Blaze up from his spot, and quickly shot at the open sea, trying to drop the orange-haired man into the ocean. Rakuigan, Golden Raw Boom. Blaze quickly blasted a potent wave of Haki mixed Rakuigan, blasting away the smoke hand that was holding him tight. Utilizing Geppo to move away from the dispersed volume of smoke, Blaze operated his observation Haki. Future Sight once again, trying to predict the upcoming move from Smoker Watt. Blaze stopped. With widened eyes, he gazed forth, and there, right above the ocean, there was a huge cyclone of white smoke mingling with the rising surge of ocean water. It spun and grinded the air in its pathway, and while traveling toward Blaze, it gradually became even larger and larger. Smoker. Still standing on the deck with a grin on his face, realized, the world is my canvas. Looking up at the shocked state of Blaze, and with his friends exhibiting a similar state of disbelief from his back, Smoker announced the name of his technique, Arcane Storm. You're kidding me. From the sixth level of impelled down where the water has now reached the knee level, she said in hilarity. Hey, what even is that man? Is he an immortal or what? And that strange form of his, I don't understand a single thing. Clang, leaning his head back and slamming against one metal bar, he sighed. Looking down, he saw the bleeding legs, ones that probably won't be able to support his weight. Man, I tried, but that woman, she was stronger than I expected. She, you made a hollow chuckle. But still, this is better than being bored. Closing his eyes, he awaited for his death whether by bleeding or by drowning. Then, do you wish to live? A voice deep and masculine was suddenly spoken from his back. Shiyu, slowly opening his eyes back up, turned back and faced the cell. From within, one huge and red-skinned man revealed himself, grinning in a psychotic manner. Clang, clang. As he moved, the thick metal chains on his cuffs clanged and splashed against the floor. Shiyu's mouth slowly opened agape as the man's visage came into his view. Dude Douglas Bullet. Bullet, looking down at Shiyu's waist, where the keys were found attached, held his cuffed hand out. Kahahaha. How about we make a deal? Weakling. Arcane Storm. With his held hand out, Smoker's statement induced the subtle shakes onto the air surrounding him. Flowing akin to that of a river, the grey smoke around him became more defined. The cape of grey smoke fluttered out resembling that of a marine officer's justice coat, without the word justice engraved on it. His currently grey hair, fluttering and behaving like the smoke does, eventually solidified into the characteristic of long and solid features. Smoker then turned his hand, such that the palm was facing up. From the sky, a gigantic smoke hand dropped, mimicking Smoker's action. On the palm of the smoke hand, the frightening storm of smoke and ocean water swirled with its rotational velocity accelerating at every second. Swoo, Hina and Gion, watching the view with nothing but amazement, then heard through the wisps of smoke brushing past their ears the melody of a flute, one that soothed their minds down. Smoker, in this state, muttered Pesado. And at the next moment, the said storm suddenly blasted toward the floating form of Blaze like an atomic bomb, bombarding the entirety of space in its path. Boom. The smoke exploded with immense pressure. The water sprinkled all around, generating mesmerizing twinkles up high in the sky. Blaze, having received the immense storm that was far too gigantic, and quick for him to dodge, was blasted miles away such that his figure was now a size of dot from everyone in the marine warship's view. Simultaneously, the distant gate of justice slowly opened, earning the attention from Hina and Gion. They, squinting their eyes, then saw the countless number of marine warships entering through. Plop plop plop. Deli managing to prevent his fall into the water by operating Geppo at the last second. The blood dripped into the sea from Blazer's nose. His bloodshot eyes were shaking from the impact of the previous strike trying to process what just happened. His heart thumped from the rising nervousness, and his eyes then locked onto the arrival of Marines. 
What is happening? Smoker, with his grin intensified, rolled his shoulder, without an ounce of care for the arrival of more spectators. He crouched down slightly, and as his grey cape shifted in accordance, swoosh. With the generation of strong gust and no damage inflicted on the deck he's been standing on top of, he shot himself across the sky, right at the distant blaze. Aye, is that from one of the ships? Kujaku whispered, rubbing her eyes to ensure that she wasn't hallucinating. H, huh? That man looks like Vice Admiral Smoker? But at the same time, different. Smoker. Robin, relieved by the fact that Smoker was alive and well, took a sigh. Then, holding her mouth, she hid her mouth that had its corners slowly rising. I impelled down Zephyr, frowning with a sweat drop, mumbled. It seems to be in a nigh-destroyed state. Hum. Doberman, Yamakaji, Momonga, and many other vice admirals, expressed disbelief shocked by that fact that Smoker. The youngster regardless of his rank and fame, was overwhelming the former Admiral Blaze, one whom all of them knew how strong he was. Wahaha you haven't changed at all, Smoker. Haven't changed at all. Garp laughed boisterously as he sat on the rail of one ship, and Suri sweat dropped from the side, not agreeing with his words. On Garp's other side was Sengoku, who narrowed his eyes at the warship nearby the impel down. Rosie Sengoku's eyes widened and his jaw dropped, W, what are you doing there? Heart Suru, sighing with her arms crossed, said sternly, Jion looks fine also. Now, now, that's not that point, Sengoku, Suru. Focus on the fight. Hey Zephyr, you want some rice crackers, Garp? Unwrapping a rice cracker that he brought out from somewhere, called out to Zephyr who ignored him in response. Shrugging, Garp began munching on the snack while spectating the battle. So you've improved by a lot in a short period of time, eh, brat? Meantime, as Blaze gritted his teeth in panic as approaching Smoker was sighted, Smoker crossed his arms before spreading them out wide. Black wings. The wing-like black smoke thinly spread out from Smoker's arms, covering the vast surface area of the ocean. Upon their contact with the water after the combustion into the red-hot fire, TSSSSS. A great volume of steam arose from the surface of the sea, one that contributed to raising the humidity and fogginess of the atmosphere around the impelled down. Huff Huff Blaze, overwhelmed by the situation, slowly moved back while sweating all over his body. Grinding his teeth without a sense of calmness in him, he growled, glaring at the flying smoker right in front of him. Conspicuous suppression with the loudest scream that Blaze could muster. He sent his hand forth one, that zipped open into numerous pieces of a jacket, attempting to lock Smoker in his grasp just like the last time around. However, Smoker suddenly vanished from his vision, and all that his technique managed to grasp was formless steam. Do you think I'll fall for the same trick twice? Smoker, in a calm manner, was now standing on Blaze's back. Blaze's neck stiffened, unable to believe that he's lost sight of the former even with the observation haki. Future sight. The steam, smoke, and any other form of gas that's currently spread out, they are connected to my very nerves. Smoker grinned, filled with confidence to the brim. Senses with their range and reactivity, invigorated to an extent far greater than that of the average observation haki. By analyzing the present, defeat those who can see into the future. This is observation haki, hypersense. It was Smoker's alternative development of haki to counter the troublesome future sight. Swoo. Becoming the smoke itself and flowing among the rushing volume of smoke, Smoker was right in front of Blaze, with his right fist cocked back. Blaze, having foreseen the attack, tried to retaliate with the haki imbued kick of his own, Puff. But Smoker's form fluidly dispersed into smoke and reformulated behind him. Blaze's punch missed. But not bothering himself with it, Blaze quickly turned back to be ready for the incoming attack from Smoker Boom. Only for Smoker's kick to land on his back after having turned back and sending Blaze down toward the Ocean One, that he had to widen his eyes in desperation to decelerate his falling speed. Damn, IT. Blaze, while huffing in exhaustion, thought as he looked up. I clearly saw that one coming. I knew that he will disperse into smoke and attack me from the back. But he his body moves like the smoke itself. When his body reformulated from my behind, his foot remained in the same position, waiting for my opening to attack half half wa ha Smoker, looking down at him plainly, was taking a breather of his own, for his body wasn't in an optimal condition either. Up at the sky, the gradually darkening clouds swirled, and as the steam from the ocean continued to rise up to the sky, 
the rain of white smoke from the above, dropped down painting the entire surrounding into a chaotic white and grey. What even is this? Blaze couldn't help but question, feeling a dread slowly creeping into him, affecting its environment like a paramecia, receiving a vast enhancement in physique and regeneration like a zone, and changing the surrounding atmosphere into the optimal condition for one's element like a loger. Just what even is that smoke smoke fruit? I think Smoker then stated, it's time to end this. P-A-Z-Z-Z-Z. The sky rumbled, and one by one, the spark of lightning blasted down to the surrounding ocean. In this gloomy and dark scenery, Smoker's eyes glowed in crimson red, exerting dominance onto Blaze's very soul. End. Blaze scowled. Yes, end it is. However, erasing all those thoughts from his mind, Blaze reminded himself of who he was. One who has risen to the rank of CP0 Chief and Admiral in the early 30s. One who has awakened the jacket jacket fruit, and applied it to many unimaginable ways. One who has mastered Haki and Rokushiki in various aspects. One who was among the most trusted by the Five Elders. That's right, he was a genius. The result will still be the same, Smoker. Blaze, holding his hands out, scowled, you won't defeat me. Just because you keep standing back up doesn't prove your superiority over me. On the other hand, such is just proof that my strength lies far above that of yours. His body morphed into thousands of jacket snakes that gazed at their prey, smoker, in a predatory manner. Subsequently, they merged into one gigantic snake basilisk. Smoker, standing high in the air, watched as Blaze began his flight upward at him having morphed his very self into the same technique that brought him down during the last clash. Ha! Taking in a deep breath, a wisp of smoke exited from Smoker's mouth, as if he was smoking. He, then ignoring the rise of Basilisk, lifted his head up, and gazed into the gloomy cloud that was swirling right above the two of them. He raised his right hand up, right at the swirling mass of cloud. Blaze, watching Smoker's action, fastened his speed to his utmost extent. Time seemed to have slowed down as Blaze's previous statements flowed through his ears. Best than and. That's the end of the story. This time around even someone of your tenacity won't be capable of getting back up. Die a slow death, dear pompous criminal. Greater than the smoke, steam, all were rising back up at the sky. The white rain, traveling in reverse, joined the swelling mass of dark cloud, ones that crackled in the bright blue lightning. Then, in Blaze's sight, Smoker clenched his hand, descend. Arcane judgment, Paz. From the gloomy sky, a blue ray of intense lightning descended right onto the rising form of the gigantic jacket snake. The world watched in silence, flabbergasted by the display. Marines, world government, pirates, civilians, revolutionary army, whoever they may be, they couldn't muster a word upon witnessing the divine retribution. He gra blaze roared from an agonizing pain. However, he didn't stop having instinctively felt that the moment he releases the current technique, he'd lose. Smoker, watching Blaze's struggle impassively, said coldly, again, Paz. The lightning struck down for the second time, again, Paz. Third, again, Paz. Fourth, again, 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 again until he dies. The sky was filled with countless rays of lightning, all of which bent and struck the airborne form of their foe. They, mercilessly piercing through Blaze's armament haki, blasted his internal organs beyond repair, and burned him down to the crisp. Blaze, gone back to human form long before the fourth ray landed, let out a silent scream, as his collapsing body sprayed blood all over on us that splashed into the sea below. With no strength left in him, he slowly began falling. The self-proclaimed genius, one whose strength was among some of the well-known powerhouses, Blaze or Piero, the confidence, the ideal, and the faith in himself have absolutely shattered against the man named Smoker, Splash. And with a hollow shell of a body, the man fell into the ocean with a small splash dying a pathetic death. Gut grinned. Sengoku, Tsuru, and Zephyr exhibited stern expressions, though their eyes held that of approval. The winner is Joan, with the Den Den Mushi by her side, mumbled Smoker. Up in the sky, there only remained a lone dragon, far more elegant and mystical than the bronze snake has ever been, for some reason. I feel high. Like, am I smoking from inside my lungs or what? Gah, is this how you felt while smoking, cancer? Ugh, this is getting dizzy. 
Why am I feeling high when I am the smoke itself? Gra, don't do smoke kids ugh or not. Having lost the strength in her legs, Kola fell down. Ha ha, her chest inflated and deflated, reflecting the intensity behind Smoker and Blaze's battle. Slowly, a smile found its way onto her face. And she exclaimed, Smoker won. On the screen, there stood the man covered by the cape of grey smoke, Smoker, staring down at the sea that has calmed down. Though they were far away from the battlefield, all the spectators in the Sabaudi archipelago felt goosebumps making their way onto their skins, unable to believe that someone who's managed to reach the rank of an admiral was defeated. On this day one man, holding a note and a pen, gulped, many things happened for the marine. The war against the Whitebeard pirates, the war against the Beast Pirates, and the broadcast of the battle between White Hunter Smoker and Cedar Heavy Blaze. Many questions will be raised, and these events will thoroughly be examined by the analysts. However, one imminent question that must be asked at the current moment is whose victory is this? Is Smoker on the side of the Marine? Or is he the pirate as of the current moment? People murmured among themselves. Some asked if the war was over and if they could return to their daily lives. Some asked what will happen to Smoker now, if he'll be sent back to the Impel Down. And some asked, what stance the world government will take in regard to the appearance of CP0 Chief in the depth of the Impel Down. Nonetheless, one thing was for sure. Upon witnessing the so-called criminal's victory, people found smiles on their faces. You really did it, Dara. Meanwhile, at the edge of the grove, Bastille whispered in a shaky tone as he placed the mask back on. Throughout the years, there were many losses. Dalmatian, Masterson, Cancer and today, Bastille subconsciously wondered if Smoker's turn has come. In a way, Bastille believed that Smoker broke the jinx. That he's shown that the current generation of Marine wasn't helpless against the tide of the world. Feeling an inexplicable surge of emotion in him, Bastille mumbled. So, Chief of CP0 was the former Admiral, eh? Back then, Martini pirates assaulted the ship containing Dalmatian, Masterson, Maynard, and him after they were tired from the fight against Sasaki pirates. The location, the route of return, their conditions. The steel question for years, of how Martini pirates managed to strike them at the perfect timing. And coincidentally, Sengoku, Garp, Sakazuki, Borsalino, Hanazumi all, the top powers of the Marine were away to the new world. And Blaze was tasked with defending the Marineford. Cha holding his head in a headache, the steel placed his other hand on a nearby bark to support his weight. Then he laughed out of sorrow that burst out of him. Dara Dara Dara. He, raising his head up to the sky, roared, Now how do you feel Dara? Self-proclaimed dragons of the world, in dark expressions, the elders stood without any movement, bombarded with the sudden influx of information from everywhere. Hey this is Tokakik, and I'm currently speaking in secrecy. If you are on board, you probably witnessed that jacket man's defeat. And, a hey, Sengoku. Garp and Suru all seemed to be siding with Smoker, you know. One among them looked at a Proko the Den Den Mushi, that displayed the visual information transmitted from Kameko. The grey cape of smoke, unusually grey-coloured hair, and the mystical ability to control the weather to his liking, it's as if. One elder growled, that fruit is meant to mimic the power of a god, and the only fruit that we're aware of in that regard is human human fruit model. Nika. Does that mean Smoke Smoke Fruit 2 was a fruit of the same nature? That it was given a secondary name to hide the danger behind its awakening? It was a complete mayhem. Not only did the very existence of Smoker threaten the identity of Marine, but the potential of his fruit implied how dangerous he is strength-wise especially, when combined with the past achievements he's accomplished. And, if Blaze, the chief of CP0 wasn't sufficient enough to kill him off, if one of the highest power in the world government lacked short against him, then, but, still, one elder mumbled, Sengoku, Garp, Suru they are far too valuable to lose. Can Marine without them still be called Marine? Without the symbol of justice, Civilians' trust in the organization will diminish, and the lack of faith is ultimately equivalent to the rise of more pirates like the pests that they are the case will leave out hands. Another elder, gazing down with sunken eyes, finally said, Let us talk to him, Tokakik. Smoker was found looking up to the sky as the grey cape on his back fluttered. Swoo the smoke cape dispersed and his grey-coloured hair returned back to its original white. All that remained with him was the outfit of a prisoner, drenched in that of blood. How? 
Long has it been since I was basked under the sunlight. Closing his eyes, Smoker took in a deep breath. The sun's rays brightly shone over his floating form as it stood halfway to crossing the horizon. Tired without an ounce of strength, Smoker found it difficult to maintain himself floating in the air. However, he withstood the exhaustion and slowly made his way back to the deck of the marine warship. Situated by Hina, Joan, Aramaki, and more, Smoker as Joan stared at him with widened eyes, and Hina exhibited that of worry. Smoker locked his eyes at the front where numerous marine ships were spread out. Huff huff calming his breathing down, Smoker sat down on the deck. Though his form was full of sweat and blood, his eyes, still holding the brilliant gleam in them, swept across numerous marines on the ships ahead of him. Yo, from one ship, the short man in brown colored attire and hat Tokikik stepped forth. From his side, one marine soldier came up with the Den Den Mushi in his grasp. Placing it down on the rail, he then held a speaker in front of its mouth, allowing the voice of the call's receiver to be heard throughout the entire area. Ah, there was no doubt. The receiver, no, receivers of the call from the other side, were none other than the five elders themselves. You've given us a great deal of trouble up until now. The Den Den Mushi frowned. Smoker believed that he now stood at the most crucial step of the plan. Through a series of coincidental events, the determinations made between him and Sengoku during that day have become the opportunity one in which the Marine can change from. His breathing became shaky, facing the rising nervousness in him. His eyes shifted, looking at the legends of the Marine who looked back at him. Garp, Sengoku, Suru, and even Zephyr all of them were smiling back at him as if encouraging him to speak what was in his mind. And then, a hand was placed on his shoulder. Turning his head around, Smoker saw Aramaki, though a bloody bandage was wrapped around his torso, grinning right behind him. With Aramaki, there were Hina, Rosanante, Senor Pink, Gion, and even the kids. Law, Drake, Monet, Sugar, and Baby Five. So many placed their trust in him. So many believed in him. Smoker's eyes widened in realization and wonder, exhibiting joy. Before he knew, he was vibing with a sudden rush of energy. In addition, the previous nervousness in him was no more. Therefore, Smoker finally opened his mouth in confidence, with the Kameko behind him still running. On the side of justice, you say. Justice ran down deep through the Marine's veins. Today, Smoker believed that most of the Marines didn't care what justice exactly was. They simply followed because of the blind belief that justice was equivalent to righteousness. Justice. Such is the word that summarizes the Marines' doctrine, one that all of us followed in order to attain a valid reason behind our doings. Justice, it was because I was against this idea that I was branded a traitor. The Den Den Mushi next to Tokakik had its eyes narrowed. And then, Smokus said, Then, let me ask you, is ignoring the blatant cases of slavery the justice? Peering into the eyes of the Den Den Mushi, Smoker let his mind out. His gaze, directly reaching the five elders above, wasn't something that filthy criminals could ever possess. Is ignoring the unreasonable and questionable deaths of our comrades the justice? Some marines flinched upon that, having resonated with said words. One among them was the burly marine who had a cap shadowing his eyes. Maynard is ignoring the recruitment of criminals ones who dealt harm to civilians in many ways. The justice. Is the establishment of warlord truly the right thing to do? Smoker chuckled hollowly. He thought, what was the point of Impel Down? If the very owners of the Impel Down are no different from the criminals themselves. January 8th of this year, after having the documents approved, my division and I set sail to the Flevance located in the North Blue for the purpose of investigating the Amber Lead Syndrome. Strangely enough, my path supposedly overlapped with Martini Pirates, one of the warlords. The Den Den Mushi's frown deepened before it refuted, supposedly would be an inappropriate word in that context, Smoker. If we were to remind you it was you who actively pursued after those pirates, not the other way around. Ha! Huh. Smoker raising an eyebrow, then let out a dry laughter. Then he turned his head as he leaned his back on the rail and asked Hina, Hina, will you get that picture we've taken? Sure. Hina, nodding, immediately made her way to the inside of the ship. In a short period of time, she returned back out with several photos in her hands and displayed them to the Den Den Mushi and the crowd of Marines. 
Said photos showcase the back of the deceased Martini hook where the hoof of the flying dragon, the mark given to slaves of celestial dragons, was found. Many marines' eyes immediately widened, not having expected solid evidence to be presented. Yo Smoker brought out the pics of Martini's back, whispered Tokakik. What? But, then, one vice admiral refuted heatedly. Haven't you dealt with many cases of slavery before you should have memorized what the mark looks like? How do we know that that mark wasn't branded by you on the spot? Smoker calmly stated in response. I've never seen a single slave or slavery mark in my life. My works involved the prevention of civilian dash containing slave ships from reaching the auction shop such that they will never be branded with the said mark. Which ultimately points, Suru coldly stated with her eyes closed and arms crossed. That Martini pirates were indeed the ones who chased after the 31st Division, under the former Vice Admiral Smoker's command. And in addition, the Martini pirates were ordered by the world government to do so given their statuses as slaves. And that translates to the world government actively attempting to prevent my arrival at the Flevens, summarized Smoker. And so, as the elders were rendered flabbergasted, Smoker continued, one of your own was blatantly targeted by the world government and branded as a traitor after. And your response wasn't to question the abnormality in this event, but to blindly follow their decisions like mindless dogs. I believe that this is the proof that justice isn't that of righteousness but the mere luxury of victors. Pausing slightly, Smoker waited for the response from the elders. However, even after a while they maintained their silence. Hey Smoker, Senor Pink, slowly making his way up to Smoker with his entire head wrapped around bandages, took out a book from the inner pocket of his jacket and threw it at Smoker. Smoker, raising his eyebrow, ignored the stench of a sweat that emanated from the book and flipped it open ho. Looking at Senor Pink once more, Smoker grinned in approval. Well done, Pink. Tokakik, placing his hand above his eyes, squinted his eyes at the book in Smoker's hands. He whispered into the Den Den Mushi. Ah, he got a book from his team all of a sudden. Flevance. The voice from the Den Den Mushi was cut immediately, as Smoker stated sternly, reading off of the book. February 21st, year 1502. Written by Party P. Upa the hell is this name even? Shaking his head and focusing on the context, Smoker resumed. Amber lead was discovered to react with water molecules below zero degrees Celsius in temperature. Simply put, snow is its worst enemy. Upon contact, it breaks down into a gaseous substance that is colorless and odorless and the size is small enough to be absorbed through the skin. Though the most amount is excreted through feces, the small remaining amount manages to enter germ cells via simple diffusion, and cause the increased accumulation of ember lead throughout the succeeding generations of patients. No word was said in response. None, none could be said by the elders. Party Piopa. That was the name of one researcher four years ago. One who attempted to publicize the hazard of amber lead and prevent any further extraction. The world nobles, desiring the amber lead for cosmetic uses, however, killed the man off through the act of dispatching Cipherpole agents. The elders had no way of knowing that Upa's father, named Bill, was secretly hiding this diary for years since. Smoker finally said, Must I speak more, Elder, for me to elaborate the objectivity behind my claim regarding justice? The elders, unable to maintain their standing position, fell to the couches. They, having seemingly aged by ten years in appearance, stared at one active Den Den Mushi, whose eyes gleamed in a brilliant resolve. At this point, they wondered what they could do. Their attempt to stitch up the wound has worsened to an extent where it may be irreparable. Then, one elder, finally sighing, spoke, What is your condition? Before abruptly stopping his words. Tap. Tap. One figure clad in a long robe and a crown, a man in terms of physique, was walking in a way that spoke gracefulness. His steps generated echoes that rang throughout the room. He, taking steps up to the long staircase behind where the elders were situated, reached one empty throne. This empty throne, located at the very center of the world, wasn't supposed to have an owner. The fact that it was empty held significance that peace and equality will be maintained among nations. But now, this throne has become occupied as this individual casually sat on top of it. 
His eyes, exhibiting the crimson color with thin rings around their arises just like how Smoker's eyes were upon the utilization of arcane drive peered into the terrified eyes of the elders. And he spoke smoothly, Saturn, Mars, Valkyrie, Nesturo, Peter. Already having ending the call prior to Emu's statement, the elders immediately genuflected. Yes, Emu-sama. Please tell us of what you got to order us. The room was dark. Though huge in size, it was only occupied by six individuals. The man sitting on the throne, whose name was revealed to be Emu, stated coldly, kill Smoker at all cost. There was no hesitation. Simultaneously, the five elders bowed deeper, as you wish, Emu-sama. In the Gate of Justice, located close to the Impel Down, there lied a monitor room one that kept the surveillance of the impelled down's various locations through what were known as the surveillance den den mushes. Many jailers, all having evacuated to this place a long time ago, were gazing at the screen ahead of them in vivid horror. The water, already having engulfed the entire sixth level, continued to rise at an accelerating pace. Even worse, Magellan was yet to exit from his office the only intact section of the fourth level. That she you must be dead by now, muttered one staff, before turning to another. And how's the call on Warden Magellan going? Who, uh, I think he did pick up to a call, but all I hear is the noise of, um, you know yeah. Another one sighed. Well, tell him that he has to get out soon if he doesn't want to die. Unlike thousands of those criminals who drowned already. Something is weird though. Then, one female staff with wavy blonde hair said keenly, narrowing her eyes at the monitor. The way in which the influx of water into the facility suddenly increased by several folds. It's as if a huge hole was punctured at the bottom. It's probably because there indeed is one domino. Water pressure breaking the wall, you know. Oh. A the call abruptly ended from their side. In confusion, Tokakik shrugged. From across, Smoker let out a deep breath and relaxed his body. He, closing his eyes and dropping his head, momentarily entered the period of rest. The golden light from the setting sun intensified. Only the tip of the sun was now visible, and on the opposite side of the sky, the pale moon was secretly rising. Aramaki, taking a seat next smoker, witnessed the shift from day to night. In a stern expression, he said, You told us before, the story of that Vice Admiral Victorious. For harboring thoughts similar to yours, he was killed. Others of similar characteristics too, were of no difference. The waves crashed on the cracked walls of the impelled down. The water sprinkled over the shaky ship and splashed over their form. Xion watched with narrowed eyes, the marines reluctantly looking at one another. There lied a strange sense of tension, one to which Sengoku and Tsuru grimaced in response. You were the only one to ever arrive this far. To openly speak the truth and directly oppose the world government's oppressive means of governing. The whole world has now become aware of what kind of man you truly are. In this environment, Aramaki nonetheless asked plainly, What will happen from here on, Smoker-san? The sun has fully set, and the full moon revealed itself on the opposite side of the sky. It emanated a pale glow across the night sky, but it was insignificant. Without the sunlight, the atmosphere took a shift to that of a cold and unusually ominous one. Even if you ask, I have no idea either. Smoker, opening his eyes in this state, dryly remarked, and sometimes I do wonder if doing what I believe to be the right thing was the best thing to do. Everyone on the ship listened to Smoker. Strangely, there existed an inexplicable sense of warmth even without the sun, contrary to the tension-filled atmosphere among the numerous marines ahead. But you know what? I decided not to linger in the past. If you are afraid of taking a single step forth, you'll never get to walk. Without learning how to walk, running will be impossible. Once I decided to change this world, I settled on the thought that what I truly need wasn't the preparation under the surface, but the resolve to risk my life for it. Pacifistas, Seraphims, Mother Flame the world government will become stronger as time passes on. Having the knowledge of the future, Smoker knew that time wasn't necessarily an advantage for them. Unless active changes are made, numerous will continue to suffer for the next 18 years. I have nothing but gratitude to all of you for following my selfish self up until now, said Smoker, deciding to come to this world's worst prison to save one guy like me here, makes me feel special. Aramaki let out a grin. Rosanante, though barely conscious and standing, smiled in relief that Smoker hasn't changed at all. Senor Pink, with his head turned the other way, 
seemed to be in deep thought. Joan, looking at the still active Kameko, blinked her eyes in amazement. The kids at the back simply stood by, with Law staring at Aramaki in particular with that of disbelief of how incredible the man's rate of recovery was. Do you remember our discussion in the past, Smoker? One involving you, Bastille, and Hina. Hina, now gazing at the stars that started to reveal themselves up in the sky, asked. Smoker smiled, of course. Hina's eyes reflected the glowing stars above. They are vast and majestic in view. Wow, oh, I know that one. Do you see a bright one over there? The name of that star is Nameless. That's a name. And the kids too watched it in awe unlike the other marines ahead, who were in full-on caution to notice such a sight. Hina, shaking her head in defeat, chuckled as time passed on. Our naive selves changed. Our ideals were modified and reshaped. Back then, Bastille and Hina used to believe that your goal was the most ridiculous and childish one. But now that Hina thinks upon it, you are the only one who hasn't changed since then, still aiming for that dream as ridiculous as the possibility of the devil fruit named human human fruit model. Sora existing. Sora meaning sky. Huh? Rosinante mumbled to himself. Oi, smoker. Then, a thunderous shout boomed throughout the night sky, before one burly man with spiky grey hair and a similarly jagged beard, Garp, landed on their ship, grinning. Behind him, one marine warhead containing Sengoku, Suru, Zephyr, and the other trainees were approaching them. Garp Sensei, it's been a while. Smoker grinned. Sorry. But I didn't manage to get those rice crackers from the Rubik Island. You'll have to deal with it. Wahaha. You were worried about that. Giap laughed boisterously with his hands on the waist. It's alright. I'm a generous man after all. What's with that stare of yours, brat? You. Generous. Smoker, though filled with disagreement to Gup's claim, hid it with a shaky grin. Nothing boom. Ah, Shem PH, have you forgotten how to respect your teacher? Since when did I disrespect you, old man boom? Ah, others, with their eyes popped out and jaws dropped, watched the unreal interaction between two men. Gup San. Gion immediately called out. He's severely injured. Can't you see that he's not in a condition for you to punch him like that punch? Gup raised his eyebrow, lowering his hand as he did so. Turning to Smoker who was rubbing the back of his head, Gup asked, Smoker, did I punch you just now? Smoker, recovering from the pain in seconds, shrugged. I don't know if I can call that a punch, Gup Sensei. You know, I think you've gotten a tad older boom. Smoker's head was driven into the deck, as Gup mercilessly blasted his fist right onto his head for the third time. H H H H H Smoker. The ship immediately fell into a panic. Law hurriedly moved with a small medic kid of his, Aramaki, Rosinante, and Senor Pink, yanked Smoker back out with the strength that remained in them, and the children were busy fussing over the unconscious Smoker who had blood spraying out of the top of his head, like that of a fountain. What do you think you're doing, Garpsan? Gion pointed her finger at Garp who simply scratched the back of his head in confusion. You're going to kill him at this rate, uh? Garp squinted his eyes and placing his hand under his chin, hummed and thought. Eventually, he simply laughed it off. Oh ha ha ha. Don't worry, that brat's fine. Hina, simply throwing a piece of cloth over the bleeding top of Smoker's head, sighed knowingly. Ha Hina isn't surprised. Seriously Garp, what have you done this time around? Don't be so harsh to that child, Garp. He's been through a lot. As the second warship finally came to a stop, Sengoku and Tsuru, standing with sweat drops, said to Gup still in the middle of getting reprimanded by Gion. Hyuhu on the other hand, Zephyr grinned in approval. Well done, Gup. That kid needs some discipline in him. Robin deadpanned at Zephyr, looking at her instructor by the corner of her eyes, seems. Like Zephyr Sensei hasn't forgotten how Smoker jokingly called him a child molester before. A fleet admiral Sengoku. Rosinante's eyes opened wide in a pleasant surprise. Sengoku, losing all seriousness upon Rosinante's words, held his arms wide and shouted, Come and embrace your papa Rosie, PFF. What? Aramaki, standing next to Rosie, placed his hand on top of his mouth, holding in laughter. Rosinante's cheeks reddened, before he said out loud, I, I appreciate your hospitality, but this is too much, Fleet Admiral, Sister Tsuru. On the other hand, Chuon waved her hands at Tsuru in excitement, instantly ignoring Garp who was busy picking his nose and running at the old Vice Admiral. Tsuru, upon locking her eyes on Jion, 
Who are you? Mumbled in a dumbfounded expression. Did you not take your daily dose of medicine? Meanwhile, Hina respectfully bowed at Zephyr. It's been a while, Zephyr Sensei. Hina wonders if all has been well for Zephyr Sensei. Zephyr chuckled softly, adjusting his sunglasses as he did so. I've been hearing your efforts from afar, Hina. It seems that you've gotten more mature since when you left my care. Yo, Hina. Then, two men revealed themselves from Zephyr's back. Shu, with a lewd eye smile on him, whispered at Hina. So, how's the progress going with Smoker? Kikekiki. I bet that they went all the way. Sneaky bastards. Akahand, placing his hands on his waist, laughed out loud. Hina watched two men with her eyes twitching in annoyance. From two men's back, Kujaku, Ain, Bins, Shuzo, and the others they stared at each other inside, amazed by the antics of their seniors. Robin's ears perked up as she heard two men's jokingly made words. And she narrowed her eyes at Hina, calculating the possibility of those words being true. And so, Smoker, whose consciousness returned thanks to Law's support, spoke to Gup in amusement. Hey, I heard that you threatened to quit Marine, Gup Sensei. Gup grinned as he stood in front of the sitting form of Smoker. Indeed, I did. There was a brief silence before... Wahahaha. Wahahaha. The two of them burst into laughter hold on. Gup suddenly stopped his laugh and stared at Smoker. Your laugh changed what? Smoker paused and tilted his head. No, it didn't. It's still the same IT sounds like that accursed Roger's laugh now Gup, yanking Smoker by the collar of his prisoner's uniform, roared at his apprentice. What happened? Brat, don't tell me that you plan on becoming the Pirate King now. What the hell are you even talking about, old man? Why would I be interested in that One Piece shit? Bam. Smoker and Gup bumped their foreheads and glared at each other. The children, watching the childish interaction between the two in sweat drops, said among themselves, My fantasy is broken. White Hunter and Marine Hero who would have thought? They know that they are still being broadcasted, right? Oh my what a complex circumstance we are trapped in Borsalino, on the deck of one warship. Far from two ships docked at the impel down ahead, said casually with his hands in his pockets. Looking around, Borsalino saw many troubled marines, discussing and debating among themselves. It was a well-known fact among us that the world government wasn't invested in saving the civilians. Hell, you know what I actually find Smoker's words valid. The doings of world government is just as bad as that of pirates, if not worse, and risk our lives. Remember, we too are humans. We are no different than those civilians. I didn't become a marine to be some noble hero of a fairy tale hell. I just want a peaceful life with a stable income. We simply do the jobs given to us civilians, tell them to save themselves one by one. The ships sailed toward the impel down for those who agreed to Smoker's statement. And those who didn't remained Borsalino noticed that the majority of the Vice Admirals, Yamakaji, Doberman, Lacroix, Lons, Tokakik, and more, remained. And on the other hand Kuzan, Momonga, Stainless, Doberman, with an evident disappointment written on his face, scowled. So you decided to betray the Marine. Momonga and Stainless didn't say anything. Kuzan, on the other hand, betray snorted as he turned his head and coldly stared Doberman, Fleet Admiral sides with Smoker 1, who holds the absolute authority over the Marine. By refusing to follow him, who are the traitors here? Shem HM, that makes sense too. Borsalino nodded in agreement, seemingly weighing the pros and cons of the decisions available to him. Then, the mini Den Den Mushy on his wrist rang. Borsalino, with a raised eyebrow, accepted the call, Moshi Moshi Borsalino. A voice belonging to one of the five elders without a doubt was spoken out of the snail. Then, oh, Borsalino expressed a surprise, not having expected such an order. Then, he raised his head at the night sky where the stars twinkled, and after a few seconds of thorough observation, he accepted the mission. Hum, alright I suppose that I'll be a traitor, then and then everything happened in an instant. Borsalino raised his index finger, and fired a bright beam of laser one, that penetrated right through the Kameko while everyone's guards were down. What? Sengoku quickly turned around with his teeth gritted, and then, zoom. All of a sudden, one ship somehow levitating up in the air revealed itself from the empty sky. Zoom. That wasn't the end. One by one, more and more ships appeared, filling the night sky with numerous ships all of which had the mark of world government engraved. Smoker's eyes widened in a shock. What warp fruit? From atop, one man spoke through a speaker. 
This man, whose beard and head arched in a way that resembled a crescent shape altogether, was someone whom Gup recognized. Figeland Garling Gup, frowning, growled. What are you doing here, you good-for-nothing scum? With due respect, we would like to ask one question, Imusama. In front of the long staircase leading to the High Throne, which was occupied by the mysterious Imu, one of the three elders currently present, named Shigaisha Satan, asked grimly. Looking down at his three loyal servants, Imu said, Speak. Satan, without daring to raise his head, asked while sweating profusely, What exactly is the true identity of Smoke Smoke Fruit for its awakened ability to be capable of such disastrous effects? Imu Sama the sense of danger we felt upon witnessing its power. We couldn't help but wonder if this fruit is a mythical zone akin to human-human fruit model. Nikki, you're asking. Imu's crimson eyes drifted away from Saturn. Peering into the darkness ahead of him, he opened his mouth long before Mew's time. It was said that there initially were four mystical fruits in this world. Whether by a miraculous phenomenon or by an unknown witchery, those fruits granting immense strength to their wielders existed from the very start of the world. Imu's gaze then lowered. His eyes, so cold and mighty that they sent shivers down into the elders' spines, seemed not to be looking into the three of them, but rather, the past itself. Their wielders, harnessing the powers beyond what an average human being is capable of, were glorified as gods, with each receiving the title of sun, rain, forest, and earth. The elders froze from the information, processing the information. By four fruits, it was already discovered back then. That gum gum fruit is one of the four. Today, with the reveal of smoke smoke fruits awakening, the three fruits have now been identified, leaving only the domain of earth as a mystery, and numerous ones other than the four fruits. They are the creations of the ancient kingdom, born from the combination of their advanced technology and devilish ambition to open the so-called future where only the destruction awaited for them. That is, the true name of Gum Gum Fruit is Human Human Fruit Model. Nika. Nika, being the sun god who is hailed as the warrior of liberation, is perceived as the hope of the world, and the one who will bring the new dawn onto the world. 800 years ago, during the void century, the wielder of this fruit was given the title of Joy Boy. His fighting style itself was the very manifestation of freedom, utilizing everything around its surroundings in the most ridiculous ways possible. Imu, he was the one who faced this ancient warrior, and ultimately came out as a victor. And naturally, one capable of defeating a god was yet another god. Human Human Fruit Model Mew, one of the original four fruits, hailed as the forest god. Today, He's witnessed the rise of another contender, one whom he's never met in his life before. Another elder, named Shepherd Jew Peter, muttered shakily, T then the true name of Smoke Smoke Fruit is Imu stayed silent for a while, seemingly in a foul mood. The entire room shook from the silent conqueror's haki, that slowly spread throughout the surroundings. The three elders, completely oppressed by the sheer pressure of Imu's haki, couldn't dare to mumble out a single word. Unknown. Imu's tone took a turn into one filled with coldness. It is one full of mysteriousness. The given name of Rain God and the full potential of Smoke Smoke Fruit all remains unknown, which is precisely the reason why Smoker must be killed at this point. With Kuzan, Stainless, and Momonga's arrival, there stood five marine warships in total, on the shore of the Impel Down. Standing across said five were the remaining 29 warships, all of whom decided to side with the world government. Monkey D. Garp, I am not here to converse with the likes of you. In the dark night, where the moon sent its pale light down to the calm sea, Garling unsheathed his fine-looking sword while passing on the speaker to shadowy figures at the back. The blade, revealing a bluish gleam upon receiving the moonlight, was pointed directly at the distant smoker. The only aspect that matters in the current scenario is whether you side with White Hunter Smoker or not. Garling snarled in a deep frown. If I were to remind you your lives aren't as valuable as you'd like to believe. The world government has been generous thus far. However, there shall be no more tolerance henceforth. Decide, mongrels. Behind Garling stood two old-aged men with long white beards, whose appearance were covered by long and white robes. Among them, one without the speaker stepped up and opened a scroll in his grasp. As the another held the speaker close to this one's mouth, he's begun his words, the voice boomed loudly, and Sengoku, in this situation, found his eyes narrowed at the darkness above the other floating ships in the sky knowing 
that Garling wasn't the only formidable foe who had arrived. Two. Then, Gup muttered from Sengoku's side, causing Sengoku to click his tongue in a frown. Sengoku silently shifted his eyes to the back, where Tsuru was standing by, and got Tsuru's firm nod in response. And a top one floating ship located higher than any other two among the five elders. Topman Valkyrie and Athambran Venus Juro were found to be silently sitting in the darkness. Among them, Nisturo's eyes headed downward, Garp. Though you've considerably withered, your will hasn't diminished since back then. This criminal being spoken through the loudly booming voice was currently busy inspecting the state of the wounded snail. What did you say? Aramaki, tilting his head sideways and placing his hand over his ear, pretended as if he didn't hear properly. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you too. From the floating ships, the cannons revealed themselves. The numerous marine warships, no longer the allies to the likes of Garp and Sengoku, ready to fire their own cannons at their legends though, most of them were hesitant to do so. Smoker, Hina, and among them was Maynard, who bit his lips so hard that they bled. Why did you decide to betray? Why go to an excessive extent and throw your lives away like this? What's the point of opposing the government when the only thing that awaits you is death? Throughout his time served in Sakazuki's division, Maynard came to learn the truth. That no matter how strong you get, the world government will always be stronger. Even Sakazuki, the admiral whom Maynard admired for his incredible strength and unwavering justice revealed a troubled expression when facing the world government's oppressive rule and succumbed to it in the end. Yes, that's right. Strength is justice, and therefore, the world government is absolute under any circumstance. That's the idea in which Maynard ultimately settled. However, so they decided that the weight of my life is heavier than the combined lives of marine legends. There was no space for a loser in Smoker's eyes, who held onto the Kameko that had passed out with a bleeding hole on its body. Smoker, placing his ear close to the Den Den Mushi's body, deduced, this one's still alive, right? Shrugging, Smoker passed Kameko to Law. Law, this one's yours. Ugh, I'm not a vet though. Law then proceeded to complain of how he's run out of bandages before deciding to rip off Drake's top without the latter's consent, inducing the latter's anguish. The ripped cloth was used as the replacement for bandages, wrapping them around the snail to prevent any further bleeding. How's the Kameko, little boy? Jion, crouching down at Law, asked. Law, growing a tick mark on his head, growled. Don't call me little boy, old lady, ha. Huh? Who are you to call me old lady? I'm only in early twenties meanwhile. Smoker had his gaze up at the night sky, Filled with exasperation as he saw the soldiers above loading cannonballs into the cannons. That's one hell of a number. Numerous thoughts ran through his mind. Fight back. Run. Try to trick them. Or, if all of them won't work. Then Smoker. Hina sang it just in case. But, huffing with her arms crossed. Hina called Smoker. Don't you dare sprout some bullshit like sacrificing your life to let others escape. Yeah. Smoker-san, Rosanante nodded at Hina's words in agreement. I'm not a fan of some forced drama stuff, you know. Something like how the main character of the story uses all his strength to hold enemies back, let others escape, and enters a nigh-dead state only to be saved by a stranger, recover, and make a comeback later. Kujaku with her hand supporting her chin, said thoughtfully, I remember reading one novel like that before. Had to quit it in the middle because of some ridiculous plot armor though. What's with all those talks all of a sudden? Smoker chuckled in amusement, looking around the deck that was quite packed now, and receiving heated gazes from many around him. Smoker's expression changed to that of a grim smile. You know, I gave a little thought in this short period of time. The current situation seems pretty bleak, and though we have more friends here with us including Kuzan, Stainless San, and Momonga San, there are tons for us to deal with. I can literally sense at least two incredibly strong presences above, and running away with an exhausted dead weight like me sounds almost impossible. Hina frowned. Hina said, Don't you dare then. Smoker's grin suddenly widened, filled with that of mischievousness. But even so, and even though I can't fight or move right now, I want to live. So save me, all of you. Say something idiotic Hina's words slowed down as Smoker said exactly the opposite of what she expected. After the realization, Hina deadpanned at Smoker, who grinned back at her. Rahahaha. Aramaki, placing his hand on the rail and standing back up, grinned, y'all heard that. Smoker-san wants to live. Then he indeed will. 
Shuzo, the muscular trainee of Zephyr, laughed boisterously as he bumped his fists together. Following suit, the others around unsheathed their swords, loaded firearms in their grasps, or raised their guards ready to combat. Wahaha Ga, picking his ear casually in the rising tension, spoke, Sengoku, Suru, do you remember in the past, when we were surrounded by rocks pirates? Now, of all times, you're talking about that. Sengoku said dryly, and that event that you're talking of, I believe that it ended up as a failure. All of us literally drowned. And if not for that man saving us, this time, it's going to work. We got more hands, and unlike that last time, Suru's fruit ability is awakened. Gup, cutting Sengoku off, grinned in confidence. Arara. Now you got me curious there, Gupsan. Kuzan, looking up at the floating ships, said with a fiery grin, Whatever planet may be, if it's from Gupsan, it's going to be suicidal, said Momonga, to which Stainless agreed. If we're doing that, we have to do it now. Suru then said, with her head raised up, here they come. Fire boom boom boom. Followed by Garling's order was the rain of cannonballs, filling the night sky with metallic grey. They, simultaneously falling right on top of the impel down, harbored the intent to destroy everything in its path, mercilessly. And that wasn't the end. Fire. Among the marine ships, Vice Admiral Yamakaji shouted, causing many marines nearby to jolt in surprise. Nonetheless, ones in charge of cannons fired, grimly. Boom boom boom. At the same time, Borsalino jumped up high in the air, and crossed his arms as his hands began to glow in brilliant yellow. Yasakani Sacred Jewel. The numerous beams of laser were mixed with cannonballs. Countless in amount, those projectiles filled up the entire sky in metallic black and bright yellow, as they rapidly flew at Smoker and the others. Many trainees of Zephyr and the marine soldiers of Kuzan, Stainless, and Momonga, watched the rainfall of damnation in disbelief. E, this is just like Robin's face paled up in horror, Buster Call. Robin's eyes unconsciously headed to her source of comfort, Smoker. He, noticing her stare, gave her a smirk. His eyes, full of confidence, seemed to be saying, but unlike back then, we aren't helpless and alone. With her eyes widened, Robin looked around her. There were many fellow marines, hurriedly moving in a coordinated manner, working at their utmost to prepare for the incoming attacks. The situation indeed was different than the Ahara incident where Smoker, Sol, and herself were hiding in a deep pit until the calamity passed by. There existed a sense of hope. Then, you've proven yourself, Smoker thought Robin, as she too glared at the cannonballs in determination of her own, your efforts for years, to lead Marine to the path of righteousness. Though there are and will be many losses, we finally took a first step. Then I'll also show, of how much I managed to improve swoosh. Ah. Wahahaha one figure abruptly suddenly shot out to the sky above, with his fist cocked back. Short, grey coloured hair and thick beard of same colour. Gup, with the justice cape thrown away from his back, was flying at the countless cannonballs with a grin. ECH. So we really are doing it. Huh? Gup Goku, gritting his teeth, immediately ordered, Zephyr, Kuzan, Momonga, Stainless, all of you and your subordinates get on this ship. We're escaping right away. Hurry, go back inside. Meanwhile, Jion motioned the children to go back inside the ship, to which the timidly standing Mone, Sugar, and Baby Five immediately complied. The stubborn Law and Drake, on the other hand, followed reluctantly. Garling, and from the above, one of the elders, Valkyrie, said sternly, they are planning to escape. Lower half of the ship's positions and surround the entire impel down. By doing so, all the escape routes whether by sky or sea will be blocked. Garling lowered his head and placed his clenched right hand in front of his chest strictly. Yes, dear elders. Hey! Up high in the sky, Garp's right arm blasted out the intense black lightning. One that crackled around his arm dangerously. Pars. Pars. Witnessing the might of it brought goosebumps onto Smoker's skin, and Smoker recognized what it was right away. Borsalino, with his eyes slightly widened behind his glasses, mumbled, Oh oh my, Gupsan, aren't you going a bit too harsh on us? Fistbone Smoker, with a cold sweat on his back, watched and saved the current form of his mentor into his memory. He had his eyes locked on Garp, not daring to miss even a single millisecond of the scene. That crackling black lightning, 
Without a doubt it was the advanced conqueror's haki. In fusion, Doberman quickly shouted, Brace yourselves Galaxy Bombarda Buyom. There was a gigantic explosion of the very air, demolishing the entire laser beams and cannonballs at once. The cannonballs simultaneously exploded up in the air, covering the entire area in that of grey smoke. In this chaos of a situation where everyone momentarily lost their concentration, Garp's eyes briefly met Smoker's, and Smoker immediately realized. Huh, you expect far too much from me, Garp Sensei. Still in a sitting position, Smoker held his trembling right hand out at the vast volume of smoke ahead of them. As his form flickered into that of a gaseous character, forming smoke made cape on his back and changing his hair into grey in color. Smoker operated his fruit ability with all the strength that he could muster at the current moment, Arcane Storm. The smoke swirled along with the sprinkles of ocean water that rose from the impact of cannonballs, becoming larger and larger. It sat right in the middle of the sea right in between Smoker's group and the opposing marines. This ability, it has to be. From the above, Valkyrie scowled. Seeing how many world government's ships were poured into the gigantic storm, helplessly, Nasturo unsheathed his sword and narrowed his eyes at the storm. Locate Gart Nasturo shouted in urgency. That man's planning something galaxy. In this situation, Gart, still afloat in the air, grinned as he cocked his left fist back and struck right down into the sea below. Divide boom. The water erupted and merged with the ongoing smoke storm. At the same time, the sheer impact behind his attack was sufficient enough to create a hole in the middle of the sea for a brief moment. Suru. Sengoku immediately cried while jumping out of the ship, and Suru, holding the rail of the ship and closing her eyes to focus, damn it. I'm far too old for this now. Then yanked it up as if holding a wet piece of cloth. Grandma, E.A., Sister Tsuru. Jion's jaw opened wide before her form became flat along with the entire ship that was turning into a flat piece of cloth. Abuwoea and Smoker, completed depleted and filled with dead exhaustion from head to core, was of no difference either. Also having his body turning into a piece of wet cloth. With all others receiving the same treatment, all of them were interconnected into one piece of giant cloth. That was quickly hung around Sengoku's shoulders, as the latter turned his body into a giant golden Buddha, and propelled himself right at the hole in the ocean. Wow, what even is this, Surusan? Araro, since when were you capable of doing something like this? Kuzan, being the only one apart from Garp, Sengoku, and Tsuru not to be turned into a wet garment, laughed as Sengoku gripped him and Tsuru, and jumped into the hole in the middle of the ocean. Focus, Kuzan. Tsuru said seriously, the next step will decide whether we succeed or not. And your role is crucial here. With Smoker having become part of the huge piece of cloth around Sengoku's shoulders, the smoke storm naturally died down. Bohahaha. Now this is fun. Gup, using Geppo to propel himself downward, grinned at Garling and two elders. Splash. Before he, along with Sengoku, Suru, and Kuzan, disappeared into the depths of the sea, with the sea hole closing back in Chizzy elders. They, Garling, unable to understand what happened just now, started with evident disbelief committed suicide. As if Valkyrie barked in rage. Open your eyes, Garling. Nasturo, looking downward keenly, roared with his finger pointing at the sea. The water is vibrating in an unnatural manner. They yes. It must be Sengoku's ability, utilizing the force wave to repel the water of immense pressure off of them. Coupled with Geppo, Garp's brute strength, and Kuzan's ability to freeze the water hurry. In a devilish manner, Nasturo glared at Garling. White Hunter Smoker must be killed try whatever is possible to track them down, and if necessary chase him to the end of the world. Why yes elders. However Garling, staring at the sea, mumbled. How? Abu wa ha 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 ra ha ha ha. From the long piece of cloth hung around Sengoku, Smoker and Aramaki's faces poked out. They, amazed by how the combination of Sengoku's pressure waves, Kuzan's constant freezing of all the surrounding water, and Garp's punches propelling them forth, and making it possible for them to travel underwater, without a single bit of water touching them, laughed. Wahahaha! Garp too, was laughing uncontrollably, thinking of how ridiculous the faces of Garling and two elders were just before. Shut up then! Sengoku barked as his Buddha form had sweat dripping all over. Huff, huff, let me focus, you monkeys. Agreed. 
Huff huffed Suru with her eyes closed, and her hand holding onto the long piece of cloth mumbled with difficulty, and huff huff get your huff heads huff back in children huff huff it's huff hard for me huff to maintain control over this huff if you resist oh damn smoker and aramaki immediately dove back into the piece of cloth allowing tsuru to sigh in relief but still garp wasn't done for ha 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 shut up garp what did you say sengoku i can't hear you because of the water shut up garp oh oh this time around it was Kuzan who let out a war cry as he operated his fruit ability to its maximum. Ice Age. Shut up Kuzan AR come on. Sengoku San you're too uptight. Shut up Kuzan Sengoku was the one suffering the most currently. It seemed. Huff. Huff I am reaching my limit. Suru said with her face turning pale from the extreme stress. Sengoku also feeling the same with him fighting against the immense pressure of the water. Shouted. Gut take us upward bohaha. Roger that fixing his position from Sengoku's back to butt, Garp began punching downward and propel all of them upward. At a rapid pace, the Golden Buddha with three humans and a long piece of cloth attached whilst rising to the surface of the sea. Before, splash, they were blasted out of the sea into the empty night sky. And Tsuru's technique was released at the same time, creating a ridiculous chaos when numerous people and one huge ship were thrown all over the sky. Ah, in this state, Zephyr, Momonga, and Stainless quickly acted, jumping to the left and right to catch all falling marines, and place them on the airborne ship. And, splash. Upon the ship dropping into the ocean, generating a huge splash of water, everyone huffed in exhilaration. Before, we we really managed to escape from that W were, were saved, expressing their joy and wonder, and celebrating what seemed to be a successful escape from the inevitable doom. So, Huff, Sengoku, catching a breather on the ship, asked Garp, any idea where we are? Garp, Wahaha, of course, Sengoku. Garp pointed a thumb at his chest, we should be near Sabaudi Archipelago. We have to pick up the family members of our fellow marines, right? That's surprisingly considerate of you, Sengoku replied, finding himself agreeing with Garp's decision. If Huff, I end up dying half on the other hand, Suru was seen to be surrounded by Jion and Kujaku, who were supporting her weight with worried expressions. Jion, half, I'll leave Kujaku in your, half, hands and no, sister Tsuru, you aren't going to die on us. You hear that no way that will let you grandma please sniff you can't die this soon sniff. You haven't even seen me whipping a single pirate yet. Ugh see cough, coughed Tsuru then coughed, terrifying Jion and Kujaku. Sister Tsuru Grandma Oh, I'm suddenly fine. Tsuru then said, raising her arms up high and widening her eyes comically. She then embraced Joan and Kujaku with a warm smile on her, before her smile froze in a sudden confusion. And who am I? Hina, viewing such a scene from the back with a sweat drop, sat down next to Smoker, who was currently sprawled across the deck. Hina never expected that a number would increase this much, said Hina. Marine was a huge organization. Though mighty, we were separated from one another, and blinded by many deceiving schemes from the world government. On the side, Aramaki, Rosanante, and Senor Pink were locating down the kids, ensuring that all of them were fine. Hina chuckled softly as she watched their antics, continued, you brought all of us together, Smoker. Smoker, turning his head to the right in a lying position, saw that Zephyr and his trainees were staring at the dark horizon. Shu and Akahund were up at the crow's nest for whatever reason, and the other marine soldiers were speaking among themselves with a variety of emotions in their words. Robin, standing in the middle of the crowd, turned her head upon feeling his gaze, and smiled. Correction, Smoker replied with a smile of his own, all of us made this possible together. I, on this dark night with twinkling stars, Sabaldi Archipelago revealed itself in the view of the ship. Afar, there was Bastille, standing on one ship that was filled with many civilians. Smoker Hina everyone Dara, the small snowballing that Smoker has started years ago, has now developed into something this big, and the world has completely deviated from the so-called plot that he knew of. Back then, the old woman asked him, and today, here was Smoker's response to it. Heh, I sure am because I won't be bearing it alone. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, 
Have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.